When a Man's a Man by Harold Bell Wright Chapter 1 There is a land where a man to live must be a man. It is a land of granite and marble and porphyry and gold, and a man's strength must be as the strength of the primitive hills. It is a land of oaks and cedars and pines, and a man's mental grace must be as the grace of the untamed trees. It is a land of far-arched and unstained skies where the wind sweeps free and untainted, and the atmosphere is the atmosphere of those places that remain as God made them, and a man's soul must be as the unstained skies, the unburdened wind and the untainted atmosphere. It is a land of wide mesas, of wild rolling pastures and broad untilled valley meadows, and a man's freedom must be that freedom which is not bound by the fences of too weak and timid conversation. In this land every man, by divine right, is his own king. He is his own jury, his own counsel, his own judge, and, if must be, his own executioner. And in this land where a man to live must be a man, a woman. If she be not a woman, must surely perish. This is the story of a man who regained that which in his youth had been lost to him, and of how, even when he had recovered that which had been taken from him, he still paid the price of his loss. It is the story of a woman who was saved from herself, and of how she was led to hold fast to those things, the loss of which cost the man so great a price. The story, as I've put it down here, begins at Prescott, Arizona, on the day following the annual 4th of July celebration in one of those far western years that saw the passing of Indian and the coming of automobile. The man was walking, along one of the few roads that led out of the little city, through the mountain gaps and passes to the wide unfenced ranges and to the lonely scattered ranches on the creeks and flats and valleys of the great open country that lay beyond. From the fact that he was walking in that land where the distance are such that men most commonly ride, and from the many marks that environment and training leave upon us all, it was evident that the pedestrian was a stranger. He was a man in the prime of young manhood, tall, exceedingly well portioned, and as he went forward along the dusty road he bore himself with the uncautious air of one more accustomed to crowded street than to that rude and unpaved highway. His clothing bore the unmistakable stamp of a tailor of rank. His person was groomed, with that nicety of detail that permitted only to those who possessed both means and leisure, as well as taste. It was evident, too, from his movement and bearing, that he had not sought the mile-high atmosphere of Prescott with the hope that it holds out to those in need of health. But still, there was something about him that suggested a lack of the manly vigor and strength that should have been his. A student of men would have said that nature made this man to be in physical strength and spiritual prowess, a commander and a leader of men, a man's man, a man among men. The same student, looking more closely, might have added to that in some way, through some cruel trick of misfortune, this man had been cheated of his birthright. The day was still young, when the stranger gained the top of the first hill where the road turns to make it steep and winding way down through the scattered pines and scrub oaks to the burnt ranch. Behind him, the little city, so picturesque in those mountain basins, with the wild, unfenced land coming down to its very dooryards, was slowly awakening after the last mad night of its celebration. The tents of the towery shows that had tempted the crowds with vulgar indecencies and the booths of that which were shelting in petty games of chance, where loud voice criers had persuaded the multitude with the hope of winning a worthless babble or tinsel toy, were being cleared away from the borders of the plaza, the beauty of which their presence had marred. In the plaza itself, 
which is the heart of the town, and is usually kept with much pride and care. The bronze statue of the vigorous rough rider Bucky O'Neill and his spirited charger seemed pathetically out of place among the litter of colorful confetti and exploding fireworks and the refuse from various treats and lunches left by the celebrating citizens and their guests. The flags and hunting that from window and roof and pole and doorway had given the day its gay note of color, it hung faded and listless as those spent with their gaiety, mutely conscious that the spirit and purpose of their gladness had passed. They waited the hand that would remove them to the ash barrel and the rubbish heap. Pausing, the man turned to look back. For some minutes he stood as one who, while determined upon a certain course, yet hesitates, reluctant, regretful, at the beginning of his venture. Then he went on, walking with a certain reckless swing, as though in ignorance of that land towards which he had set his face, he still resolutely turned his back upon that which lay behind. It was as though, for this man too, the gala day with its tinselly bravery and confetti spirit, it was of the past. A short way down the road, the man stopped again this time to stand half-turned with his head in a listening attitude. The sound of a vehicle approaching from the way from which he had come had reached his ears. As the noise of wheels and hooves grew louder, a strange expression of mingled uncertainty, determination, and something very like fear came over his face. He started forward, hesitated, looked back, and then turned doubtfully towards the thinly wooded mountainside. Then, with tardy decision, he left the road and disappeared behind a clump of oak bush an instant before a team and buckboard rounded the turn and appeared in full view. An unmistakable cattleman, grizzle-haired, square-shouldered, and substantial, had driven the wild-looking team. Beside him sat a motherly woman and a little boy. As they passed the clump of brush, the near horse of the half-broken pair gave a cat-like bound to the right against his trace mate. A second jump followed the first with a flash-like quickness, and this time the frightened animal was accompanied by his companion, who, not knowing what it was about, jumped in general purpose. But, quick as they were, the strength of the driver's skillful arms met their weight on the reins and forced them to keep to the road. You damn fools, the driver chided good-naturedly as they plunged ahead. Been raised on a cow ranch to get scared at a calf in the brush. Very slowly, the stranger came from behind the bushes. Cautiously, he returned to the road. His fine lips curled in a curious mocking smile, but it was himself that he mocked. For there was a look in his dark eyes that gave to his naturally strong face an almost pathetic expression of self-deprecation and shame. As the pedestrian crossed the creek at the burnt ranch, Joe Conley, leading a horse by Rietta, which had looped as it had fallen about the animal's neck, came through the big corral gate across the road from the house. At the barn, Joe disappeared through the small door of the saddle room, the coil of the riata still in his hand, still compelling his mount to await his return. At sight of the cowboy, the stranger again paused and stood hesitating and indecision. But as Joe reappeared from the barn with bridle, saddle blanket, and saddle in hand, the man went reluctantly forward as though prompted by some necessity. "'Good morning,' said the stranger courteously and his voice was the voice of that fitting his dress and bearing, which his face now was the carefully schooled countenance of a man well-trained and well-poised. With a quick estimating glance, Joe returned to the stranger's greeting and dropped a saddle and blanket on the ground, approaching his horse's head. Instantly, the animal sprang back with head high and eyes defiant, but there was no escape for the rawhide Rietta was still securely held by his master. There was a short, sharp scuffle that sent the gravel by the roadside flying, 
the controlling bit, was between the reluctant teeth and the cowboy, who was silently taking the horse's objection as a matter of course, adjusts the blanket, and with the easy skill of a long practice swing, the heavy saddle was laid in place. As the cowboy caught the dangling clinch, and with a deft hand, he tucked the latigo strap through the ring and drew it tight. There was a look of almost pathetic wistfulness on the watching stranger's face, at a look of wistfulness and admiration and envy. Dropping the stirrup, Joe again faced the stranger, this time inquiringly, with that bold, straightforward look so characteristic of his kind. And now, when the man spoke, his voice had a curious note, as if the speaker had lost a little of his poise. It was almost a note of apology, and again in his eyes there was that pitiful look of self-deprecation and shame. Pardon me, he said, but will you tell me, please, am I right that this is the road to Williamson Valley? The stranger's manner and voice were in such contrast to his general appearance that the cowboy frankly looked his wonder as he answered courteously. Yes, sir. And it will take me directly to Cross Triangle Ranch? If you keep straight across the valley, it will. If you take the right-hand fork at the ridge above the goat ranch, it'll take you to Simmons. There's a road from Simmons to the Cross Triangle on the far side of the valley, though. You can see the valley and the Cross Triangle home ranch from the top of the divide. Thank you. The stranger was turning to go when the man in the blue jumper and fringed leather chap spoke again curiously. The dean with Stella and little Billy passed in the buckboard less than an hour ago on their way from the celebration. Funny they didn't pick you up if you're going there. The other paused questioningly. The dean? The cowboy smiled. Mr. Baldwin, the owner of the cross triangle, you know. Oh, the stranger was clearly embarrassed. Perhaps he was thinking of that clump of brush on the mountainside. Joe, loosening his riata from the horse's neck and coiling it carefully, considered a moment, and then, You aren't going to walk to that cross triangle, are you? The self-mocking smile touched the man's lips, but there was a hint of decisive purpose in his voice as he answered. Oh, yes. Again, the cowboy frankly measured the stranger, and then he moved towards the corral gate, the coiled riata in one hand and the bridle rein in the other. I'll go catch up a horse for you, he said in a matter-of-fact tone, as if reaching a decision. The other spoke hastily. No, no, please, don't trouble. Joe paused curiously. Well, any friend of Mr. Baldwin is welcome to anything on the burnt ranch, stranger. Uh, but I, uh, I, I've never met Mr. Baldwin, explained the other one lamely. Oh, that's all right, returned the cowboy heartily. You're going to, and that's the same thing. Again, he started towards the gate. Uh, but I, pardon me, you are very kind, but I, uh, I prefer to walk. Once more, Joe halted, a puzzled expression on his tanned and weather-beaten face. I suppose you're aware it's quite some walk, he suggested doubtfully, as if the man's ignorance were the only possible solution of his unheard-of assertion. So I understand, but it'll be good for me. Really, I prefer to walk. Without a word... The cowboy turned back to his horse and proceeded methodically to tie the coiled riata in its place on the saddle. Then, without a glance toward the stranger who stood watching him in embarrassed silence, he threw the bridle reins over his horse's head, gripped the saddle horn and swung to his seat, reining his horse away from the man beside the road. The stranger, thus abruptly dismissed, moved hurriedly away. Halfway back to the creek, the cowboy checked his horse and looked back at the pedestrian as the latter was making his way under the pines and up the hill. 
When the man had disappeared over the crest of the hill, the cowboy muttered a bewilderment something and touched his horse with the spurs and loped away as if dismissing a problem that was too complex for his simple mind. All that day, the stranger followed that dusty, unfenced road. Over his head, the wide, bright sky was without a cloud to break its vast expanse. On the great open range of mountains, flat and valley, the cattle lay quietly in the shadow of oak or walnut or cedar, or with slow, listless movements, sought the watering places to slacken their thirst. The wild things returned to their secret hiding places in rocky den and leafy thicket to await the cool of the evening hunting hour. The very air was motionless, as if the never tired wind itself drowsed itself. And, alone in the hushed bigness of that land, the man walked with his thoughts, brooding, perhaps, over whatever it was that was so strangely that placed him here, dreaming, it may be, over that which might have been, or that which had yet to happen. Viewing the questioning, wondering, half-fearful eyes, the mighty untamed scenes that met his eye on every hand. Nor did anyone see him, for at every sound of approaching horse or vehicle, he went aside from the highway to hide in the bush or behind some convenient rock. And always, when he came from his hiding place to resume his journey, that odd smile of self-mockery was on his face. At noon, he rested for a little beside the road which he ate a meager sandwich that he had taken from the pocket of his coat. Then he pushed on again, with grim determination, deeper and deeper into the heart and life of that world which was to him so evidently new and strange. The afternoon was well spent when he made his way, weary now with drooping shoulders and dragging step, all up the long slope of the divide that marks the eastern boundary of the range about Williamson Valley. At the summit, where the road turns sharply round the shoulder of the mountain and begins to steep descend on the other side of the ridge, he stopped. His tired form straightened, his face lighted with a look of wondering awe, and an involuntary exclamation came from his lips as his unaccustomed eyes swept that wide-open view that lay from his feet and rolled beneath them. Under that sky, so unmatched in its clearness and depth of color, the land lay in all its verity of valley and forest and mesa and mountain, a scene unrivaled in the magnificent and grandeur of its beauty. Miles upon miles in distance, upon those primitive reaches the faint blue peaks and domes and ridges of the mountains that ranked an uncounted sentinel host. The darker masses of the timbered hillsides with the very shades of pine and cedar, the lighter tints of oak brush and chaparral, the dun tones of the open grasslands and the brighter note of the valley's meadows greens were defined, blended, harmonized by the overlaying haze with a delicacy exquisite beyond any human power to picture. And in the nearer distance, chiefs of that army of mountain peaks and masters of the many miles that lay within their circle, Granite Mountain, gray and grim, reared its mighty bulk of cliff and crag as if supreme defiance of the changing years or the hand of humankind. In the heart, of that beautiful land upon which, from the summit of the divide, the stranger looked with such rapture of appreciation, lay Williamson Valley, a natural meadow of lush, dark green native grass. And had the man's eyes been trained to such distances, he would, might have distinguished in the blue haze the red roofs of the buildings of the Cross Triangle Ranch. For some time the man stood there, a lonely figure against the sky, particularly out of place in his careful garb of the cities. The schooled indifference of his face was broken. His self-deprecation and mockery were forgotten. His dark eyes glowed with the fire of excited anticipation. 
with hope and determined purpose. And then, with a quick movement, as though some ghost of the past had touched him on the shoulder, he looked back on the way he had come. And the light in his eyes went out in the gloom of painful memories. His countenance, unguarded, became his day of lonesomeness, grew dark with sadness and shame. It was as though he looked beyond the town he had left that morning, with its litter and refuse of yesterday's pleasure to a life and a world of tradery and shams, wherein men gave themselves to win by means fair or foul the tinsel baubles that were offered in the world's petty game of chance. And yet, even as he looked back, there was in the man's face as much of a longing as of regret. He seemed as one who, realizing that he had reached a point in his life journey, a divide, as it were, from which he could see two ways, was resolved to turn from the path he longed to follow and take the road that appealed to him the least. As one enlisted to fight in a just and worthy cause might pause a moment before taking the oath of service to regret the ease and freedom he was about to surrender, so this man paused on that summit of the divide. Slowly, at last, in weariness of body and spirit, he stumbled a few feet aside from the road and sinking down upon a convenient rock, gave himself again to the contemplation of that scene which lay before him. And there was that in his movements now that seemed to tell of one who, in the grip of some bitter and disappointed experience, was yet being forced by something deep in his being to reach out in the strength of his manhood to take that which he had been denied. Again, the man's untrained eyes had failed to note that which had first attracted the attention of one schooled in the land that lay about him. He had not seen a tiny moving speck upon the road over which he had passed. A horseman was riding towards him. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 Had the man on the divide noticed the approaching horseman, it would have been evident even to one so unacquainted with the country as the stranger, that the rider belonged to that land of riders. While still at a distance too great for the eye to distinguish the details of fringed leather chaps, soft shirt, short jumper, sombreros, spurs, and rietta, no one could have mistaken the ease and grace of the cowboy who seemed so literally a part of his horse. His seat in the saddle was so secure, so easy in his bearing, so unaffected and natural, that every movement of the powerful animal he rode expressed itself rhythmically in his own lithe, sinewy body. While the stranger sat wrapped in meditative thought, unheeding the approach of the rider, the horseman, coming on with a long, swinging lope, watched the motionless figure on the summit of the divide with careful interest. As he drew nearer, the cowboy pulled his horse down to a walk, and from under his broad brim hat regarded the stranger intently. He was within a few yards of the point where the man sat, and when the latter caught the sound of the horse's feet, and with a quick startled look over his shoulder, sprang up and started as if to escape. But it was too late, and as though on second thought he whirled about with a half-defiant air to face the intruder. The horseman stopped. He had not missed the significance of that hurried movement, and his right hand rested carelessly on his leather-clad thigh, while his grey eyes were fixed boldly, inquiringly, almost challengingly, on the rider he had unintentionally surprised. As he sat there on his horse... So alert, so ready, in his cowboy garb and trapping against the background of Granite Mountain, with all of its rugged and primal strength, the riders made a striking picture of virile manhood. Of some years less than thirty he was, perhaps, or neither as tall nor as heavy as the stranger, but in spite of a certain boyish look on his smooth-shaven, deeply brawn face, he bore himself with the unmistakable air of a matured and self-reliant man. Every nerve and fiber of him seemed alive with that vital energy which is the true beauty and the glory of life. The two men pressed a striking contrast. 
Without question, one was proud and finished product of our most advanced civilization. It was as evident that the splendid manhood of the other had never been dwarfed by the weakening atmosphere of an over-cultured, too conventional and too complex environment. The stranger, with his carefully tailored clothes and his man-of-the-world face and bearing, was as unlike this rider as the unfenced land as a dainty groomed thoroughbred from the sheltered and guarded stables of a fashion is unlike a wild and untamed stallion from the hills and ranges about Granite Mountain. Yet, unlike as they were, there was something that marked them as kin. The man of the ranges and the man of the city were, deep beneath the surfaces of their being, as like as the spirited thoroughbred and the unbroken wild horse. The cowboy was all that the stranger might have been. The stranger was all that the cowboy, under like conditions, would have been as well. As they silently faced each other, it seemed for a moment that each instinctively recognized their skinship. And then, into the dark eyes of the stranger, as when he had watched the cowboy at the Burton Ranch, there came that look of wistful admiration and envy. And at this, as if the man had somehow made himself known, the horseman relaxed his attitude of tense readiness. The hand that had held the bridle rein to command instant action of his horse, and the hand that rested so near the rider's hip, came together on the saddle horn in careless ease, while a boyish smile of amusement broke over the young man's face. That smile brought a flash of resentment into the eyes of the other and a flush of red darkened his untanned cheeks. For a moment he stood, and then, with an air of haunty rebuke, he deliberately turned his back and seated himself again looking away over the landscape. But the smiling cowboy did not move. For a moment, as he regarded the stranger, his shoulders shook with silent, contemptuous laughter, and then his face grew grave and he looked a little ashamed. The moments passed, and still he sat there, quietly waiting. Presently, as if yielding to the persistent, silent presence of the horseman, and submitting reluctantly to the intrusion, the other turned, and again the two were so alike and so unlike they faced each other. It was a stranger now who smiled, but it was a smile that caused the cowboy to become, on the instant, kindly considered. Perhaps he remembered one of the dean's favorite sayings. Keep your eye on the man who laughs when he's hurt. Good evening, said the stranger doubtfully, but with a hint of conscious superiority in his manner. Howdy, returned the cowboy heartily, and in his deep voice was the kindliness that made him so loved by all that knew him. Been having some trouble? If I have... It is my own, sir, retorted the other coldly. Sure, returned the horseman gently, and you're welcome to it. Every man has all he needs of his own, I reckon. But I didn't mean it that way. I meant your horse. The stranger looked at him questioningly. Beg your pardon? What? I do not understand. Your horse... Where is your horse? Oh, yes, certainly, of course, my, my horse. How stupid of me. The tone of the man's answer was of one half apology, and he was smiling whimsically, as if his own pressment as he continued. I have no horse, really, you know. I wouldn't know what to do with one if I had it. You don't mean to say that you've drifted all the way out here from Prescott on foot exclaimed the astonished cowboy. The man on the ground looked up at the horseman in a droll tone that made the rider his friend, he said. Well, he stretched his long legs painfully. Well, I like to walk. You see, I uh, fancied it'd be good for me, don't you know? The cowboy laughingly considered, trying, as he said afterwards, to figure it out. It was clear that this tall stranger was not in search of health, nor did he show any of the distinguishing marks of a tourist. He certainly appeared to be a man of means. 
He could not be looking for work. He did not seem to have suspicious character, quite the contrary, and yet there was that significant hurried movement as if to escape when the horseman had surprised him. The etiquette of the country forbade a direct question, but... Yes, he agreed thoughtfully. Walking comes in handy sometimes. I don't take to it to myself much, though. Then he added shrewdly, You were at the celebration, I reckon. The stranger's voice betrayed quick enthusiasm, but that old wistful look crept into his eyes again. He seemed to lose a little of his poise. Indeed I was, he said. I never saw anything to compare with. I've seen all kinds of athletic sports and contests and expositions with circus performances and rides and that sort of thing, you know. And I read about such things, of course, but... And his voice grew thoughtful. That men ever actually did them, and all in a day's work, as you may say. I never dreamed there were men like that in these days. The cowboy shifted his weight uneasily in the saddle while he regarded the man on the ground curiously. Well, it was a sure humdinger of a celebration, he admitted, but as for the show part, I've seen things happen when nobody was thinking anything about it that would make those stunts at Prescott look funny. The horse racing was pretty good, though, he suggested. The other did not miss the point of suggestion. I didn't bet anything on it, he laughed. It's funny no one picked you up on the road out here, the cowboy next offered pointedly. The folks started home early this morning, and Jim Reed and his family passed me about an hour ago, and they were in an automobile. The Simmons stage must have caught up with you somewhere. The stranger's face flushed, and he seemed to try to find an answer. The cowboy watched him curiously, and then, in a musing tone, added the suggestion. Kind of lonesome up here on foot. But there are times, you know, returned the other desperately, when a man prefers to be alone. The cowboy straightened in his saddle and lifted his reins. Well, thanks, he said dryly. I guess I'd better be moving. The other spoke quickly. I beg your pardon, Mr. Acton. I did not mean that for you. The horseman dropped his hands again to the saddle horn and resumed his lounging posture. Then, tactily accepted the apology. You seem to have the advantage of me, he said. The stranger laughed. Everyone knows that Wild Horse Phil of the Cross Triangle Ranch won the Bronco Riding Championship yesterday. I saw you ride. Philip Acton's face showed some boyish embarrassment. The other continued with his strange enthusiasm. It was great work. It was wonderful. I never saw anything like it. There was no mistaking the genuineness of his admiration, nor could he hide that wistful look in his eyes. Oh, sh shucks, said the cowboy uneasily. I, I could pick a dozen of the boys in that outfit who can ride all around me. It was just my luck, that's all. I happened to draw an easy horse. Easy? ejected the stranger, seeing again in his mind the fighting, the plunging, and the madness, and the outlawed brute that this boy-faced man was mastering. And I suppose catching and throwing those steers was easy, too? The cowboy was plainly wondering at the man's particular enthusiasm for these most commonplace things. The roping? Why, that's no more than we're doing all the time. I don't mean the roping, returned the other. I mean... When you rode up beside one of those steers that was running at full speed and caught him by the horns with your bare hands, and jumped from your saddle and threw the beast over you and then lay there with his horns pinning you down. You ain't doing all that all the time, are you? You don't mean to tell me these things are part of your everyday work? Oh, the, the bulldog and, uh, why no, admitted Phil with an embarrassed laugh. That was just fun, you know. The stranger stared at him speechless. Fun. In the name of all that in most modern, in civilization, what manner men were these who did such things for fun? If this was a recreation, what must their work be? 
Do you mind me asking? He said wistfully. How'd you learn to do such things? Well, I, I, I don't know. We just do them, I reckon. And could anyone learn to ride as you ride, do you think? The question came with marked eagerness. I don't see why not, answered the cowboy with honesty. The stranger shook his head doubtfully and looked away over the wild land where the shadows of the late afternoon were lengthening. Where are you going to stop tonight? Phil Acton asked suddenly. The stranger did not take his eyes from the view that seemed to hold him with some particular interest. Really? he answered indifferently. I'd never thought of it. I should think you'd be thinking of it long about supper time if you'd been walking from town since morning. The stranger looked up with sudden interest, but the cowboy fancied there was a touch of bitterness underneath the droll tone of his reply. Do you think, Mr. Acton, I have never been hungry in my life? It might be interesting to try it once, don't you think? Phil Acton laughed as he returned. Well, it might be interesting, all right, but I think I better tell you just the same that there's a ranch down there yonder in the timber. Nothing but a goat ranch, but I reckon they'd take you in. It's too far to the cross triangle for me to ask you there. You can see the buildings, though, from here. The stranger sprang up in quick interest. You can see the cross triangle ranch from here? Sure. The cowboy smiled and pointed into the distance. Those uh, red dots over there, those are the roofs. Jim Reed's place, the pot hook S, is just this side of the meadows and a little to the south. The old Acton Helmstead, where I was born, is that bunch of cottonwoods over there across the wash from the cross triangle. But, strive as he might, the stranger's eyes could discern no sign of human habitation in those vast reaches that lay before him. If you're ever over that way, drop in, said Phil accordingly. Mr. Baldwin, he'd be glad to meet you. You really mean that? questioned the other doubtfully. We don't say such things in this country if we don't mean them, stranger, was the cool retort. Well, of course, I beg your pardon, Mr. Acton came the confused reply. I should like to see the ranch. I may, I will, that is if I... He stopped, as if not knowing how to finish, and with a gesture of hopelessness turned away to stand silently looking back towards town, while his face was dark with painful memories and his lips curled in that mirthless, self-mocking smile. And Philip Action, seeing and felt suddenly that he had rudely intruded upon the privacy of one who sought the solitude of that lonely place to hide the hurt of some bitter experience. A certain native gentleness made the man of the ranges understand that this stranger was face to face with some crisis in his life, that he was passing through one of those trials which a man must pass through alone. Had it been possible, the cowboy would have apologized, but that, would have added only more to the unkindness. Lifting the reins and sitting erect in the saddle, he said indifferently, Well, I must be moving along. I take a shortcut here. So long. You better make it down to the goat ranch. It's not far. He touched his horse with the spurs and the animal sprang away. Goodbye called the stranger, and that wistful look was in his eyes as the rider swung his horse astride from the road, plunging down the mountainside and dashing away through the brush and over the rocks with reckless speed. With a low exclamation of wondering amazement, the man climbed hastily to a higher point and from there watched until rider and horse, taking a steeper declivity without checking their breaking-necking course, dropped from sight in a cloud of dust. The faint sound of sliding rocks and gravel dislodged by the flying feet died away, and the cloud of dust dissolved in the thin air. The stranger looked away into the blue distance in another vain attempt to see the red spots that marked the cross triangle ranch. Slowly, the man returned to his seat on the rock. 
The long shadows of Granite Mountain crept out from under the base of the cliffs farther and farther over the country below. The blue of the distant hills changed to mauve, with deeper masses of purple in the shadows where the canyons were. The lonely figure on the summit of the divide did not move. The sun hid itself behind the line of mountains, and the blue of the sky in the west changed slowly to gold, against which the peaks and domes and points were silhouetted as if cut by a graver's tool, and the bold cliffs and battlements of old granite grew coldly gray in the gloom. As the night came on, and the details of its structure were lost the mountain, to the watching man on the divide, assuming the appearance of a mighty fortress. A fortress, he thought, to which a generation of men might retreat from civilization that threatened them with destruction. And once more the man faced back the way he'd come. The faraway cities were already in the blaze of their own artificial lights. Lights valued not for their power to make men see, but for their power to dazzle, attract, and intoxicate. Lights that permitted no kindly dusk at eve-tide, when a man might rest from his day's work a quiet hour. Lights that revealed squalid shame and tinsel show, lights that hid the stars. The man on the divide lifted his face to the stars that now in the wide arcing sky were gathering in such unnumbered multitudes to keep their sentinel watch over the world below. The cool evening wind came whispering over the lonely land, and all the furred and winged creatures of the night stole from their dark hiding places into the gloom which is the beginning of their day. A coyote crept stealthily, Passed in the dark, and from the mountainside below came the weird, ghostly call of its mate. An owl drifted by in silent wings. Night birds chirped in the chaparral. A fox barked on the ridge above. The shadowy form of a bat flittered here and there. From somewhere in the distance, a bull bellowed his deep voice challenge. Suddenly, the man on the summit of the divide sprang to his feet, and with a gesture that, had he not been so alone, might have seemed effectually dramatic, stretched out his arms in an attitude of wistful longing while his lips moved as if again and again he whispered a name. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 In the Williamson Valley country, the spring roundup, or rodeo, as it's called in Arizona, and the shipping are well over by the last of June. During the long summer weeks until the beginning of the fall rodeo in September, there is little for the riders to do. The cattle roam free on the open ranges while calves grow into yearlings, and yearlings become two-year-olds and two-year-olds mature for the market. On the Cross Triangle and similar ranches, Three or four of the steadier year-round hands are only held. These repair and build fences and visit the watering places, brand an occasional calf that somehow managed to escape the dragnet of the rodeo and with dope bottle ever at hand, doctor animals that are affected by screw worms. It is during these weeks, too, that the horses are broken, for with the hard and dangerous work of the fall and spring months there is always need for fresh mounts. The horses of the Cross Triangle were never permitted to run on the open range. Because the leaders of the numerous bands of wild horses that roamed over the country about Granite Mountain were always ambitious to gain recruitments for their harems of, from their civilized neighbors. The freedom of the ranch horses were limited by the fences of 4,000 acre pasture. But within these miles of barbed wire boundaries the brood mares with their growing progency lived as free and untamed as their wild cousins on the unfenced lands about them. The colts, except for one painful experience when they were roped and branded from the day of their birth until they were ready to be broken, were never handled. On the morning following his meeting with the stranger on the divide, Phil Acton, with two of his cowboy helpers, rode out to the big pasture to bring in the band. 
the owner of the cross triangle, always declared that Phil was intimately acquainted with every individual horse and head of stock between the Divide and Camp Wood Mountain, and from Scal Valley to the Big Chino. In moments of enthusiasm, the dean ever maintained stoutly that his young foreman knew as well every coyote, fox, badger, and deer, antelope, mountain lion, bobcat, and wild horse that had homer hunted country in the country in which the lad had ridden since he was a babyhood. Certainly, it was that wild horse Phil, as he was called by admiring friends, for reasons which you shall hear, loved this work and life to which he was born. Every feature of that wild land, and from lonely mountain peak to hidden valley's canyon, was as familiar to him as the streets and buildings of a man's home city are known to the one reared among them. And as he rode that morning with his comrades to the day's work, the young man felt keenly the call of the primitive unspoiled life that throbbed with such vital strength about him. He could not have put that into which he felt words. He was not even conscious of the forces that moved him so. He only knew that he was glad. The days of celebration at Prescott had been enjoyable days. To meet old friends and comrades, to ride with them in the contests that all true men of his kind love, to compare experiences and exchange news and gossip with widely spread neighbors, it was a pleasure. But the curious crowds of strangers, the throngs of sightseers from the to him unknown worlds of cities, who regarded him as they might view some rare or little-known creature in a mirageny, in the brazen presence of those unclean parasites and harpies that prey upon such occasions, had oppressed and disgusted him until he was glad to escape again to the clean freedom, the pure vitality, and the unspoiled spirit of his everyday life and environment. In an overflow, of sheer physical and spiritual energy, he lifted his horse into a run, and with a shrill cowboy yell challenged his champions to ride wild with him to the pasture gate. It was some time before noon when Phil checked his horse near the ruins of the old Indian lookout on the top of Black Hill. Below, in the open land above deep wash, he could see his cowboy companions working the band of horses that were gathering slowly toward the narrow pass that at the eastern end of the Black Hills led through to the flats of the upper end of the big meadow, and so to the gate and to the way they followed to the corral. It was Phil's purpose to ride across Black Hill, down the western and northern slope and through the cedar timber and pick up any horses that might arrange there, and join the others at the gate. In the meanwhile, there was time for a few minutes' rest. Dismounting, he loosened the girth and lifted the saddle and blanket from Hobson's steaman back. And then, while the good horse, wearied with the hard riding and the steady climb up the mountainside, stood quietly in the shade of a cedar, his master, stretched on the ground nearby, idly scanning the world that lay below him and around them. Very clear in that light atmosphere, Phil could see the tr trees and buildings of the home ranch. And just across the sandy wash from Cross Triangle, the grove of cottonwoods and walnuts, the hill that hid the old house that he had been born in. A mile away, on the eastern side of the Great Valley Meadows, he could see home buildings of Reed Ranch, the Pot Hook S where Kitty Reed had lived all the days of her life except those three years which she had spent at school in the East. The young man on the top of Black Hill looked long at the Reed home. In his mind, he could see Kitty dressed in that cool, simple gown, fresh and dainty after the morning's housework, sitting with a book or sewing on the front porch. The porch on the other side of the house, it is true, and the distance was too great for him to distinguish a person in any case, but it made all the no difference to Phil's vision. He could see her just the same. Kitty had been very kind to Phil at the celebration, but Kitty was always kind, nearly always. But in spite of her kindness, the cowboy felt that she had not somehow seemed to place a very high value on the medal he had won in the bronc riding contest. 
Phil himself did not greatly value the medal, but he wanted greatly to win the championship because of the very substantial money prize that went along with it. That money, in Phil's mind, was to play an important part in a long-cherished dream that was one of the things that Phil Acton did not talk about. He had not, in fact, ridden for the championship at all, but for his dream. And that was what mattered so much when Kitty seemed to lack so interest in his success. As though his subconscious mind directed the movement, the young man looked away from Kitty's home to the distant mountain range where the night before on the summit of the divide he had met the stranger. All the way home, the cowboy had wondered about the man, evolving many theories, inventing many things to account for his presence, and alone and on foot, so far from surroundings to which he was so clearly accustomed. Of one thing Phil was sure. The man was in trouble, deep trouble. The more that the clean-minded, gentle-hearted lad of the great outdoors thought about it, the more strongly he felt he was unwittingly intruding on a moment that was sacred to that stranger. Sacred because the man was fighting one of those battles that every man must fight, and fight alone. It was this feeling that had kept the young man from speaking of the incident to anyone, even to the dean, or mother, as he called Miss Baldwin. Perhaps, too, this feeling was the real reason for Phil's sense of kinship with that stranger. For the cowboy himself had moments in his life where he would permit no man to look upon. But in his thinking of the man whose personality had impressed him so, one thing stood out above all things. The stranger clearly belonged to that world of which, from experience, the young foreman of the cross triangle knew nothing. Phil Acton had no desire for the world to which that stranger belonged, but in his heart there was some troublesome question. If, if he himself were more like the man whom he had met on the Divide, if he knew more of that other world, if he in some degree belonged to that other world as Kitty, because of her three years in school belonged, would it have make a difference? From the distant mountain range that marks the eastern limits of the Williamson Valley country, and thus, in the degree marked limits of Phil World, the lad's gaze turned again to the scene immediately before him. The band of horses, followed by the cowboys, were trotting from the narrow pass out into the open flat. Some of the band, the mothers, went quietly, knowing from past experiences that they, in a few hours, would be returning to their freedom. Others, the colts and yearlings, bewildered, curious, and fearful, followed their mothers without protest, but those who in many friendly race or primitive battle had proved their growing years seemed to sense a coming crisis in their lives, hitherto peaceful. And these, as though warned by some strange instinct which guard all wild things, realized that the open ground between the pass and the gate presented that last opportunity made a final desperate effort to escape. With sudden dashes and dodging and doubling, they tried again and again for freedom. But, always between them and the haunts they loved, there was a persistent horseman, running, leaping, whirling to their efforts to be everywhere at once, and the riders working their charges towards the gate. The man on the hilltop sprang to his feet. Hobson threw up his head and with sharp ears forward, eagerly watched the game he knew so well. With a quickness incredible to the untrained, Phil threw blanket and saddle to place. As he drew the clinch tight, a shrill cowboy yell came up from the flat below. One of the band, a powerful bay, had broken past the guarding horseman and was running with every ounce of his strength for the timber on the western slope of the Black Hill. For a hundred yards, one of the riders had tried to overtake and turn the fugitive, but as he saw how the stride of the free horse was widening the distance between them, the cowboy turned back, lest others follow the successful runaway's example. The yell was to inform Phil of the situation. Before the echoes of the signal could die away, Phil was in the saddle, and with an answering shout sent Hobson down the rough mountainside in a wild, reckless, plunging run to the head for the moment victorious bay. An hour later, the foreman rejoined his companions, 
who was holding the band of horses at the gate. The big bay, reluctant, protesting, twisting and turning in vain attempts to outmaneuver Hobson, was a captive in the loop of the wild horse Phil's riata. In the big corral that afternoon, Phil and his helpers, with the dean and little Billy looking on, cut out from the herd the horses selected to be broken. These, one by one, were forced through the gate into the adjoining corral, from which they watched the, with uneasy wonder and many excited and ineffectual attempts to follow, when their more fortunate companions were driven again back to the big pasture. Then Phil opened another gate, and the little band dashed wildly through, to find themselves in a small meadow pasture, where they would pass the last night before the one great battle of their lives. A battle that would be for them a dividing point between those years of ease and freedom which had been theirs from birth, and the years of hard and useful service that were to come. Phil sat on his horse, at the gate watching with critical eye at the unbroken animals race away. There's some good ones in this bunch this year, Uncle Phil, he commented to his employer who was standing at the watering trough in the other corral, and he was looking over the fence. There's bound to be some good ones in every bunch, returned Mr. Baldwin, and some no account in others too, he added as his foreman dismounted beside him. Then, while the young man slipped the bridle from his horse and stood patiently for the animal to drink, the older man regarded him silently, as though in his own mind the dean's observation bore somewhat upon Phil himself. That was always the way of the dean. As Sheriff Fellows once remarked to Judge Palwell in the old days of the cattle rustler's glory, whatever Bill Baldwin says is mighty nigh always double-barreled. There was always two sides to the dean, or rather, to be accurate, there was a front and a back. The back, flat, straight, and broad, indicated one side of his character, and the side that belonged with the square chin and blue eyes always looked at you with a frank directness. It was this side of the man that brought him barefooted and penniless to Arizona in those days long ago when he was only a boy in Arizona, a strong man's country. It was this side of him that brought him triumphantly through those hard years of Indian trouble and in those wild, lawless times made him respected and feared by the evildoers and trusted and followed by those of his kind. Out of hardships and danger in those turbulent days made the Arizona today. It was this side, too, that finally made the barefooted, penniless boy the owner of the Cross Triangle Ranch. I do not know the exact number of Dean's years, I only know that his hair is gray, and that he does not ride as much as he once did. I have heard him say, though, that when for thirty-five years he lived in the saddle, and that the cross triangle brand is one of the oldest irons in the state. I know, too, that his back is still flat and broad and straight. The dean's front, so well-rounded and hardy, indicates as clearly as the other side of his character. And... It is this side that belongs to the full red cheeks and the ever-ready chuckle or laugh that puts the twinkle in the blue eyes and the kindly tones in his deep voice. It is this side of the dean's character that adds so large a measure of love to the respect and confidence afforded to him by neighbors and friends, business associates and employees. It is this side of the dean, too, that in these days sits in the shade of the big walnut trees planted by his own hand, and talks to the youngsters of the days gone by that makes the young riders of his generation seek him for counsel, sympathy, and help. Three things the dean knows, cattle, horses, and men. One thing the dean will not, cannot tolerate, weakness in those who should be strong. Even bad men, he admits, if they are strong, not for their badness, but for their strength, Mistaken men he loved in spirit of their mistakes, if only they are not weaklings. There is no place anywhere in Dean's philosophy of life for a weakling. I heard him tell a man once, and never shall I forget it. You had better die like a man, sir, than live like a sneaking coyote. 
The dean's son, men grown, were gone from the home, ranch to the fields and work of their choosing. Little Billy, a nephew of seven years, was Mr. and Mr. Baldwin, said hardly, their second crop. When Phil's horse, satisfied, lifted his dripping muzzle from the watering trough, the dean walked with his young foreman to the saddle shed. Neither of the men spoke, for between them there was a companionship that does not require a constant flow of talk to keep it alive. Not until the cowboy had turned his horse loose and was hanging the saddle and bridle on their accustomed peg did the older man speak. Jim Reed's going to be breaking horses next week. So I've heard, returned Phil, carefully spreading his blanket saddle to dry. The dean spoke again in a tone of indifference. He wants you to help him. Me? What's the matter with Jack? He's going to the D-1 tomorrow. Phil was examining the wrappings of his saddle horn with, as the dean noted, quite unnecessary care. Kitty was over this morning, said the dean gently. The young man turned, and taking off his spurs, and hung them up on the saddle horn. Then, as he kicked off his leather chaps, he said shortly, I'm not looking for a job as a professional bronc buster. The dean's eyes twinkled. I thought maybe you'd like to help a neighbor out just being neighborly, you know. Do you want me to ride for Reed? demanded Phil. Well, I suppose as long as there's Bronx to bust, someone's got to bust them. The dean returned without committing himself. And then when Phil made no reply, he added laughingly, I told Kitty to tell him, though, that I reckon you had a, as big a string as you could handle over here. As they moved away from the house, Phil returned with significant emphasis. When I ride for anyone besides you, it won't be for Kitty Reed's father. And the dean commented in his reflecting tone. It does sometimes make a difference who a man rides for, don't it? In the pastures by the corral, the horses were awaiting the approaching trial that would mark them for the beginning of a new life past a restless night. Some, in meekness of spirit or perhaps with a deeper wisdom, fed quietly. Others wandered about aimlessly, snatching an occasional uneasy mouthful of grass, and looked about often in troubled doubt. The more rebellious ones followed the fence searching for some place of weakness in the barbed barrier that imprisoned them, and one who, had he not been by circumstance robbed of his birthright, would have been the strong leader of a wild band, stood often with his wide nostrils and challenging eyes gazed towards the corrals and buildings, as if questioning the right of those who brought him there from the haunts that he loved. And somewhere in the night of that land, which was as known to him as the pasture meadow, was the strange to the broken horses. A man awaited the day which, for him too, was to stand through all of his remaining years as a mark between the old life and the new. As Phil Acton lay in his bed, with doors and windows open wide to welcome the new cool night air, he heard the restless horses in the pasture nearby and smiled as he thought of the big bay and the morrow. Smiled with the smile of a man who looked forward to a battle worthy of his best strength and skill. And then... Strangely enough, as he slipped into the dreamless sleep of those who live as he lived, his mind went again to the stranger who he had met on the summit of the Divide. If he were more like that man, would it make any difference? The cowboy wondered. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 in the beginning of the morning, when granite mountains, fortress-like battlements and towers loomed gray and bold and grim, the big bay horse trumpeted a warning to his less watchful mates. Instantly, with heads held high and eyes wide, the band stood in frightened indecision. Two horsemen, shadowy and mysterious forms in the misty light, 
were riding from the corral into the pasture. As the riders approached, individuals in the band moved uneasily, starting as if to run, hesitating, turning from another look, maneuvering to put their mates between them and the enemy. But the bay went boldly a short distance toward the danger and stood still with wide nostrils and fierce eyes as though ready for the combat. For a few moments, as the horsemen seemed about to go past, hope beat high in the hearts of the timid prisoners. And then the riders circled to put the band between themselves and the corral gate, and the frightened animals knew. But always, as they whirled and dodged in their attempts to avoid the big gate towards which they were being forced to move, there was a silent, persistent horseman barring the way. The big bailey alone, as though realizing the futility of such efforts, and so conserved his strength for whatever was to follow, trotted boldly and proudly into the corral, where he stood, his eyes never leaving the riders, as his mates crowded and jostled about him. "'There's one in that bunch that surely aims to make you ride some,' said Curly Elson with a grin, to Phil, as the family sat at breakfast. On the cross triangle, the men who were held throughout the summer and winter seasons between the months of the rodeos were considered members of the family. Chosen for their character, as well as their knowledge of the country and their skill in their work, the dean and Stella, as Miss Baldwin is called throughout all the country, always spoke of them affectionately as our boys. And this, better than anything that could be said, is an introduction to the mistress of the Cross Triangle household. At the challenging laugh which followed Curly's observation, Phil returned quietly with his sunny smile. Maybe I'll quit him before he gets good and started. He sure fixin' to make you back the decision of them contest judges, offered Bob Colton. And Miss Baldwin, young in spirit as any of her boys, added, Better not wear your medal, son. It might excite him to know you're the champion buster of Arizona. Shucks, piped up little Billy excitingly. Phil can ride anything that wears hair, can't you, Phil? Phil, embarrassed at the laughter which followed, said with tactile seriousness to his little champion, That's right, kid. You stand up for your partner every time, don't you? You'll be riding them yourself before long. There's a little sorrel in that bunch that I picked out to gentle just for you. He glanced at his employer meaningly, and the dean's face glowed with appreciation of the young man's thoughtfulness. That little old horse Shep of yours, continued Phil to little Billy, She's getting too stiff and old for your work. I've noticed him stumbling a lot lately. Again, he glanced inquiringly at the dean, who answered the look with a slight nod of approval. You better make him gentle your horse first, Billy. He might not be in the business when that big one gets through with him, teased Curly. Little Billy's retort came in a flash. Huh? Wild horse Phil can be riding him long after you've gotten yours, Curly Elson. Oh, look out, son, cautioned the dean when the laughter had gone round again. Curly will be slipping a burr under your saddle if you don't. Then to the men, what horse is it that you boys think is going to be such a bad one? That big bay with the blazed face? The cowboys nodded. He's bad, all right, said Phil. Well, commented the dean, leaning back in his chair and speaking generally. He sure got a license to be bad. His mother was the wickedest piece of horse flesh I ever knew. You remember her, Stella? Indeed I do, returned Mrs. Baldwin. She nearly ruined that windy Jim who came from nobody knows where and brags he could ride anything. The dean chuckled. She sure sent Wendy back where he came from. But I tell you, boys, that kind of horse makes the best in the world once you got em broke right. Horses are like men anyhow. If they ain't got enough in em to fight when they're being broke, they generally aren't worth breaking. Well, the man who rides that bay will sure be a horseback, said Curly. Oh, he's a horse, all right, agreed Bob. Breakfast over, the men left the house, not too quietly, and laughing and jesting and romping like schoolboys, went out to the corrals with little Billy tagging eagerly at their heels. 
The Dean and Phil remained for a few minutes at the table. You really oughtn't to say such things to those boys, Will, reproved Miss Baldwin as she watched them from the window. It encourages them to be wild, and land knows they don't need any encouragement. Oh, shucks, returned the dean with that gentle note that was always in his voice when he spoke to her. If such talk as that can hurt him, there ain't nothing that could save him. You're always afraid someone's going to be going bad. Look at me and Phil here, he added, as they turned and pushed the, the chairs back from the table. You fuss over us enough to spoil a dozen men, and ain't we been a credit to you all the time? At this they laughed together, but as Phil was leaving the house, Miss Baldwin stopped him at the door to say earnestly, You be careful today, won't you, son? You know, my other Phil. She stopped and turned away. The young man knew that story, a story common to that land, where the lives of men were not infrequently offered a sacrifice to the untamed strength of the life that many forms they daily called upon to meet and master. Oh, never mind, mother, he said gently. I'll, I'll be all right. Then, more lightly, he added with his sunny smile, If that big bay starts anything with me, I'll climb the corral fence pronto. Quickly, as one who faces a hard day's work, Phil went up to the saddle shed where he buckled on chaps and spurs. Then, after looking carefully to stir up and leathers and clinches and let Tangozi, went out to the corral, the big heavy saddle, under his arm. Curly and Bob, their horses saddle and ready, were making animated targets of themselves for little Billy who, mounted on Shep, a gentle old cow horse, was whirling a miniature riad. As the foreman appeared, the cowboys dropped their fun, and mounted, and took the coils of their own rawhide ropes in hand. "'Which one you want first, Phil?' said Curly as he moved towards the gate between the big corral and the smaller enclosure that held the band of horses. Uh, "'That black one with the white star will do,' directed Phil quietly. And then to little Billy, "'You better get back there out of the way, partner. That little black is liable to jump a curlier over you and Shep. "'You better get outside, son.' directed the dean, who had come out to watch the beginning of the work. "'No, no, please, Uncle Phil,' begged the lad. "'They can't get me as long as I'm on Shep.' Phil and the dean laughed. "'I'll look out for him," said the young man. "'Only,' he added to the boy, "'you must keep out of the way. "'And see that you stick to Shep, "'if you expect him to take care of you,' finished the dean, relenting. Meanwhile, the gate between the corrals had been thrown open and with Bob to guard the opening. Curly rode in amongst the unbroken horses to cut out the animal that was indicated by Phil, and from within the circular enclosure where the earth had been ground to fine powder by hundreds of thousands of frightened feet came the rolling thunder of quick-beaten hooves as in a swirling cloud of yellow dust the horses rushed and leaped and whirled. Again and again the frightened animals threw themselves against the barrier that hemmed them in. But that fence built to cedar posts were set close in stockade fashion and laced on the outside with wire was made to withstand the maddening rush of the heaviest of steers. And always, amid the confusion of the frenzied animals, the figure of the mounted man in their midst could be seen calmly directing their wildest motions, and soon... Out from the crowding, jostling, whirling mass of flying feet and tossing manes and tails, the black, with the white star, shot through the gate. Bob's horse leapt aside from the way. Curly's horse was between the black and his mates, and before the animal could gather his confused senses, he was in the larger corral. The day's work had begun. The black dodged skillfully, and the loop of Curly's riata missed the mark. You better put some eyes on that rope, Curly, remarked Phil, as he stepped aside to avoid the wild rush. The chagrin cowboy said something in a low tone and so that little Billy couldn't hear. The dean chuckled. Bob's riata shot out and 
whirled as its snaky length and the trained horse braced itself skillfully to the black weight of the rope. For a few minutes, the animal at the loop's end of the riata struggled desperately, plunging, tugging, and throwing himself this way and that, but always the expert cow horse turned with his victim, and the rope was never slack. When his first wild attempts were over and the black stood with his wide braced feet, breathing heavily as if the choking loop began to tell, the strain on the taut riata was lessened, and Phil went quietly forward towards the captive Freighton. No one spoke or moved. This was not an exhibition of success of which depended on the vicious wildness of the horse to be conquered. This was work and it was not Phil's business to provoke the black to extremes in order to exhibit his own prowess as a rider for the pleasure of spectators who had paid to see a show. The rider was employed to win the confidence of the unbroken horse entrusted to him, to force obedience if necessary, to gentle and train, and so make of the wild creature a useful and valuable servant of the dean. There are riders whose method demand that they throw every unbroken horse and given them to handle, and who gentle an animal by beating it about the head with loaded quirts and whipping its flanks open with sharp spurs and tearing its mouth with torturing bits and ropes. These turn over to their employers as their finished product horses that are broken indeed, but broken only in spirit, with no heart or courage left in them, with dispositions ruined and often with physical injuries from which they never recover. But riders of such method have no place among the men employed by the owners of the Dean's type. On the cross triangle, and indeed on all ranches where conservative business principles are in force, the horses are handled with all the care and gentleness that the work and the individual of the horse will permit. After a little, Phil's hand gently touched the black's head. Instantly, the struggle resumed. The rider dodged a vicious blow from the strong forefeet and with a good-natured laugh softly chided the desperate animal. And so, presently, the kind hand was again stretched forth, and then a broad band of leather was deftly slipped over the black's frightened eyes. Another thicker and softer rope was knotted so that it would not slip from around the sweaty neck and fashioned into a hackamore or halter about the horse's nose. And then the riata was loosened. Working deftly and silently, gently, ever wary of those dangerous hooves, Phil next placed blanket and saddle on the trembling black and drew the clinch tight. Then the gate leading from the corral to the open range was swung back. Easily, but quickly and surely, the rider swung to his seat. He paused a moment to be sure that all was right, then leaning forward he reached over and raised the leather blindfold. For an instant, the wild unbroken horse stood still, then reared until it seemed he must fall, and then as his forefeet touched the ground again, his, the spurs went home, and with a mighty leap forward the frenzied animal dashed, bucking and plunging, pitching through the gate, and away towards the open country, followed by Curly and Bill, with little Billy spurring old Shep in hot pursuit. For a little, the Dean lingered in the suddenly empty corral. Stepping up to the end of the long watering trough, close to the dividing fence, he studded with knowing eye the animals on the other side. Then, leisurely, he made his way out of the corral, visited the water mill pump, looked in on Stella from the kitchen porch, and then saddled Brownie, his own particular horse that grazed always about the place at privileged ease, and rode off somewhere on some business of his own. When the black horse had spent his energy in vain attempting to rid himself of the dreadful burden that was attached so securely on his back, he was herded back to the corral, where the burden set him free. Dripping with sweat, trembling in every limb and muscle, wild-eyed with Detentant nostrils and heaving flanks, the black crowded in amongst his mates again, his first lesson over. His years of ease and freedom passed forever. Which one will it be this time? came Curly's question. I'll have that buckskin this trip, answered Phil. And again 
That swirling cloud of dust raised by those thundering hooves drifted over the stockade enclosure, and out of the maddened confusion the buckskin dashed wildly through the gate to be initiated into his new life. And so, hour after hour, the work went on, as horse after horse at Phil's word was cut out from the band and ridden, and every horse according to disposition and temper and strength was different. While his helpers did their part, the rider caught a few moments' rest. Always he was good-natured, soft-spoken and gentle. When a frightened horse, not understanding, tried to kill him, he accepted it as evidence of a commendable spirit, and with that sunny, boyish smile, informed his pupil kindly that he was a good horse, and must not make a fool of himself. In so many ways, as the dean had said at breakfast that morning, horses are just like men. It was mid-afternoon when the master of the cross triangle again strolled leisurely out to the corrals. Phil and his helpers, including little Billy, were just disappearing over the rise of ground beyond the gate on the farther side of the enclosure as the dean reached the gate that opened towards the barn and the house. He went on through the corral, and slowly, as one having nothing else to do, climbed the little knoll on which he could watch the riders in the distance. When the horsemen had disappeared among the scattered cedars on the ridge a mile or so to the west, the dean stood looking at that direction. But the owner of the cross triangle was not watching for the return of his men. He was not even thinking of them. He was looking beyond that cedar ridge to where, several miles away, a long, mesa-topped mountain stood black against the blue of the more distant hills. The edge of this high table land broke abruptly in a long series of vertical cliffs, the formation known to the Arizonans as the Rim Rocks. The deep shadows of the towering black walls of cliffs and the glooms of pines and cedars that hid the foot of the mountain gave the place a sinister and threatening appearance. As he looked, the dean's kindly face grew somber and stern. His blue eyes were for that moment cold and accusing. Under his grizzled mustache, his mouth, usually so ready to smile or laugh, was set in lines of uncompromising firmness. In those quiet and well-earned restful years of the dean's life, the Tally Holt Mountain outfit was the only one disturbing element. But the dean did not permit himself to be long annoyed by the thoughts provoked by the Tally Howe Mountain. Philosophically, he turned his broad back to the intruding scene and went back to the corral into the more pleasing occupation of looking at the horses. If the dean had not been so abruptly turning his back upon the landscape, he would have noticed the figure of a man moving slowly along the road that skirted the valley meadow leading from Simmons to the Cross Triangle Ranch. Presently the riders returned, and Phil, when he had removed the saddle, blanket, and hackamore from his pupil, seated himself on the edge of the watering trough beside the dean. I see you ain't tackled the big bay yet remarked the older man. I thought I'd let him look on for a while. He might figure out that he, he'd be better be good and not get himself hurt, smiled Phil. He's sure some horse, though, he said admiringly, then to his helpers. I'll take that black with the white forefoot this time, Curly. Just as the fresh horse dashed into the larger corral, a man on foot appeared coming over the rise of ground to the west. And by the time that Curly's loop was over the black's head, the man stood at the gate. One glance told Phil that this was the stranger who he had met on the divide. The man seemed to understand that it was no time for greetings and without offering to enter the enclosure, climbed on top of the big gate where he sat with one leg over the topmost bar, an interested spectator. The maneuvers of the black brought Phil to that side of the corral, and as he coolly dodged the fighting horse, he glanced up with his boyish smile and a quick nod of welcome to the man that was perched above him. The stranger smiled in return, but did not speak. He must have thought, though, that this cowboy appeared quite different from the picturesque rider he had seen at the celebration and on the summit of the divide. That, Phil Acton, had been, as the cowboy himself would have said, all togged out in his glad rags. This man wore chaps that were old, 
and patched from hard service. His shirt, unbuttoned at the throat, was the color of the corral dirt, and a generous tear revealed one muscular shoulder. His hat was greasy and battered, his face grim and streaked with dust and sweat, but his sunny, boyish smile would have identified Phil in any garb. When the rider was ready to mount, and Bob went to open the gate, the stranger climbed down and drew a little aside. And when Phil passed where he stood, looked laughingly down at him from the back of the bucking, plunging horse, he made as if to applaud but checked himself and went quickly to the top of the knoll to watch the riders until they disappeared over the ridge. Howdy. Fine weather we're having. It was the dean's hearty voice. He had gone forward courteously to greet the stranger while the latter was watching the riders. The man turned impulsively, his face lighting with enthusiasm. By Jove, he exclaimed, but that man can ride. Yes, Phil does pretty well, returned the dean indifferently. He won the championship at Prescott the other day, and then, more heartily, he's a good boy, too. Take him any way you like. As he spoke, the cattleman looked the stranger over critically, much as though he would have a steer or a horse, noting the long limbs, the well-made body, the strong face and clear, dark eyes. The man's dress told the dean simply that the stranger was from the city. His bearing commanded the older man's respect. The stranger's next statement, as he looked thoughtfully over the wide land of valley and hill, mesa, and mountain, convinced the dean that he was a man of judgment. Arizona's wonderful country, sir. It's wonderful. Finest in the world, sir, agreed the dean promptly. There just naturally ain't any better. We got the climate, we got the land, and we got the men. The stranger looked at the dean quickly when he said men. It was worth much to hear the dean speak that word. Indeed you have, he said heartily. I have never seen such men. Of course you haven't, said the dean. I, I tell you, sir, they just don't make them outside Arizona. It takes a country like this to produce real men. A man's got to be a man out here. Of course, though, he admitted kindly. We don't know much except to ride and throw a rope, shoot maybe once in a while. The riders were returning, and the dean and the stranger walked back down the little hill to the corral. You have a fine ranch here, Mr. Baldwin, again the observated stranger said. The dean glanced at him sharply. Many men have tried to buy the cross triangle. This man certainly appeared prosper enough, though he was walking, but there was no accounting for the queer things that city men would do. It does pretty well, the cattleman admitted. I managed to make a living. The other smiled as though slightly embarrassed, and then, Do you need any help? Help? The dean looked at him amazed. I mean... I'd like a position to work for you, you know. The dean was speechless. Again, he surveyed the stranger with his measuring critical look. You've never done any work, he said gently. The man stood very straight before him and spoke almost defiantly. No, I haven't, but is that any reason why I shouldn't? The dean's eyes twinkled as though they would have a way of doing when you say something he liked. I'd say it's a better reason why you should, he returned quietly. Then he said to Phil, who had dismissed his four-legged pupil, was coming towards him. Phil, this man wants a job. Do you think we could use him? The young man looked at the stranger with unfeigned surprise and a hint of amusement, but gave no sign that he had ever seen him before. The same natural decency of feeling that had prevented the cowboy from discussing the man upon whose privacy he felt he had intruded that evening of their meeting on the divide led him now to ignore the incident, a consideration which could not but command the strange man's respect, and from which he looked his gratitude. There was something about this stranger, too, that to Phil seemed different. This tall, well-built fellow, 
who stood before them so self-possessed and ready for anything, was not altogether like the uncertain, embarrassed, and half-frightened, troubled gentleman at whom Phil had first laughed when that thinly veiled contempt and then had been pitied. It was as though the man who sat that night alone on the divide had, out of the very bitterness of that experience, called forth from within himself a strength of which, until then, he had only been dimly cautious. There was now in his face and bearing courage and decision and purpose, and with it all the glint of the same humour that made him so bitterly mock himself. The dean's philosophy, touching the possibilities of the man who laughs when he is hurt, seemed in this stranger about to be justified. Phil felt oddly, too, that the man was in a way experimenting with himself, testing himself, as it were, and being altogether a normal human. The cowboy felt strongly inclined to help the experimenter. In this spirit he answered the dean, while looking mischievously at the stranger. We could use him if he can ride. The stranger smiled understandingly. Well, I don't see why I couldn't, he returned in that drawl tone. I seem to have legs. He looked down at his lower limbs reflectively, as though quaintly considering them to be apart from himself. Phil laughed. Huh, said the dean, slightly mystified at the apparent understanding between the young men. And then to the stranger. What do you want to work for? You don't look as though you need to. A sort of vacation? There was spirit in the man's answer. I want to work for the reason that all men want to work. If you do not employ me, I'll try somewhere else. You come from Prescott to Simmons on the stage, did you? No, sir. I walked. Walked? Huh. Try anything else for a job? No, sir. Who sent you out here? The stranger smiled. I saw Mr. Acton ride in the contest, and I learned that he was foreman of the Cross Triangle Ranch. I thought I would rather work where he worked if I could. The dean looked at Phil. Phil looked at the dean. Together, they looked at the stranger. The two cowboys who were sitting on their horses nearby grinned at each other. And what's your name, sir? The dean asked courteously. For the first time, the man hesitated and seemed embarrassed. He looked uneasily about with a helpless inquiring glance as though appealing for some suggestion. Oh, never mind your name if you've forgotten it, said the dean dryly. The stranger's roaming eyes fell upon Phil's old chaps and then in every wrinkle and scar and rip and tear, gave such a testimony to the wearer's life. In that curious, self-mocking smile touched his lips, and then, throwing up his head, looked the dean straight in the eye. He said boldly, but with that note of a drawl humor in his voice, My name is Patches, sir. Honorable Patches. The dean's eyes twinkled, but his face was grave. Phil's face flushed. He had not failed to identify the source of the stranger's inspiration, but before either the dean or Phil could speak, a shout of laughter came from Curly Elson, and the stranger had turned to face the cowboy. Same something amused you, he said quietly to the man on the horse. And at the tone of his voice, Phil and the dean exchanged significant glances. The grinning cowboy looked down at the stranger in evident contempt. Patches, he drawled. Honorable Patches, that's a hell of a name now, ain't it? The man took two long steps forward towards the mocking rider and spoke quietly but with unmistakable meaning. I'll endeavor to make it all of that to you, if you'll get off your horse. The grinning cowboy, with a wink at his companion, dismounted cheerfully. Curly Elson was held to be the best man with his hands in Yapi County. He could not refuse so tempting an opportunity to add to his well-earned reputation. Five minutes later, Curly lifted himself on one elbow to the corral dust, 
and looked up with respectful admiration to the quiet man who stood waiting for him to rise. Curly's lip was bleeding generously, and the side of his face seemed to have slipped out of place, and his left eye was closing surely and rapidly. Get up, said the tall man calmly. There's more where that came from, if you would like it. The cowboy grinned painfully. Well, I don't seem to be hankering for any more, he mumbled, feeling his face tenderly. I said that my name was Patches, suggested the stranger. Sure, Mr. Patches, I reckon no one'll question that. Honorable Patches, again prompted the stranger. Yes, yes, sir, you bet, Honorable Patches, agreed Curly with emphasis. And then, as he painfully regained his feet, he held out his hand with as near a smile as his battered features would permit. Do you mind shaking on it, Mr. Honorable Patches, just to show there's no hard feelings? Patches responded instantly with a manner that won Curly's heart. Good, he said. I knew you would do that when you understood, or I wouldn't have bothered to show you my credentials. My mistake, returned Curly. It's them there credentials of yarn, not your name that's hell. He gingerly mounted his horse again, and Patches turned back to the dean as though apologizing for the interruption. I beg your pardon, sir, but... About the work? The dean never told anyone just what his thoughts were at that particular moment, probably because they were so many and so contradictory and confusing. Where from this uncertainty of mine, from a habit of depending upon his young foreman, or because of that something which Phil and the strangers seemed to have in common, he shifted the whole matter by saying, It's up to Phil here. He's foreman on the cross triangle. If he wants to hire you, it's all right with me. At this, the two young men faced each other, and on the face of each other was a half-questioning, half-challenging smile. The stranger seemed to say, I know I'm at your mercy, and I don't expect you to believe me after our meeting at the divide, but I dare you to put me to the test. And Phil, if he had spoken, might have said, I felt... When I met you first, there, there was a man somewhere around. I know you're curious to see what you can do if you're put to that test, and I'm curious too, and I'll give you the chance. Aloud, he reminded the stranger pointedly. I said we might use you if you could ride. Patches smiled his self-mocking smile, evidently appreciating his predicament. And I said, he retorted, I didn't see why I couldn't. Phil turned to his grinning but respectful helpers. Bring out that bay with the blazed face. Great snakes, ejected Curly to Bill as they reached the gate leading to the corral. His name's Patches, all right, but he'll be in pieces when that bay devil gets through with him if he can't ride. Do you think he can? I don't know, returned Bob as he unlatched the gate with a, without dismounting. I thought he couldn't fight. So did I, returned Curly, grimly nursing his battered face. You cut out that horse, I can't more than half see. It was no trouble cutting out the bay. The big horse seemed to understand that his time had come. All day he had seen his mates go forth their testing, he had watched them as they fought with all their strength, the skill and endurance of that smiling boy-faced man and then had seen them as they returned, sweating, trembling, conquered, and subdued. As Bob rode towards him, he stood for one defiant moment as motionless as a horse of bronze, and then, with a suddenness that gave Curly at the gate barely enough time to dodge his rush, he leaped forward into the large arena. Phil was watching the stranger as the big horse came through the gate. The man did not move, but his eyes were glowing darkly, his face was flushed and he was smiling to himself mockingly as though amused at the thought about what was about to happen to him. The dean also was watching Patches, and again the young foreman and his employer exchanged significant glances as Phil turned and went quickly to little Billy. Lifting the lad from his saddle and seating him on the fence above the long watering trough, he said, That's a grand stand there for you, partner. Don't get down unless you have to, and... 
If you do, get down outside, you see? At that moment, yells of warning with a look out, Phil, came from Curly, Bob, and the Dean. A quick look over his shoulder, and Phil saw the big horse with ears wickedly flat and eyes a-gleaming, teeth bared making straight in his direction. The animal had apparently singled him out as the author of his misfortunes and proposed to dispose of his arch enemy at the very outset of the battle. There was only one sane thing to do, and Phil did it. A vigorous, scrambling leap placed him beside little Billy and on top of the fence outside the watering trough. Good thing I reserved a seat on your grandstand for myself, wasn't it, partner? He smiled at the boy by his side. Then Bob's riata fell true, and as the powerful horse plunged and fought that strangling noose, Phil came leisurely down from the fence. Where are you going, Phil? chuckled the dean. You sure aren't wasting any time, laughed Curly. And Bob, without taking his eyes from the vicious animal at the end of his tight rope, worked skillfully with his trained cow horse to foil every wicked plunge and wild leap, grinning with anticipation as he added, I'd bet four bets you can't do it again, Phil, without a running start. Well, I just thought I'd keep little Billy company for a spell, smiled Phil. He, he was sort of lonesome up here. The stranger, at first amazed that they could turn into a jest and incident, which so easily could have been tragedy, suddenly laughed aloud, a joyous ringing laugh that made Phil look at him sharply. "'Begging your pardon, Mr. Acton,' said Patches meekly, but with that droll voice which brought a glint of humor into the foreman's eyes and called forth another chuckle from the dean. "'You can take my saddle,' said Phil pointedly. It's over there at the end of the watering trough. You'll find the stirrups about right, I reckon. I ride with them a little long. For a moment, the stranger looked him straight in the eyes and then, without a word, started for the saddle. He was halfway to the end of the watering trough when Phil overtook him. I believe I'd rather saddle him myself, the cowboy explained quietly with a sunny smile. You see, I got to teach these horses some cow sense before fall rodeo and... I'm rather particular about the way they're handled at the start. Well, exactly, returned Patches. I don't blame you. That fellow seems rather to demand careful treatment, doesn't he? Phil laughed. Oh, you needn't be too particular about his feelings once you're up in the middle of them. The big bay, instead of acquiring sense from his observation, as Phil had expressed to the dean a hope that he would, seemed to have gained courage and determination. Phil's approach was the signal for a wild plunge in the young man's direction, which was checked by the skill and the weight of Bob's trained cow horse on the rope. Several times Phil went towards the bay, and every time his advance was met by one of those vicious rushes. Then Phil mounted Curly's horse, and from his hand the loop of another rope fell onto the bay's head. Shortening his rope by coiling it with his rein hand, he maneuvered the trained horse closer and closer to his struggling captive until, with Bob's cooperation on the other side of the fighting animal, he was within safety fixed the leather blindfold over those wicked eyes. When at last Hackmore and Saddle were in place, the bay stood trembling and sweating. Phil wiped the perspiration from his own forehead and turned to the stranger. "'Your horse is ready, sir.' The man's face was perhaps a shade whiter than its usual color, but his eyes were glowing, and there was a grim set look about his smiling lips that made the hearts of those men go out to him. He seemed to realize so much that the joke was upon him, and with it all exhibited such reckless indifference to consequences. Without an instant's hesitation, he started towards that horse. "'Great snakes,' muttered Curly to Bill. "'That feller's got some nerve.' The dean started forward. Hold up a minute there, Mr. Patches, he said. The stranger faced him. Can you ride that horse? asked the dean pointedly. Well, I plan to, returned Patches, but, he added with his droll humor, can't say how far I will, though. 
don't you know that he'd kill you if he can? Questioned the dean curiously with his eyes twinkling approval. He does seem to have such a notion, doesn't he? Appeared Patches. Perhaps you better let him alone, said the dean. You'd, you don't need to kill yourself to get a job on this outfit. That's quite kind of you, sir, returned the stranger gratefully. I'd rather glad you said that, but I'm going to ride him just the same. They looked at him in amazement, for it was clear to them now that the man really could not ride. The dean spoke kindly. Why? Because, said Patches slowly, I'm curious to see what I'll do under such circumstances, and if I don't try the experiment now, I'll never know whether I had the nerve or not. As he finished, he turned and walked deliberately towards the horse. Phil ran to Curly's side, and the cowboy, at his foreman's gesture, leapt from his saddle. The young man mounted his helper's horse and, with a quick movement, caught the riata from the saddle horn and flipped open a ready loop. The stranger was close to the bays off or right side. Other side patches, called Phil. You want to start in right, you know. Not a man laughed, except the stranger. Thanks, he said, and came around to the proper side. Take your time, called Phil again. Stand by his shoulder and watch his heels. Take the stirrup with your right hand and turn it to catch your foot. Stay back by his shoulder until you're ready to swing up. Take your time. I won't be long, returned Patches as he awkwardly gained his seat in the saddle. Phil moved his horse closer to the center of the corral and shook out his loop a little. When you're ready, lean over and pull up the blindfold. The man on the horse did not hesitate. With every angry nerve and muscle strained to the utmost, the powerful bay leapt in the air, come down with legs stiff and head between his knees. For an instant, the man miraculously kept his place. With another vicious plunge and a corkscrew twist, the maddening brute went up again, and this time the man flung from the saddle as if from a giant catapult to fall upon his shoulders and back in the crawl dust where he lay still. The horse, rid of his enemy, leapt again, and then with cat-like quickness and devilish cunning world, and with wicked teeth bared, vicious blazing eyes, rushed the helpless man on the ground. With a yell, Bob spurred to put himself between the bay and his victim, but had there been time the move would have been useless, for no horse could have withstand that maddened charge. The vicious beast was within a bound of his victim and had reared to crush him with the weight of a heavy hooves when a rawhide rope tightened about those uplifted forefeet and the bay himself crashed to the earth. Leaving the cow horse to hold the rope tight, Phil sprang from his saddle and ran to the fallen man. The dean came with water in his felt hat from the trough and presently the stranger opened his eyes. For a moment, he lay looking up into their faces as though wondering where he was and what happened to him. "'Are you hurt, bad son?' asked the dean. That brought him to his senses. He got to his feet somewhat uneasily and began brushing the dust from his clothes. Then he looked curiously towards the horse that Curly was holding down by the simple means of sitting on the animal's head. "'I certainly thought my legs were long enough to reach around him.' he said reflectively. How in the world did he manage it? I seemed to be fallen for a week. Phil yelled and the dean laughed until the tears ran down his red cheeks while Bob and Curly went wild. Patches went to the horse and gravely walked around him. And then, Let him up, he said to Curly. The cowboy looked at Phil. He nodded. As the bay regained his feet, Patches started towards him. Here, said the dean, you come away from there. I'm going to see if he can do that again, declared Patches grimly. Not today, you ain't, returned the dean. You're working for me now, and you're too good a man to be killed trying any more crazy experiments. At the dean's word, the look of gratitude in the man's eyes was almost pathetic. I 
wonder if I am, he said, so low that only the dean and Phil heard. If you are what? asked the dean, puzzled by his manner. Worth anything as a man, you know, came the strange reply. The dean chuckled. You'll be all right when you get your growth. Come on over here now, out of the way, while Phil takes some of the cussedness out of that fool horse. Together, they watched Phil ride the bay and return him to his mates after a very tired and a much wiser pupil. Then, while Patches remained to watch further observations at the corral, the dean went to the house to tell Stella all about it. What do you th think he really is? She asked at the last of the long list of questions and comments. Dean shook his head. There ain't no telling. A man like that's liable to be anything. Then he added with his usual philosophy. He acts, though, like a genuine thoroughbred that's been badly mishandled and was just found out. When the day's work was finished and the supper was over, little Billy found patches where he stood looking across the valley towards Granite Mountain that loomed so boldly against the soft light of the evening sky. The man greeted the boy awkwardly as though not accustomed to children. But little Billy, very much at ease, signified his readiness to help the stranger in an intimate acquaintance with the world of which he knew so much more than this big man. He began with no waste of time on mere preliminaries. See that mountain over there? That's Granite Mountain. There's wild horses that live over there, and sometimes we catch them. Bet you didn't know that Phil's name is Wild Horse Phil. Patches smiled. It's a good name for him, ain't it? You bet. He turned and pointed eagerly to the west. There's other mountains over there I bet you didn't know the name of. Which ones do you mean? I, I see several. That long black-looking one, do you know about it? I'm really afraid that I don't. Well, I'll tell you, said Billy, proud of his superior knowledge. That there's Tally Holt Mountains. Indeed. Yes, and Nick Cambert and Yapai Joe live over there. Do you know about them? Tall man shook his head. No, don't believe that I do. Little Billy lowered his voice to a mysterious whisper. Well, I'll tell you. Only you mustn't ever say anything about it out loud. Nick and Joe are cattle thieves. They're branding our calves, and Phil, he's about to catch them on it some day. Then they'll wish they hadn't. Phil, he's my partner, you know. A fine partner indeed, returned the stranger, as if not wishing to inquire further information about the men of Tally Holt Mountain. You bet he is, came the instant reply. Only Jim Reed, he don't like him very well. That's too bad, isn't it? Yeah, you see, Jim Reed is Kitty's daddy. They live way over there. He pointed across the meadow to where, a mile away, a light twinkled in the window of the Pot Hook S ranch house. Kitty Reed's a mighty nice girl, I tell you, but Jim, he says there need no cowpuncher come around trying to get her because she's been away to school, you know, and I think Phil... Whoa, hold on a minute, Sonny interrupted Patches hastily. "'What's the matter?' questioned Bill, little Billy. "'Why, it strikes me that a boy with a partner like Wild Horse Phil ought to be mighty careful about how he talks others that might be private affairs with a stranger. Don't you maybe think so?' "'Maybe so,' agreed Billy. "'But, you see, I know that Phil wants Kitty, "'cause... Shh! What in the world is that?' whispered Patches in great fear, catching his little companion by the arm. That? Don't you know an owl when you hear one? Golly, you're a tenderfoot, aren't you? Catching sight of the dean, who was coming towards him, he shouted gleefully, Uncle Will! Mr. Patches is scared of an owl! What do you think about that? Patches is scared of an owl! Your Aunt Stella wants you, laughed the dean. Billy ran off to the house to share his joke of the tenderfoot with his Aunt Stella and his partner, Phil. "'I've got to go to town tomorrow,' said the dean. 
I expect you better get along and get your trunk or whatever you have or some of an outfit. You can't work in them clothes. Patches answered hastily. Why, I think I can get her along all right, Mr. Baldwin. But you'll want your stuff or your trunk or grip or whatever you got, retained the deed. I haven't nothing in Prescott, said the stranger slowly. You haven't? Well, you'll need an outfit anyway, persisted the cattleman. Really, I think I can get along for a while, Patches replied defiantly. The dean considered for a little, and then he said with a straightforward bluntness, but not at all unkind, Look here, young man. You aren't afraid to go to Prescott, are you? The other laughed. Not at all, sir. It's not that. I suppose I should tell you now, though. All the clothes that I have are on my back, and I haven't a cent in the world with which to buy an outfit, as you call it. The dean chuckled. So, that's it. I thought maybe you was dodging the sheriff. If it's just plain broke that's the matter, why, you'll go to town with me in the morning, and we'll get you what you need. I'll hold it out of your wages until it's paid. Not a problem. As though the matter was settled, he turned back towards the house, adding, Phil will show you where you're to sleep. When the foreman had found the new man to his room, the cowboy asked casually, You find the goat ranch all right? Night before last, did you? The other hesitated, and then he said gravely, I didn't look for it, Mr. Acton. You didn't look for it? No, sir. You mean to say that you spent the night up there on the divide without blankets or anything? Yes, sir, I did. And where'd you stop at last night? At Simmons. Walked, I suppose? Stranger smiled. Yes. Well, look here, said the puzzled cowboy. I don't mean anything by asking questions which are none of my business, but I can't figure it out. If you were coming out here to get a job on the cross triangle, why didn't you go to Mr. Baldwin in town? Anyone could have pointed him out to you. Why didn't you say something to me when we were talking back at the Divide? Why, you see, explained the other lamely, I didn't exactly want to work on the cross triangle or anywhere. But you told Uncle Will that you wanted to work here and you were on your way here when I met you. Yeah, I know, but you see, oh, hang it all, Mr. Acton, haven't you ever wanted to do something that you didn't want to do? Haven't you ever been caught in a corner that you were simply forced to get out of when you didn't like the only way you had to get out? I don't mean anything criminal, he added with a short laugh. Yes, I have, returned the other seriously, and if you don't mind, there's no handle to my name. Round here, it's just plain Phil, Mr. Patches. Thanks. Patches doesn't need any decorating, neither. And now, one more, said Phil with his winning smile. Why in the name of all the obstinate fools that roam at large did you walk out here when you could have had plenty of chances to ride? Well, you see, said Patches slowly, I fear I can't explain, but it was just part of my job. Your job? But you didn't have any job until this afternoon. Oh, yeah, I did. I had the biggest kind of a job. You see, that's what I was doing on the Divide all last night. Trying to find some other way of doing it. Do you mind telling me what that job is? Asked Phil curiously. Patches laughed as though at himself. I don't know that I can exactly. I think perhaps it's just to ride that big bay horse out there. Phil laughed aloud, a hearty laugh of good fellowship. You'll do that, all right. You really think so? Asked Patches eagerly. Sure, I know it. I wish I could be sure. Returned the strange man doubtfully, and the cowboy wondering saw that wistful look in his eyes. That big devil's a man's horse, all right, mused Phil. Why, of course, and that's just it, don't you see? 
cried the other. Then, as if he regretted his words, he added quickly, Do you name your horses? Sure, answered the cowboy. We generally find something to call them. And have you named that big bay yet? Phil laughed. I named him yesterday when he broke away as we were breaking in the bunch. I had to rope him to get him back. What'd you name him? Stranger. Stranger? And why stranger? Oh, I don't know. Just one of my fool notions, returned Phil. Good night. End of chapter four. Chapter five. The next morning, Mr. Baldwin and Patches set out for town. I suppose, said the dean in a slightly curious tone, colored the remark. It may be you're more used to automobiles. Buck and Prince here in this old buckboard might seem pretty slow to you. Patches was stepping into the rig as the dean spoke. As the young man took a seat at the cattleman's side, the dean nodded to Phil, who was holding the team. At the signal, Phil released the horse's head and stepped aside, whereupon Buck and Prince of one mind looked back over their shoulders made a few playful attempts to twist themselves out of the harness, lunged forward their length, and stood straight up on their hind feet, then sprang away as if they were fully determined to land that buckboard and Prescott within the next fifteen minutes. "'You say slow?' questioned Patches as he clung to his seat. The dean chuckled and favored his new man with a twinkling gleam of approval. A few seconds later, on the other side of the sandy wash, the dean skillfully checked their headlong career with a narrow margin of safety between the team and the gate. I reckon we'll get through with less fuss if you'll open the gate, he said to Patches and then to Buck and Prince. Whoa, you blamned fools, won't you stand a minute? Stella's been devilin' me to get a machine ever since Jim Reed got his. He continued while the horses were repeating their preliminary contortions, and then Patches was regaining a seat. But I told her I'd be scared to death to ride in one of them fool contraptions. At this, Buck and Prince, in a wild riot of animal strength and spirit, leapt a slight depression in the road with such vigor that the front wheels of the buckboard left the ground. Patches glanced sideways at his employer with a smile of delighted appreciation, but said nothing. The dean liked him for that. The dean always insisted that the hardest man in the world to talk to is one who always has something to say for himself. Why, he continued with a burst of honest feeling, if I ever bring one of them things home to the cross triangle, I'd be ashamed to look a horse or steer in the face again. They dashed through a patch of wild sunflowers that in the bottom lands grew thick and rank, whirled past the tumble-down corner of an old fence that enclosed a long neglected garden and dashed recklessly through a deserted and weed-and-grown yard. On one side of the road was the ancient barn and stable with sagging, weather-beaten roof, leaning walls, and battered doors that hung dejected on their rusty and broken hinges. The corral stockade was breached in many places by the years that had rotted away the posts. The old-time windless pump that, operated by a blind burrow, once lifted water from the long vanished herds, was a pathetic old wreck, incapable now of offering a drink to a thirsty sparrow. On the other hand, beneath the wide branches of giant sycamores and walnuts, and backed by a tangling orchard wilderness, stood an old house, empty, neglected, as if in the shadowy gloom of the untrimmed trees it waited, lonely and forlorn, the kindly hand of oblivion. "'That's the old Acton homestead,' said the dean quietly, as though one speaking beside an ancient grave. Then, as they were driving through the narrow lane that across the great meadow he indicated with a nod of his head a group of buildings on the other side of the green fields and less than a mile to the south that there's jim reed's place his iron is the pot hook s jim's stock runs on the old acton range but the homestead it belongs to phil jim reed's a fine man 
The dean spoke stoutly as though he was making the assertion to convince himself. Yes, sir, Jim's all right. Good neighbor, good cowman, square as they make him. Some folks seem to think he's a mite overbearing and rough-spoken sometimes, and he's kind of quick on suspicion in everybody. But Jim and me, we've always gotten along the best of kind. Again the dean was silent as though he had forgotten the man beside him and his occupation with thoughts that he could not share. When they crossed the valley, meadow, and climbed the hill on the other side, they could see the road for several miles ahead. The dean pointed to a black object on the next ridge. There's Jim's automobile now. They're heading for Prescott too. Kitty driving, I reckon. I tell Stella that machine and Kitty's learning to run the thing is about all the returns that Jim can show for the money he'd spent on educating her. I don't mean, he added with a quick look at Patches as though he feared to be misunderstood. I don't mean that Kitty's one of them good-for-nothing butterfly girls. She ain't that by a good deal. Why, she was raised right here in this neighborhood, and we love her the same as if she was our own. She can cook a meal and make a dress about as well as her mother, and does too. And she can ride a horse or throw a rope better than some cow punchers I've seen, but... The dean stopped, seeming for want of words to express his exact thoughts. Seems to me, offered Patches abstractedly, that education, as we call it, is a benefit only when it adds to our lives. If schooling or culture, or whatever you choose to term it, is permitted to rob one of the fundamental and essential elements of life, it's most certainly an evil. That's the idea exclaimed the dean with frank admiration for his companion's ability to say that which he himself thought. You said it like a book, but that's it. It ain't the learning and all the stuff that Kitty got while she was at school that worried us. It's what she's likely to lose through getting them. This here modern, down-to-the-minute, high-living, lofty sphere, intellectual supremacy idea is all right if folks just keep their feet on the ground. You take Stella and me now, I, I know we're old-fashioned and slow and all that, and we've seen a lot of hardships since we was married over there in Skull Valley where she was born and raised. She was just a girl then, and I was only a kid punching steers for a living. I suppose we've seen about as hard times as any. At least, that's what they'd call them now, but hell, we didn't think nothing of it then. We was happy, sir. We've been happy for over forty year, and I tell you, sir, we lived. Just lived every minute. And that's a blam sight more than a lot of them higher cultured, top lofty, half dead couples that marry and separate and separate and marry again nowadays would say. No, sir. It ain't what a man gets that makes him rich, it's what he keeps. And these folks that are swamping the ideas of old-fashioned sort of love that builds homes and raises family and lets my man and wife work together, meet trouble together and be happy together, grow old and being happy together. And if they're swamping all that for these new down-to-date ideas of such things, they're making a pretty damned poor bargain, according to my way of thinking. There's such a thing, sir, as educating a man or woman plumb out of the reach of happiness. Look at our Phil, the dean continued, for the man beside him was a wonderful listener. There's just naturally couldn't be a better all-around man than that Phil Acton. He's healthy. He don't know what it is to have an hour of sickness. Strong as a young bull. Clean, honest, and square. No bad habits. A fine worker and a fine thinker, too. Even if he ain't had much schooling, he certainly reads a lot. Take him any way you like, just as a man, I mean, and that's the way you gotta take him. There ain't no better man than Phil Livin. Yet, a lot of these folks would say he's nothing but a cowpuncher. As for that, Jim Reed ain't much more than a cowpuncher himself. I tell you, I've seen cowpunchers that was mighty good men. 
and I've seen graduates from them universities that was plum good for nothing, with no more real man about them than one of them wax dummies that they hang clothes on in the store windows. What any self-respecting woman can see in one of them that would make her want to marry him is more than I'd be able to ever figure out. If the dean hadn't been so engrossed in his own thoughts, he would have wondered at the strange effect of his words upon his companion. The young man's face flushed scarlet and then paled as though with sudden illness, and he looked sideways at the older man with an expression of shame and humiliation, while his eyes, wistful and pleading, were filled with pain. Honorable Patches, who had won the admiration of those men at the Cross Triangle Corrals, was again the troubled, shame-faced, half-frightened creature whom Phil met at the Divide. But the good dean did not see and so encouraged by the other's silence, he continued his dissertation. Of course, I don't mean to say that education and that sort of thing spoils every man. Now, now there's that young Stanford Manning over it. If the dean had suddenly fired a gun at Patches, the young man would have shown no greater surprise and consternation. Stanford Manning, he gasped. At his tone, the dean turned to look at him curiously. I mean, Stanford Manning, the mining engineer, he explained. Do you know him? I heard of him, Patches managed to reply. Well, continued the dean, he came out to this country about three years ago, straight from college, and he sure made good. He's got the education and culture and polish and all that, and with it, he can hold his own among any kind or sort of man living. There ain't a man, cow puncher, miner, or anything else in Yakpai County that don't take his hat off to Stanford Manning. Is he in the country now? asked Patches with the effort of self control that the dean didn't notice. No, I, I understand his company called him back east about a month ago. Gonna send him to some properties up in Montana is what I heard. When his companion made no comment, the dean said reflectively, as Buck and Prince climbed slowly up the grade to the summit of the divide, I'll tell you, son, I've seen a good many changes in this country. I can remember when there wasn't a fence in all of Yakpai County, hardly in the territory, and now by the last time I drove over to Skull Valley, I got so tangled up in them, I plum got lost. When Phil's daddy and me was youngsters, we used to ride from Camp Verde and Flagstaff clean to Date Creek without ever even opening a gate. But I can't say that men change, though. They're good and bad, just like they've always been, and I reckon always will be. There'll be leaders and weaklings, and just betwixt and betweens, and every herd of cattle and band of horses that I ever own. You take Phil now. He's exactly like his dad was before him. His father must have been a fine man, said Patches with quiet earnestness. The dean looked at him with an approval twinkle. Fine. For a few minutes, as they rounded the turn of the road on the summit of the divide, where Phil and the stranger had met, the dean looked away toward Granite Mountain. Then, as if thinking aloud, rather than purposely address his companion, he said, John Acton, honest John, everyone called him, John and I came to this country together when we were boys. We walked in, sir, with some pioneers from Kansas. We kept in touch with each other all the while while we was growing to be men, punching cattle for the same outfits most of the time, even did most of our courting together. Phil's mother and Stella were neighbors and great friends over there in Skull Valley. When we'd finally saved enough to get started, we located homesteads close to each other back there in the valley. And as soon as we could get some sort of shacks built, we married the girls and set up housekeeping. Our stock ranged together, of course, but John sort of took care of the east side of the meadows, and I kept more to the west when the children came along. John and Mary had three before Phil, but 
only Phil lived. When the children came along and the stock was increased, we built some decent houses. Things seemed to be about as fine as possible. Then John went on a note for a man in Prescott. I tried my best to keep him out of it, but shucks, he just laughed at me. You see, John was one of the best-hearted men that ever lived. One of those men you know that just naturally believes in everybody. Well, wound up after a while by John losing mighty well everything. We managed to save the homestead, but practically all the stock had to go and wasn't more than a year after that till Mary died. We never did know what was the matter with her, and after that it seemed like John was never the same. He got killed in the rodeo that fall. Just wasn't himself somehow. I was I was with him when he died. Stella and me we, we raised Phil. We don't know any difference between him and one of our own boys. The old homestead's his, of course, but Jim Reed's stock runs on the old range. Phil's got a few head that he works with mine, a pretty good bunch by now, for he keeps adding to what his father left, and I've paid him wages ever since he was big enough. Phil, he doesn't say much, even to Stella and me, but I know he's figuring on fixing up the old home place someday. After a long silence, the dean said again as though voicing some conclusion of his unspoken thoughts. Jim Reed's pretty well fixed, you see, and Kitty being the only girl, it's natural, I reckon, that they should have ideas about her future and all that. I reckon it's natural, too, that the girl should find ranch life away out here so far from everywhere, a little slow after her three years at school in the east. She never says it, but somehow you can most always tell what Kitty's thinking without her speaking a word. I know a few people like that, said Patches, probably more because there was little else he could say. Yeah, and when you know Kitty, you'll say, like I always have, if, if there's a man in Yakpe County that wouldn't ride the hooves off the best horse in his outfit day or night to win a smile from her, you ought to be lynched. That afternoon in Prescott, they purchased an outfit for Patches, and the following day set out for the long return drive to the ranch. They had reached the top of the hill at the western end of the meadow lane when they saw a young woman on a black horse riding away from the gate that opens from the lane into the pot hook s meadow pasture towards the ranch buildings on the farthest side of the field. As they drove into the yard at home, it was nearly supper time, and the men were coming down from the corrals. Kitty's been over all afternoon, little Billy informed them promptly. I told her all about you, Patches. She says she's just dying to meet you. Phil joined in in the laugh, but Patches fancied there was a bit of a shadow in the cowboy's usual sunny eyes as the young man looked at him to say, a big horse of yours sure made me ride some today. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 The education of Honorable Patches was begun without further delay. Because Phil's time was so fully occupied with his four-footed pupils, the dean himself became the stranger's teacher, and all sorts of odd jobs about the ranch from cleaning the pig pen to weeding the garden were the textbooks. The man balked at nothing. Indeed, he seemed to find a curious, grim satisfaction in accomplishing the most menial and disagreeable tasks. And when he made mistakes, as he often did, he laughed at himself with such bitter mocking humor that the dean wondered. He's got me beat, the dean confided to Stella. There ain't nothing that he won't tackle, and I'm satisfied that the man never did a stroke of work before in his life. But he seems to be always trying experiments with himself, like he's expecting himself to play the fool one way or another, and wanting to see if he would, and then when he don't, he's surprised and tickled as a kid. 
The dean himself was not at all above assisting his new man in those experiments, and so it happened that day when Patches had been set to repair in the meadow pasture fence near the lower corral. The dean, riding out that way to see how his pupil was progressing, noticed a particular cross-tempered shorthorn bull that had wandered in from a nearby range to water at the house corral. But Phil and his helpers were in possession of the premises near the watering trough, and his shorthorn majesty was therefore even more than usual out of patience with the whole world. The corral was between the bull and patches, so that the animal had not noticed the man and the dean chuckling to himself, and without attracting Patch's attention, quietly drove the ill-tempered beast into the enclosure and shut the gate. Then, riding around the corral, the dean called to the young man. When Patches stood beside his employer, the cattleman said, Here's a bland old bull. Don't seem to be feeling very well. I got him in the corral all right, but I'm so fat I can't reach him from the saddle. I wish you'd just halt him with this rope so I can lead him up to the house and let Phil and the boys see what's wrong with him. Patches took the rope and started towards the corral gate. Should I put it around his neck and make a hitch over his nose like you do a horse? He asked, glad for the opportunity to exhibit his newly acquired knowledge of horses and ropes and such things. No, just just tie it around his horns, the dean answered. He, he'll come all right. The bull, seeing a man on foot at the entrance to his prison, rumbled a deep-throated threat and pawed the earth with angry strength. For an instant, Patches, with his hand on the latch of the gate, paused a glance from the dangerous animal that waited for his coming to the dean who sat on his horse just outside the gate. Then he slipped inside the corral and closed the gate behind him. The bull gazed at him a moment as if amazed at the audacity of this mere human and then lowered his head for the charge. Climb that gate quick, yelled the dean at the critical moment, and Patches climbed not a second too soon. From his position of safety, he smiled cheerfully at the dean. He came around all right, didn't he? The dean, full rounded front and thick shoulders shook with laughter, while Senior Bull dared the man on the gate to come on down. You crazy fool, said the dean admiringly when he could speak. Don't you know any better than to go in there on foot? But you said you wanted him, returned the chagrin patches. What I wanted, chuckled the dean, was to see if you had nerve enough to tackle him. Well, to tell you the truth, returned Patches with a happy grin, that's exactly what interested me as well. But while the work assigned to Patches during those first few days of his stay on the cross triangle was chiefly those odd jobs which called for no or little experience, his higher education was by no means neglected. A wise and gentle old cow horse was assigned to him and the dean taught him the various parts of his equipment their proper use and how to take care of them and every day sometimes in the morning sometimes late in the afternoon the master found some errand or business that would necessitate his pupil riding with him when phil and miss baldwin would inquire about the dean's kindergarten as they called it the dean would laugh at them but always he would say stoutly just you wait He'll be near as ready for the rodeo this fall as them pupils in that kindergarten of Phil's. He takes to riding like the good Lord made him specially for that particular job. He's a natural born horseman, and if he ain't, I don't know men. He's got the sense, and he's got the nerve, and he's got the disposition. He's gonna make a top hand in a few months if... He always added with twinkling eyes... If you don't get himself killed trying some fool experiment with himself. I happen to notice that he always has plenty of help in his experimenting. Miss Baldwin would return dryly, which saying indicated not only the dean but Phil and every man on the cross triangle, including little, little Billy. Then came that day when Patches was given a task that the dean assured him is one of the duties of even the oldest and best qualified cowboys. P. 
Patches was assigned to the work of fence riding. But when the dean rode out with his pupil early that morning to where the drift fence begins at the corner of the big pasture and explained that riding a fence meant in ranch language looking for breaks and repairing any such that was found, he did not explain the particulars of that kind of fence. I told him to be sure and be back by night. He chuckled as he explained Patch's absence at dinner to the other members of the household. That's downright mean of you, Will Baldwin, chided Stella with her usual motherly interest in the comfort of her boys. You know the poor fellow would lose himself sure and out there in those wild Tally Holt mountain country. The boys laughed. Oh, we'll find him in the morning, all right, mother, reassured Phil. He can follow the fence back, can't he? retorted the dean. Or, as far as that goes, old Snip, he'll bring him back home. If he knows enough to figure it out, or let Snip have his head, added Curly. At any rate, the dean maintained, he'll learn something about the country, and he'll learn something about fences, and maybe he'll learn something about horses. And we'll see whether he can use his own head or not. There's nothing like giving a man a chance to figure things out for himself sometimes. Besides, think what a chance he'll have for some of his experiments. I'll bet a yearling steer that when we do see him again, he'll be tickled to death at himself and wondering how he had the nerve to do her. To do what? asked Miss Baldwin. I don't know what, chuckled the dean, but he's... He's bound to do some fool thing or another just to see if he can, and it'll be something that nobody but him would ever think of doing, too. However, Honorable Patches did not get lost that day. That is, not too badly lost. There was a time, though, but that did not belong just here. Patches was very well pleased with the task assigned to him that morning. For the first time, he found himself trusted alone with a horse, on a mission that would keep him in the full day in the saddle, and would take him out of sight of the ranch house. Very bravely he set out, equipped with his cowboy outfit, well, except the Rietta, which the dean, fearing for experiments, had at the last moment thoughtfully burrowed it, and armed with a fencing tool and staples. He was armed, too, with a brand new six-gun in a spick-and-span holster on a shiny belt of bright cartridges. The dean had insisted on this, alleging that the embryo cowboy might want it to kill a sick cow or something. Patches wondered if he would know a sick cow if he should meet one, or how he was to diagnose the case of any certainty if she was sick enough to kill. The first thing he did when the dean was safely out of sight was dismount and examine his saddle girth. Always your real king of the cattle range is careful for the foundation of his throne. But there was no awkwardness now when he again swung to his saddle. The young man was in reality a natural athlete. His work had already taken the soreness and stiffness out of his unaccustomed muscles, and he seemed, as the dean had said, a born horseman. As he rode, he looked over the surrounding country with the expression of independence, freedom, fearlessness, every very bit different from the manner of the troubled man who had faced Phil Acton that night on the Divide. It was as though the spirit of the land was already working its magic within the man. He patted the holster on his side and felt the handle of the gun, lovingly fingered the bright cartridges in his shiny belt, leaned sideways to look admiringly down at his fringed leather chaps and spur-ornamented boot heels, and wished for his rietta, not forgetting, meanwhile, to scan the fence for places that might need his attention. The guardian angel who cares for the tenderfoot was good to Patches that day, and favored him with many a sagging wire and leaning or broken posts, so that he could not ride too far. Being painstaking and conscientious of his work, he made not more than four miles by the beginning of the afternoon. Then he found a break that would occupy him for two hours at least. With rolful eyes he surveyed the long stretch of dilapidated fence. It was time, he reflected, 
that the dean sent someone to look after his property, and dismounted, he went to work, forgetting in his interest in the fencing problem now to ensure that his horse was nearby attendance. Now the best of cow horses are not above taking adventures and advantages of their opportunities. Perhaps Snip felt that the fence riding was with a tenderfoot was a little beneath the dignity of his cow punching years. Perhaps he reasoned that this man who always was doing such strange things was purposely dismissing him. Perhaps he was thinking of the long watery haw trough, the rich meadow grass that was back at home. Or perhaps, again, the wise old Snip, feeling the responsibility of his part in training the dean's pupil, merely thought to give his inexperienced master a lesson. However it happened, Patches looked up from his work some time later to find that he was quite alone. In consternation, he st stood looking about, striving to catch a glimpse of the vanished Snip. Save a lone buzzard that wheeled in curious circles above his head, there was no living creature in sight. As fast as his heavy leather chaps and high-heeled boots would permit, he ran to the top of a knoll a hundred yards away. The wider range of country that came within the circle of his vision was as empty as it was silent. The buzzard wheeled nearby. The strange-looking creature beneath it seemed so helpless that there might be the situation that something of a vital interest to the tribe. Even buzzards must know about their business. There are few things more humiliating to a professional rider of the range than to be left afoot, and while Patches was far too much a novice to have acquired that particular and traditional tastes and habits of the clan of which he had that morning felt himself a member, he was, in this, the equal of the best of them. He thought of himself walking shamefaced into the presence of the dean and reporting the loss of the horse. The animal might be recovered, he supposed, for he was still, Patches thought, inside the pasture which that fence enclosed. Still, there was a chance that the runaway would escape through some break and never be found. In any case, the vision of the grinning cowboys was not an attractive one. But at least, thought the amateur cowboy, he could finish the work that was entrusted to him. He might lose a horse for the dean, but the dean's fence should be repaired. So he set to work with a will, and finished that particular break, and set out on foot to follow the fence around that field, and so back to the lane that would lead him to the buildings and corrals of the home ranch. For an hour he trudged along, making hard work of it, and his chaps, boots, and spurs stopping now and then to drive a staple or brace a post. The country was growing wilder and more broken, with cedar timber on the ridges and here and there a pine. Occasionally, he would catch a glimpse of the black, forbidden walls of Tally Holt Mountain. But Patches did not know it was Tally Holt. He only thought that he knew in which direction the home ranch lay. It seemed to him that it was a long, long way to the corner of that field. It must be a big pasture indeed. The afternoon was well on when he paused on the summit of another ridge for a rest. It seemed to him that he had never in all of his life been quite so warm. His legs was aching, he was tired and thirsty and hungry. He was so still that the silence hurt, and that corner fence was nowhere in sight. He could not, now, reach home before dark, even if he should turn back, which he decided grimly he would not do. He would ride that fence if he camped there three nights on the journey. Suddenly he sprang to his feet, waved his hat, and hallowed and yelled like a wildman. Two horsemen were riding up the other side of the fence, along the slope on the next ridge at the edge of the timber. In vain, Patches strove to attract their attention. If they heard him, they gave him no sign, and presently he saw them turn ride into the cedars, and disappear. In desperation, he ran along the fence, down the hill and across the little valley and up the ridge on the other side where the riders had gone. On the top of the ridge, he stopped again to suspend the last of his breath and another series of wild shouts, but there was no answer, nor could he be sure even which way the horseman had gone. Dropping down in the shade of a cedar, 
exhausted by his strenuous exertion and wet with honest perspiration, he struggled for breath and fanned his hot face with his hat. Perhaps he even used some of the cowboy words that he'd heard Curly and Bill employ when little Billy wasn't around. After the noise of his frantic efforts, the silence was more oppressive than ever. The Cross Triangle Ranch House was somewhere endless miles away. Then, a faint sound in the narrow valley below him caught his ear. Turning quickly, he looked back the way he'd come. Was he dreaming, or was it all just a part of the magic of this wonderful land? A young woman was riding towards him, coming at an easy swinging lope, and following at the end of a rietta was a cheerfully wise and philosophical snip. Patch's first thought, when he sufficiently recovered from his amazement to think at all, was that the woman rode as though he had never seen a woman ride before. Dressed in divided skirt of corduroy, the loose, soft gray shirt, gauntlet gloves, mannish felt hat and boots usual to the Arizona horsewoman, she seemed so much at ease in the saddle as any cowboy in the land, and indeed she was. As she came up the slope, the man in the shade of the cedar saw that she was young. Her live, beautifully developed body yielded to the movement of the spirited horse she rode with the unspoiled grace of health and youth. Still nearer, he saw her clear cheeks glowing with the exertion and excitement, her soft brown hair under the wide brim of the gray sombrero and her dark eyes shining with the fun of her adventure. Then she saw him and smiled. And Patch has remembered what the dean had said. If there's a man in Yakpai County who wouldn't ride the hooves off the best horse in his outfit to win the smile from Kitty Reed, he ought to be hung. As the man stood, hat in hand, she checked her horse. And in a voice that matched the smile so full of fun and clean joy of living, greeted him. You must be Mr. Honorable Patches, are you not? Patches bowed. Ms. Reed, I believe. She frankly looked to her surprise. Why, how do you know about me? Your good friend, Mr. Baldwin, described you. He smiled. She colored and laughed to hide her slight embarrassment. Oh, the dear old Dean is prejudiced, I fear. Well, prejudice he may be. Patch is admitted, but his judgment is unquestionable, and he added gently as her face grew grave and her chin lifted slightly. His confidence in any man might be considered an endorsement, don't you think? Indeed, yes, she agreed heartily, her slightest coldness vanishing instantly. The Dean and Stella told me all about you this afternoon, and, or I should not have adventured to introduce myself. I'm very pleased to meet you, Mr. Patches, she finished with a mocking formality that was delightful. And I'm delighted to meet you as well, Miss Reed, for so many reasons that I can't begin to tell you of, he responded laughingly. And now, may I ask what good magic brings you like a fairy in the storybook to the rescue of a poor stranger in his hour of despair? Where did you find my faithless snip? And how'd you know where to find me? Where's the Cross Triangle Ranch, and how many miles is it to the nearest water? Is it possible for me to get home in time for supper? Looking down at him, she laughed as only Kitty Reed could laugh. You're making fun of me, he charged. Oh, they all do. And I don't blame them in the least. I've been laughing at myself all day. I'll answer your last question first, she returned. Yes, you can easily reach the cross triangle in time for supper, if you start at once. I will explain the magic as we ride. You're going to show me the way? He cried eagerly, starting towards his horse. I really think it would be best, she said. Now I know you're a good fairy or a guardian angel or something of that kind. He returned, setting his foot in the stirrup to mount. Then, suddenly he paused with, Wait a minute, please, I nearly forgot. And very carefully, he examined the saddle girth to see if it was tight. 
If you had remembered to throw your bridle reins over Snip's head when you left him, you wouldn't have needed a guardian angel this time, she said. He looked at her blankly over the patient Snip's back. And so that's what made him go away? I knew I had done something silly that I ought not to have. That's the only thing about myself that I was always perfectly sure of, he said as he mounted. You see, I can always depend upon myself making a fool. It was that bad place in the fence that did it. He pulled up his horse suddenly as they were starting. And that reminds me. There's one thing you positively must tell me before I go afoot, even towards supper. How much further is it to the corner of this field? She looked at him in pretty amazement. To the corner of this field? Yeah, I know, of course, that if I follow the fence, it's bound to lead me around the field and so back to where I started. That's why I kept on. I figured I could finish the job and get home, even if Snip did can tell me to ride the fence on foot. But you don't know that this is a drift fence? She asked, her eyes dancing with fun. Well, that's what the dean called it, he admitted, but it's drifting anywhere. It goes on end. Perhaps that's why I couldn't reach a corner. There's no corner to a drift fence, she cried. No corner? She shook her head as if not trusting herself to speak. And it doesn't go around anything? Is there no field? Again, she shook her head. It just runs away out in the country somewhere and then stops? She nodded. It must be 18 to 20 miles from here to the end. Well, of all the silly fences, he exclaimed, looking away to the mountain peaks towards where he'd been laboriously making his way. Honestly, now, do you think that's any respectable way for a fence to act? And the dean told me to be sure and get back before dark. Then they laughed together, laughed until their horses must have had a bit of a wonder on. As they rode on, she explained the purpose of the drift fence, and how it came to an end so many miles away, so far from water that the cattle do not usually find their way around it. And, and now the magic, he said. You have made a most unreasonable, unconventional, and altogether foolish fence appear reasonable, proper, and perfectly sane. Now, please explain your coming with Snip to my relief. Which was also unreasonable, unconventional, and altogether foolish? She questioned. Which was altogether wonderful, unexpected, and delightful? He retorted. It's all perfectly simple, she explained. Being rather, she hesitated, well, rather sick of too much nothing at all, you know. I went over to the Cross Triangle right after dinner to visit a little with Stella. Professionally. Professionally? Yes. She nodded brightly. Yeah, for the good of my soul. Stella's a famous soul doctor. Best one ever, except maybe she lives far, far away, back over in Cleveland, Ohio. Yes, I know her too, he said gravely. And while they laughed at the absurdity of his assertion, they did not know until long afterwards how literally true it was. Of course, I knew about you, she continued. Phil told me how you tried to ride that unbroken horse the last time he was at her house. Phil thinks you're quite a wonderful man. <laughs> no doubt, said Patches mockingly. I must have given a rather remarkable exhibition on that occasion. He was wondering just how much Phil had told her. And so you see, she continued... I couldn't very well help being interested in the welfare of the stranger who had come among us. Besides, our traditional Western hospitalities demand it, wouldn't you think? Oh, certainly, certainly. You could really do nothing less than acquire about me, he agreed politely. And so, you see, Stella sort of restored my soul's health, at least afforded me temporarily relief. He met the quizzing teasing and laughing look in her eyes blankly. You're making fun of me again, he said humbly. I know I ought to laugh at myself, but... Why, don't you understand? She cried. Dr. Stella administered a 
Jenner's dose of talk about the only new thing that's happened in this neighborhood for months and months and months. Meaning me? Well, are you not? Well, I guess I am. What about it? Well, I came away feeling much better, of course. Yeah? I was feeling so much better that I decided I should go home a roundabout way, and perhaps to the top of Black Hill, perhaps up Horse Wash, and where I might meet Father, who might be on his way home from Fair Oaks, where he went this morning. I see. Well, and so I met Snip, who was on his way to the Cross Triangle. I knew, of course, that old Snip would be your horse. She smiled as though to rob her words of any criticism of his horsemanship. Exactly, he agreed understandingly. And I was afraid that something might have happened, though I couldn't see how that could be either with Snip, so I caught him up. He interrupted eagerly. How? Why, with my rope, she returned with a matter-of-fact tone, wondering at his question. You caught my horse with your rope? He repeated slowly. And pray how should I have caught him? She asked. But didn't he run? She laughed. Of course he ran. They all do that once they get away from you, but Snip couldn't outrun Midnight, she retorted. He shook his head slowly, looked at her with frank adm admiration, as though for the first time he understood what a rare and wonderful creature she was. And you can ride and rope like that, he said doubtfully. She flushed hotly, and there was a spark of fire in her brown eyes. I suppose you are thinking that I am coarse and mannish and all that, she said with spirit. By your standards, Mr. Patches, I should have ridden back to the house screaming ladylike for help. Oh, no, no, he protested. That's not fair. I wasn't. I was thinking how wonderful you are. Why, well, I would give what I wouldn't give to be able to do a thing like that. There was no mistaking his earnestness. And Kitty was all sunshine again, partnering him with a smile. You see, she explained, I've always lived here except for those three years at school. Father taught me to use a rope as he taught me to ride and shoot because, well, it's all just part of life and it's very useful. Just as it's useful to know about hotels and times tables and taxi cabs in other parts of the world. I understand, he said gently. It was stupid of me to notice it. I, I beg your, your pardon for interrupting the story of my rescue. You had just roped Snip when he was doing his best to outrun midnight. Simple and easy as it's calling a taxi. Number 2000 Helsid Avenue, please. And there you are. Oh, do you know Cleveland? She cried. For an instant he was confused, and then he said easily, well, everyone's heard of famous Elsid Avenue. But how did you guess where Snip had left me? Why, Stella had told me you were riding the drift fence, she answered tactfully, ignoring the evasion of his question. I just followed the question. So there's no magic to it about it at all, you see. Well, I'm not so sure about the magic, he returned slowly. This is wonderful country, to me that one can never be quite sure about anything. At least I can't. Perhaps that's because I'm such a new thing. Do you like it? She asked, frankly curious about him. Like being a new thing? He purred. Yes and no. I mean, do you like this wonderful country, as you call it? I admire the people who belong to it tremendously. I've never met such men before, or such women. He finished with a smile. But do you like it? She persisted. Do you like the life, your work? Would you be satisfied to live here always? Yes and no, he answered again, hesitating. Oh, well, she said, with, he thought, a little bitterness and rebellion. It doesn't really matter to you whether you like it or not, because you're a man. If you're not satisfied with your environment, you can just leave and go away somewhere else and make yourself a part of some other life. He shook his head, wondering a little at her earnestness. That doesn't always follow. Can a man, just because he's a man, 
always have or do just what he likes? If he's strong enough, she insisted, but a woman must always do what other folks like. He was sure now that she was speaking rebelliously. She continued on. Can't you, if you're not satisfied with this life, go away? Yes, but not necessarily to any life I might desire. Perhaps some sheriff wants me. Perhaps I'm an escaped convict. Perhaps, oh, a thousand things. She laughed again, in spite of her serious mood. What nonsense! But why nonsense? What do you and your friends know about me? We know that you're not that kind of a man, she retorted warmly because, she hesitated, well, because you're not that sort of a man. Are you sure you don't mean because I'm not man enough to make myself wanted very badly even by the sheriff? He asked, and Kitty could not mistake the bitterness in his voice. Why, Mr. Patches, how could you think such a thing? Forgive me, I... I was only wondering foolishly what you, a man of education and culture, could find in this rough life that would appeal to you in any way. My curiosity is unpardonable, I suppose, but you must know that we're all wondering why you're here. I, I don't blame you, he returned with that self-mocking smile as always laughing at himself. I told you I could always depend upon making a fool of myself, and you see, I'm doing it now. I don't mind telling you this much, that I'm here for the same reason that you went to miss it, Miss Baldwin this afternoon. For the good of your soul? She asked gently. Exactly, he returned gravely. For the good of my soul. Well then, Mr. Honorable Patches, here's to your soul's good health, she cried brightly, checking her horse and holding out her hand. We part here. You can see the cross triangle buildings over yonder. I go this way. He looked his pleasures as he grasped her hand in a hearty understanding of the friendship offered. Thank you, Ms. Reed. I still maintain the dean's judgments unquestionable. She was not at all displeased with his reply. By the way, she said as if to prove her friendship, I suppose you know what to expect from Uncle Will and the boys when they learn about your little adventure. I do, he answered as if resigned anything. And do you enjoy making fun for them? I assure you, Miss Reed, I'm very human. Well then, why don't you turn the laugh on them? But how? They're expecting you to get into some sort of a scrap, don't you think? Well, they're always expecting that, and he added with the droll touch in his voice, I must say, I rarely disappoint them. I suspect, she continued thoughtfully, that the dean purposely did not explain that drift fence to you. He has established precedents that might justify my thinking so, I'll admit. Well then, why don't you just ride cheerfully home and report the progress of your work as though as nothing had happened? You mean you wouldn't tell? he cried. She nodded gaily. I told them this afternoon that it wasn't fair for you to have no one but Stella on your side. Well, what a good Samaritan you are. You put me under your everlasting obligation, though. All right, she laughed. I'm glad you feel that way about it. I shall hold that debt against you until some day when I'm in dreadful need, and then I shall demand payment in full. Goodbye. Once again, Kitty had spoken in jest, Words it held for them both, had they known a great significance. Patches watched until she was out of sight. Then he made his way happily to the house to receive, with a guilty conscience but a light heart, congratulations and compliments upon his safe return. That evening, Phil disappeared somewhere in the twilight, and a little later, Jim Reed rode to the cross-triangle doorway. The owner of the pothook guest was a big man, tall and heavy, outspoken, somewhat gruff, with a manner that to strangers often seeming that of overbearing. When Patches was introduced, the big cowman looked him over suspiciously, spoke a short word in response to Patches' commonplace, 
and abruptly turned his back to converse with the better-known members of the household. For an hour, perhaps, they chatted about manners of general instruments and neighbor's will. Then the caller rose to go and the dean walked him to his horse. When the two men were out of hearing of the people on the porch, Rita asked in a low voice, You not a sunny stock that don't look right lately, Will? No. You see, we haven't been, we haven't been riding scarcely any since the 4th. Phil and the boys have been busy with the horses every day, and this new man, he doesn't count, you know. Who is he anyway? asked Reed bluntly. I don't know any more about him other than he says his name is Patches. That's a funny name, grunted Jim. Yeah, but there's lots of funny names, Jim, the dean answered quietly. I don't know as Patches is any funnier than Skinner, Foot, or Hog, or hundreds of others' names when you come to think about it. We ain't just never happened to hear it before, that's all. Where'd you pick him up? He come along and wanted work. He's as green as they make him, but willing, and he's got good sense, too. Well, I'd go slow about taking strangers in, said the big man bluntly. Shucks, retorted the dean. Some of the best men I ever had were strangers when I hired them. Being a stranger ain't nothing against a man. You and me would be strangers if we was to go many miles from Williamson Valley. Patches is a good man, I tell you. I'll stand for him all right. Why, he's been out all day alone, riding the drift fence just as good as any old-timer. The drift fence? Yeah, it's in pretty poor shape in places. Yeah, and I ran into a calf over on horse wash this afternoon, not 400 yards from the fence on the Tally Holt side, fresh branded with the Tally Holt iron, and I'll bet a thousand dollars it belonged to a cross-triangle cow. What makes you think it was mine? asked the dean calmly. Well, it looked mighty like your Hereford stock, and because I came in through the horse wash gate, and about half a mile on this side, I found one of your cows that had just lost your calf. They know we're busy and ain't riding much, I reckon, mused the dean. If I was you, I'd put some hand that knew to ride in that there drift fence returned Jim significantly as he mounted his horse. You're plumb wrong, Jim, returned the dean earnestly. Why, the man don't know a cross triangle from a five bar or a pot hook S. Well, that's your business, Will. I just thought I'd tell you. Good night, growled Reed. Good night, Jim. I'm much obliged for your riding over. End of chapter six. Chapter 7 Then Kitty Reed told Patches that it was her soul sickness from too much of nothing at all that had sent her to visit Miss Baldwin that afternoon. She had spoken more in earnest than in jest. More than this, she had gone to the cross triangle hoping to meet the stranger of whom she had heard so much. Phil had told Kitty that she would like Patches, and as Phil had put it, the man spoke her language. He could talk to her of people and books and those things of which Williamson Valley folks knew so little. But as she rode slowly homeward after leaving Patches, she found herself of two minds regarding the incident. She had enjoyed meeting the man he was interested and amusing to her, had taken her out of herself, for she was not the slow to recognize that the man really did belong to that world that was so far away from the world of her childhood. And she was glad for the little adventure that, for one afternoon at least, had broken the dull, weary monotony of her daily life. But the stranger, by the very fact of his belonging to that other world, had stimulated her desire for those things which in her home life and environment she so greatly missed. He had somehow seemed to magnify the almost unbearing commonplace narrowness of her daily routine. He had made her even more restless, disturbed, and dissatisfied. 
It had been to her as one of those foreign countries meets a citizen from one's of old hometown. And for this, Kitty was genuinely sorry. She did not wish to feel as she did about her home and the things that made the world of those she loved. She had tried honestly to still the unrest and to deny the longing. She had wished many times since her return from the East that she had never left her home for those three years in school. And yet, those years had meant much to her. They had been wonderful years. But they seemed somehow, now that they were past and she was home again, to have brought her only unrest and longing. From the beginning of her years until the first great crisis in her life, she was going away to school. This world into which she was born had been to Kitty an all-sufficient world. The days of her childhood had been carefree and joyous almost, as the days of the young things of her father's roaming herds. As her girlhood years advanced, under her mother's wise companionship and careful teaching, she had grown into her share of the household duties and into a knowledge of a woman's part in life to which she belonged, as naturally as her girlish form had put on the graces of a young woman. The things that filled the days of her father and mother and the days of her neighbors and friends had filled her days as well. The things that were all in all to those she loved had been all in all to her. And always, through those years from her earliest childhood to her young womanhood, there had been Phil, her playmate, schoolmate, protector, hero, slave, that Phil had been her boy sweetheart and young man lover had seemed as natural to Kitty as her relations to her parents. There had never been anyone else but Phil. There never could be, she was sure, in those days, anyone else. In Kitty's heart that afternoon as she rode, so indifferent to the life that called from every bush and tree and grassy hill and distant mountain, there was a sweet regret, deep and sincere, for those years that were now, to her, irrevocably gone. Kitty did not know how impossible it was for her to ever wholly escape the things that belonged to her childhood and youth. Those things of her girlhood, out of which her heart and soul had been fashioned, were as interwoven in the fabric of her being as the vitality, strength, and purity of the clean, wholesome outdoor life of those same years were wrought into the glowing health and vigor and beauty of her physical woman. And then had come those other years, the maturing and ripening years when, from the simple, primitive, and during elements of life, she had gone to live amid complex and cultivated and largely fanciful standards and values. In that land of Kitty's birth, a man was measured by the measure of his manhood. A woman is ranked by the quality of her womanhood. Strength and courage, sincerity, honesty, and usefulness. These were prime essentials of the man's life that Kitty had. In those years of her girlhood, known, and these two, in their feminine expressions, were the essentials of the woman's life. But from these, the w young woman had gone to the educated in a world where other things were first importance. She had gone to be taught that these were not the essential elements of womanhood or manhood. Or, at least, if she was not to be deliberately so taught, these things would be so ignored and neglected and overlooked in her training that the effect of her character would be the same. In that new world, she was to learn that men and women are not to be measured by the standards of womanhood or manhood. That they were to be rated, not for strength, but by culture. Not for courage, but intellectual cleverness. And not for sincerity, but for manners. Not for honesty, but for success. And not for usefulness, but social position, which is most often determined by the degree of uselessness. It was as though the handler of gems were to attract no value whatever to the weight of the diamond itself, but to fix the world of the stone wholly by the cutting and polishing that the crystal might receive. At first, Kitty had been excited, bewildered and fascinated by the glittering and sparkling and ever-changing many-faceted life. And then she grew weary and homesick, 
And then as the months passed, she had been drawn more and more by association and environment into the world of down to datism. She too began to regard the sparkle of the diamond as the determining factor in the value of the gem. And when the young woman had achieved this, they called her educated finished and sent her back to the land over which Granite Mountain, gray, grim, and fortress-like, with its ranks of sentinel hills, kept enduring and an unchanging watch. During those first glad days of Kitty's homecoming, she had been eagerly interested in everything. The trivial bits of news about the small doings of her old friends had been delightful. The home life, with its simple routine and sweet companionship, had been restful and satisfying. The very scenes of her girlhood had seemed to welcome her with a spirit of genuineness and steadfastness that had made her feel as one entering a safe home harbor after a long adventurous voyage to a far away and little known land. And Phil, in the virile strength of his manhood, in the simple bigness of his character, in his enduring and unchanging love, had made her feel his likeness to the primitive land of his birth. But when the glad excitement of those first days of her return were past, when the meetings with old friends were over, and the tales of their doings were exhausted, then Kitty began to realize what her education, as they called it, really meant. The lessons of those three years were not to be erased from her life as one would erase a mistake in a problem or a misspelled word. The tastes, habits of thought, and standards of life, the acquirement of which constituted her culture, would not be denied. It was inevitable that there should be a clash between the claims of her home life and the claims of that life to which she now felt that she also belonged. However, odious comparisons may be, they are, are many times inevitable. Loyalty, Kitty tried to magnify the worth of those things that in her girlhood had been the supreme things in her life, but try as she might, they were now, in comparison with those things which her culture placed first, of trivial importance. The virile strength and glowing health of Phil's unspoiled manhood, beautiful in the rigorous life of one of the wild horses from which he had been nicknamed, was overshadowed now by the young man's inability to clothe his splendid body in that fashion which her culture demanded. His simple and primitive views of life, as natural as the instincts which governs all creatures in his God-cultivated world, were now unrefined and noble and inelegant. His fine nature and unembarrassed intelligence, which found in the wealth of realities amid which he lived abundant food for his intellectual life, and which enabled him to see clearly, observe closely, and think with such clear-cut directness, beside the intellectuality of those schooled in the thoughts of others, appeared as ignorant and illiterate. The very fineness and gentleness of his nature were now the distinguishing marks of an uncouth and awkward rustic. With all her woman heart, Kitty had fought against those comparisons and continued to make them. Everything in her nature that belonged to Granite Mountain, that was, in short, the product of that land, answered to Phil's call, as instinctively as the life that land calls and answers its mating calls. Everything that she had acquired in those three years of more advanced civilization denied and repulsed them. And now her meeting with Patches had stirred the warring forces to renewed activity and, in the di directing turmoil of her thoughts, she found herself hating the land she loved, loathing the life that appealed to her with such instinctive power, despising those who she so clearly esteemed and honored, and denying the affection of which she was proud with a true woman's tender pride. Kitty was aroused from her absorption by the thrill boyish yells of her two younger brothers, who, catching sight of their sister from the top of one of the low hills that edged the meadow bottom lands, were charging recklessly down upon her. All the clatter and rumble of those eight flying hooves drew closer and closer. Midnight, too, 
came alive, as the cowboys say, and tossed his head and pranced with eager impatience. "'Where in the world you been around all afternoon?' demanded Jimmy, with his twelve-year-old authority, as his pony skidded to a halt within a foot or two of his sister's horse. "'And we wanted you to go with us to see our coyote traps,' reproved Connie, who was two years younger than his brother, as his pinto executed a like manner on the other side of the excited midnight. "'And where's Jack?' asked the young woman, mischievously as she smiled, welcoming the vic vigorous lads. "'Couldn't he help?' Jack was the other member of the Reed trio of boys, a lusty four-year-old who felt himself equal to any venture that intrigued his brothers. Jimmy grinned. Aw, Mum coaxed him into the kitchen with something to eat while me and Connie sneaked down to the corral and saddled up and beat it. Big Sister's dark eyebrows arched in shocked inquiry. Me and Connie? That's Connie and I, amended Jimmy, with good-natured tolerance of his sister's whims. You see, Kitty, put in Connie, this here coyote trapping ain't just fun, it's business. Dad promised us three dollars for every scalp, and we're aiming to make us a steak. Although we didn't get a blasted thing today. Sister's painful and despairing expression was blissfully ignored as Jimmy stealthily flicked the long rumple at the end of his bridle reins against Midnight's flank. Gee! observed the tickled youngster as Kitty gave all her attention to restraining the threatened and indignated horse. Old Midnight is a little feisty, ain't he? I'll race you both to the big gate, challenged Kitty. For how much? demanded Jimmy quickly. You gotta give us a fifty yards head start, though, declared Connie, leaning forward in the saddle and shortening his range. If I win, you boys go straight to bed tonight when it's time without no fussing. And I'll give you that oak brush over there yonder as a head start, gave Kitty. Good enough, you're on. They shouted in chorus and loped away. As they passed the handicap mark, another shrill, defiant yell came floating back to where Kitty was sitting, raining on her impatient midnight. At the signal, the two ponies leapt from a lope into a full run, while Kitty loosened the restraining reins and a black horse stretched away in pursuit. Spurring, shouting, and treating, the two lads urged their sturdy mounts towards the goal, and the pinto answered gamely with all they had. Over knoll and washes, across canyon and gully they flew, sure-footed and eager, neck and neck well behind them, drawing closer and closer, came the black, with body low, head outstretched, and limbs that moved apparently with the timed regularity and driving power of a locomotive piston rod. As she passed them, Kitty shouted out, Come on! When they answered with redoubled exertion and another yell of hearty, boyish admiration for the victorious Midnight and his beautiful rider. Doggone that black streak! exclaimed Jimmy, his eyes dancing with fun as they pulled up at the corral gate. He opens and shuts like a blamed old jackrabbit, commanded Connie. Seems like we was just sitting still watching you go by. Kitty laughed, tensely unconsciously slipping into the vernacular as she returned. Did you kids think you were a horseback? Oh, you just wait, miss, retorted the grinning Jimmy. As he opened the big gate, I'll get a horse someday that'll ride circles around that old black scoundrel. And then, as they dismounted at the door of the saddle room at the big barn, he added generously, You scoot on into the house, Kitty. I'll take care of midnight. It must be getting close to supper time, and I'm hungry enough to eat a raw dog. At which alarming statement, Kitty promptly scooted, stopped only long enough at the windmill pump for a cool, refreshing drink. Miss Reed, with sturdy little Jack helping, was already busy in the kitchen. She was a motherly woman, rather below Kitty's height and inclined somewhat to a comfortable stoutness. 
In her face was the gentle strength and patience of those whose years had been spent in homemaking, without the hardness that sometimes is seen in the faces of those whose love is not great enough to soften their toil. One knew by the light in her eyes whenever she spoke to Kitty, or, indeed, whenever the girl's name was mentioned, how large a place her only daughter held in her mother's heart. While the two worked together at their homely task, the girl related in trivial detail the news of the neighborhood and repeated faithfully the talk she had had with the mistress of Cross Triangle answering all her mother's questions, replying with careful interest to the older woman's comments, relating all that was known or guessed and observing regarding the stranger. But of her meeting with Patches, Kitty said little only that she had met him as she was coming home. All during the evening meal, too, Patches was the principal topic of conversation, though Mr. Reed, who had arrived home just in time for supper, had said little about. When supper was over, the evening work was finished. Kitty sat on the porch in the twilight, looking away across the wide valley meadows toward the light that shone where the walnut trees about the Cross Triangle Ranch House made a darker mass in the gathering gloom. Her father had gone to call upon the Dean. The men were at the bunkhouse, from which their ho voices came low and indistinct. Within the house, the mother was coaxing little Jack to bed. Jimmy and Connie, on the farthest end of the porch, were planning an extensive campaign against coyotes and investing the unearned profits of their proposed industry. Kitty's thoughts were many miles away. In that bright, stirring life, so far from the gloomy stillness of her homeland, where she sat so alone, what gay pleasures held her friends? Amid what brilliant scenes were they spending the evening, while she sat in her dark and silent world alone? As her memories painted the pictures, the stirring movements, the music, the merry voice talk, the laughter, the gaiety, the excitement, the companionship of those whose life was so full of interest, her heart rebelled at the dull emptiness of her days. As she watched the gathering evening that was deepening as the darkness of night came on, and the outlines of the familiar landscape faded and vanished in the thickening gloom, she felt the dreary monotony of the days and years that were to come, blotting out her life all tone and color and forms of brightness and beauty. Then she saw, slowly emerging from the shadows of the meadow below, a darker shadow, mysterious and formless, that seemed as if approaching to shape itself out of the very darkness through which it came, until, still dim and indistinct, a horseman was opening the meadow gate. Before the cowboy answered Jimmy's boyish hello, Kitty knew that it was Phil. The young woman's first impulse was to retreat into the safe seclusion of her own room. But even as she arose to her feet, she knew how that would hurt the man who had always been so good to her. And so, she went generously down the walk to meet him, where he had dismounted and would leave his horse. "'Did you see father?' she asked, thinking as she spoke how little there was for them to talk about. "'Why, no. What's the matter?' He returned quickly, as if ready to ride again at her word. She laughed a little at his manner. Oh, there's nothing the matter. He he just went over to see the dean, that's all. I must have missed him crossing the meadow, he returned. He always goes around by the road, I suppose. And then when he stood beside her, he added gently, But there is something the matter, Kitty. What is it? Are you lonesome for the bright lights? That was always Phil's way, she thought. He seemed to always know instinctively her every mood and wish. Perhaps I'm a little lonely, she admitted. I'm glad you came. Then they were at the porch, and her ambitious brothers were telling Phil in detail their all-absorbed designs against the peace of the coyote tribe and asking his advice. 
Ms. Reed came to sit with them a while, and again the talk followed around the narrow circle of their lives until Kitty felt she could bear no more. Then Ms. Reed, more merciful than she knew, sent the boys to bed and then retired to her own room. And so you're tired of us all. Want to go back, mused Phil, breaking one of the long silent periods that in those days seemed so often to fall upon them when they found themselves alone. That's, that's not quite fair, Phil, she returned gently. You know it's not that. Well, then I guess I'm tired of this. His gesture had indicated the sweep of the wide land. Tired of what we are and what we do? The girl stirred uneasily but didn't speak. I don't blame you, he continued as if speaking aloud. It must have been pretty empty to those who really don't know. And don't I know it? challenged Kitty. You seem to forget that I was born here, that I lived here almost as many years as you. But just the same, you don't know, returned Phil gently. You see, dear, you knew it as a girl, the same as I did when I was a boy. And now, well, I know it as a man, and you as a woman know something that you think is very different. Again the long silence lay a barrier between them, and then Kitty made the effort, hesitatingly. Do you love the life so very, very much, Phil? He answered quickly. Yes, but I could love any life that suits you. No, no, she returned hurriedly. That's not... I mean, Phil, why are you satisfied here? It seems like there's so little for a man such as you. So little? His voice told her that her words had stung. I told you that you don't know. Why... Everything that a man has a right to want is right here. All that life can give anywhere is here. I mean, all of life that's worth having. But I suppose that it's hard for you to see it that way now. It's like trying to make a city man understand why a fellow's never lonesome when just because there's no crowd around. I guess I love this life and... I'm satisfied with it, just as the wild horses over there at the foot of old granite love it and are satisfied. Don't you feel sometimes that if you had greater opportunities, don't you sometimes wish that you could live where... She paused with a loss of words. Phil somehow always made the things she craved seem so trivial. I know what you mean. He answered, You mean, don't the wild horses wish that they could live in a fine stable and have a lot of men to feed and care for them and rig them with fancy gold-mounted harnesses and let them prance down the street for crowds to see? No, horses have more sense than that. It, it takes a human to make that kind of fool of himself. There's only one thing in the world that would make me want to try it, and I guess... You know what that is. His last words robbed his answer of its sting, and she said gently, You're you're bitter tonight, Phil. It's not like you. He didn't answer. Did something go wrong today? She persisted. He turned suddenly to face her and spoke with a passion that was unusual to him. I saw you at the ranch this afternoon. As you were riding away, you, you didn't even turn to look towards the corral where you knew I was at work. And it seemed like all the heart went clear out of me. Kitty, can't we bring back the old days as they were before you went away? Oh, hush, Phil, she said, almost as if she would have spoken to one of her boy brothers, but he went on recklessly. No, I'm going to speak tonight. Ever since you came home, you've refused to listen to me. You've put me off and made me keep still. I want to tell you, Kitty, if I was like Honorable Patches, would it make any difference? 
I don't know, Mr. Patches, she answered. You met him today, and you know what I mean. Would it make any difference if I was more like him? Phil, dear, how can I answer such a question? I, I don't know. Then it's not because I live here in this country instead of back east in some city that's made you change? I have changed, I suppose, because I have become a woman, Phil, just as you've become a man. Yes, I have become a man, but I've not changed except that the boy's love has become a man's love. Would it make any difference, Kitty, if you cared more for the life here? I mean, if you were content here, if these things that mean so much to all of us satisfied you? Again she answered, I don't know, Phil. How could I know? Will you try, Kitty? I mean, try to like your old home as you used to like it? Phil, I have tried, I do. She cried, but I don't think it's the life that I like or do not like that makes the difference. I'm sure, Phil, that if I could... She hesitated, then went on bravely. If I could give you the love you want, nothing else would matter. You said you could like any life that suited me. Don't you think that I could be satisfied with any life that the man I love suited? Yes, you could. And I guess that's the answer. What's the answer? she asked. Love. Just love, Kitty. Any place with love is a good place, and without love no life can satisfy. I'm glad you said that. It was what I was wanting you to say. I know now what I have to do. I am like Patches. I have found my job. There was no bitterness in his voice now. The girl was deeply moved. But I don't think I quite understand, Phil, she said. Why, don't you see, he returned. My job is to win your love and to make you love me for myself, for just what I am as a man, not try to be something or to live some way that I think you'd like. It's the man that you must love, not what he does or where he lives. Isn't that it? Yes, she answered slowly. I'm sure that is so. It has to be so, Phil. He rose to his feet abruptly. All right, he said roughly. I'll be going now, but don't make any mistake, Kitty. You're mine. Mine by laws that are higher than the things that they teach you at school. And you're going to find it out. I'm going to win you just as the wild things out there win their mates. You're going to come to me, girl, because you're mine and because you're my mate. And then, as she too arose and they stood for a silent moment facing each other, the woman felt his strength and, in her heart, it beat glad. Glad and proud, though she could not give all that he asked. As she watched him ride away into the night, the soft mystery of the darkness out of which he had come seemed to take his shadowy form again to itself, she wondered. Wondered with regret in the thought. Would he perhaps go thus out of her life? Would he? When Phil turned his horse in the meadow pasture, at home the big bay, from somewhere in the darkness, trumpeted his challenge. A low laugh came from nearby, and in the lights of the stars, Phil saw a man standing by the pasture fence. As he went towards the shadowy figure, the voice of Patches followed the laugh. I'll bet that was stranger. I know it was, answered Phil. What's the matter that you're not in bed? I was just listening to the horses out here and thinking, returned Patches. Thinking about your job? asked Phil quietly. Perhaps, admitted the other. Well, you've no reason to worry. You'll ride them all right, said the cowboy. I wish I could be just as sure, the other returned doubtfully. They both knew they were using the big bay horse as a symbol. And I wish I was sure of making good at my job, as I am that you'll win out with yours, returned Phil. 
Patch's voice was very kind as he said reflectively, So, you have a job too. I'm glad for that. Glad? Yes. The tall man placed a hand on the other's shoulders as they turned to walk towards the house. Because, Phil, I have come to the conclusion that this old world is a mighty empty place for the man who has nothing to do. But there seems to be a lot of fellows who manage to keep fairly busy doing nothing just the same, don't you think? replied Phil with a low laugh. I said man, retorted Patches with emphasis. That's right, agreed Phil. A man just naturally requires a man's job. And, mused Patches, when it's all said and done, I suppose there's only one genuine, Simon Pure, full-sized man job in the world. I reckon that's right, too, returned the cowboy. End of chapter 7. Chapter 7 Then Kitty Reed told Patches that it was her soul sickness from too much of nothing at all that had sent her to visit Miss Baldwin that afternoon, she had spoken more in earnest than in jest. More than this, she had gone to the cross triangle hoping to meet the stranger of whom she had heard so much. Phil had told Kitty that she would like Patches, and as Phil had put it, the man spoke her language. He could talk to her of people and books and those things of which Williamson Valley folks knew so little. But as she rode slowly homeward after leaving Patches, she found herself of two minds regarding the incident. She had enjoyed meeting the man he was interested and amusing to her, had taken her out of herself, for she was not the slow to recognize that the man really did belong to that world that was so far away from the world of her childhood. And she was glad for the little adventure that, for one afternoon at least, had broken the dull, weary monotony of her daily life. But the stranger, by the very fact of his belonging to that other world, had stimulated her desire for those things which in her home life and environment she so greatly missed. He had somehow seemed to magnify the almost unbearing commonplace narrowness of her daily routine. He had made her even more restless, disturbed, and dissatisfied. It had been to her as one of those foreign countries meets a citizen from one's of old hometown. And for this, Kitty was genuinely sorry. She did not wish to feel as she did about her home and the things that made the world of those she loved. She had tried honestly to still the unrest and to deny the longing. She had wished many times, since her return from the East, that she had never left her home for those three years in school. And yet, those years had meant much to her. They had been wonderful years. But they seemed, somehow, now that they were past and she was home again, to have brought her only unrest and longing. From the beginning of her years until the first great crisis in her life, she was going away to school. This world into which she was born had been to Kitty an all-sufficient world. The days of her childhood had been carefree and joyous almost, as the days of the young things of her father's roaming herds. As her girlhood years advanced, under her mother's wise companionship and careful teaching, she had grown into her share of the household duties and into a knowledge of a woman's part in life to which she belonged, as naturally as her girlish form had put on the graces of a young woman. The things that filled the days of her father and mother and the days of her neighbors and friends had filled her days as well. The things that were all in all to those she loved had been all in all to her. And always, through those years from her earliest childhood to her young womanhood, there had been Phil, her playmate, schoolmate, protector, hero, slave, that Phil had been her boy sweetheart and young man lover had seemed as natural to Kitty as her relations to her parents. There had never been anyone else but Phil. There never could be, she was sure, in those days, anyone else. In Kitty's heart that afternoon as she rode, so indifferent to the life that called from every bush and tree and grassy hill and distant mountain, there was a sweet regret 
deep and sincere, for those years that were now, to her, irrevocably gone. Kitty did not know how impossible it was for her to ever wholly escape the things that belonged to her childhood and youth. Those things of her girlhood, out of which her heart and soul had been fashioned, were as interwoven in the fabric of her being as the vitality, strength, and purity of the clean, wholesome outdoor life of those same years were wrought into the glowing health and vigor and beauty of her physical woman. And then had come those other years, the maturing and ripening years when, from the simple, primitive, and enduring elements of life, she had gone to live amid complex and cultivated and largely fanciful standards and values. In that land of Kitty's birth, a man was measured by the measure of his manhood. A woman is ranked by the quality of her womanhood. Strength and courage, sincerity, honesty, and usefulness. These were prime essentials of the man's life that Kitty had. In those years of her girlhood, known, and these two, in their feminine expressions, were the essentials of the woman's life. But from these, the w young woman had gone to the educated in a world where other things were first importance. She had gone to be taught that these were not the essential elements of womanhood or manhood. Or, at least, if she was not to be deliberately so taught, these things would be so ignored and neglected and overlooked in her training that the effect of her character would be the same. In that new world, she was to learn that men and women are not to be measured by the standards of womanhood or manhood. That they were to be rated, not for strength, but by culture. Not for courage, but intellectual cleverness. And not for sincerity, but for manners. Not for honesty, but for success, and not for usefulness, but social position, which is most often determined by the degree of uselessness. It was as though the handler of gems were to attract no value whatever to the weight of the diamond itself, but to fix the world of the stone wholly by the cutting and polishing that the crystal might receive. At first, Kitty had been excited, bewildered and fascinated by the glittering and sparkling and ever-changing many-faceted life. And then she grew weary and homesick. And then as the months passed, she had been drawn more and more by association and environment into the world of down to datism she too began to regard the sparkle of the diamond as the determining factor in the value of the gem and when the young woman had achieved this they called her educated finished and sent her back to the land over which granite mountain gray grim and fortress like with its ranks of sentinel hills kept enduring and an unchanging watch during those first glad days of Kitty's homecoming, she had been eagerly interested in everything. The trivial bits of news about the small doings of her old friends had been delightful. The home life with its simple routine and sweet companionship had been restful and satisfying. The very scenes of her girlhood had seemed to welcome her with a spirit of genuineness and steadfastness that had made her feel as one entering a safe home harbor after a long adventurous voyage to a far away and little known land. And Phil, in the virile strength of his manhood, in the simple bigness of his character, in his enduring and unchanging love, had made her feel his likeness to the primitive land of his birth. But when the glad excitement of those first days of her return were past, when the meetings with old friends were over, and the tales of their doings were exhausted, then Kitty began to realize what her education, as they called it, really meant. The lessons of those three years were not to be erased from her life as one would erase a mistake in a problem or a misspelled word. The tastes, habits of thought, and standards of life, the acquirement of which constituted her culture, would not be denied. It was inevitable that there should be a clash between the claims of her home life and the claims of that life to which she now felt that she also belonged. However odious comparisons may be, they are, are many times inevitable. Loyalty, 
Kitty tried to magnify the worth of those things that in her girlhood had been the supreme things in her life, but try as she might, they were now, in comparison with those things which her culture placed first, of trivial importance. The virile strength and glowing health of Phil's unspoiled manhood, beautiful in the rigorous life of one of the wild horses from which he had been nicknamed, was overshadowed now by the young man's inability to clothe his splendid body in that fashion which her culture demanded. His simple and primitive views of life, as natural as the instincts which governs all creatures in his God-cultivated world, were now unrefined and noble and elegant. His fine nature and unembarrassed intelligence, which found in the wealth of realities amid which he lived abundant food for his intellectual life, and which enabled him to see clearly, observe closely, and think with such clear-cut directness, beside the intellectuality of those schooled in the thoughts of others, appeared as ignorant and illiterate. The very fineness and gentleness of his nature were now the distinguishing marks of an uncouth and awkward rustic. With all her woman heart, Kitty had fought against those comparisons and continued to make them. Everything in her nature that belonged to Granite Mountain, that was, in short, the product of that land, answered to Phil's call, as instinctively as the life that land calls and answers its mating calls. Everything that she had acquired in those three years of more advanced civilization denied and repulsed them. And now her meeting with Patches had stirred the warring forces to renewed activity, and, in the di directing turmoil of her thoughts, she found herself hating the land she loved, loathing the life that appealed to her with such instinctive power, despising those who she so clearly esteemed and honored, and denying the affection of which she was proud with a true woman's tender pride. Kitty was aroused from her absorption by the thrill boyish yells of her two younger brothers, who, catching sight of their sister from the top of one of the low hills that edged the meadow bottom lands, were charging recklessly down upon her. All the clatter and rumble of those eight flying hooves drew closer and closer. Midnight, too, came alive, as the cowboys say, and tossed his head and pranced with eager impatience. "'Where in the world you been around all afternoon?' demanded Jimmy, with his twelve-year-old authority, as his pony skidded to a halt within a foot or two of his sister's horse. And, "'We wanted you to go with us to see our coyote traps,' reproved Connie, who was two years younger than his brother, as his pinto executed a like manner on the other side of the excited midnight. "'And where's Jack?' asked the young woman, mischievously as she smiled, welcoming the victim vigorous lads. Couldn't he help? Jack was the other member of the Reed trio of boys, a lusty four-year-old who felt himself equal to any venture that intrigued his brothers. Jimmy grinned. Aw, Mum coaxed him into the kitchen with something to eat while me and Connie sneaked down to the corral and saddled up and beat it. Big sister's dark eyebrows arched in shocked inquiry. Me and Connie? That's Connie and I, amended Jimmy, with good-natured tolerance of his sister's whims. You see, Kitty, put in Connie, this here coyote trappin' ain't just fun, it's business. Dad promised us three dollars for every scalp, and we're aimin' to make us a steak. Although we didn't get a blasted thing today, Sister's painful and despairing expression was blissfully ignored as Jimmy stealthily flicked the long rumple at the end of his bridle reins against Midnight's flank. Gee, observed the tickled youngster as Kitty gave all her attention to restraining the fretted and indignated horse. Old Midnight is a little feisty, ain't he? I'll race you both to the big gate, challenged Kitty. For how much? demanded Jimmy quickly. You gotta give us a fifty yards head start, though, 
declared Connie, leaning forward in the saddle and shortening his range. If I win, you boys go straight to bed tonight when it's time without no fussing. And I'll give you that oak brush over there yonder as a head start, gave Kitty. Good enough, you're on. They shouted in chorus and loped away. As they passed, the handicapped mark, another shrill, defiant yell came floating back to where Kitty was sitting, raining on her impatient midnight. At the signal, the two ponies leapt from a lope into a full run, while Kitty loosened the restraining reins and a black horse stretched away in pursuit. Spurring, shouting, and treating, the two lads urged their sturdy mounts towards the goal, and the Pinto answered gamely with all they had. Over knoll and washes, across canyon and gully they flew, sure-footed and eager, neck and neck, well, behind them. Drawing closer and closer, came the black, with body low, head outstretched, and limbs that moved apparently with the timed regularity and driving power of a locomotive piston rod. As she passed them, Kitty shouted out, Come on! when they answered with redoubled exertion and another yell of hearty boyish admiration for the victorious midnight and his beautiful rider. Doggone that black streak! exclaimed Jimmy, his eyes dancing with fun as they pulled up at the corral gate. He opens and shuts like a blamed old jackrabbit, commanded Connie. Seems like we was just sitting still watching you go by. Kitty laughed, tensely, unconsciously slipping into the vernacular as she returned. Did you kids think you were a horseback? Oh, you just wait, miss, retorted the grinning Jimmy as he opened the big gate. I'll get a horse someday that'll ride circles around that old black scoundrel. And then, as they dismounted at the door of the saddle room at the big barn, he added generously, you scoot on into the house, Kitty. I'll take care of midnight. It must be getting close to supper time, and I'm hungry enough to eat a raw dog. At which alarming statement, Kitty promptly scooted and stopped only long enough at the windmill pump for a cool, refreshing drink. Miss Reed, with sturdy little Jack helping, was already busy in the kitchen. She was a motherly woman, rather below Kitty's height and inclined somewhat to a comfortable stoutness. In her face was the gentle strength and patience of those whose years had been spent in homemaking, without the hardness that sometimes is seen in the faces of those whose love is not great enough to soften their toil. One knew, by the light in her eyes whenever she spoke to Kitty, or, indeed, whenever the girl's name was mentioned, how large a place her only daughter held in her mother's heart. While the two worked together at their homely task, the girl related in trivial detail the news of the neighborhood and repeated faithfully the talk she had had with the mistress of Cross Triangle answering all her mother's questions, replying with careful interest to the older woman's comments, relating all that was known or guessed and observing regarding the stranger. But of her meeting with Patches, Kitty said little only that she had met him as she was coming home. All during the evening meal, too, Patches was the principal topic of conversation, though Mr. Reed, who had arrived home just in time for supper, had said little about. When supper was over, the evening work was finished. Kitty sat on the porch in the twilight, looking away across the wide valley meadows toward the light that shone where the walnut trees about the Cross Triangle Ranch house made a darker mass in the gathering gloom. Her father had gone to call upon the dean. The men were at the bunkhouse, from which their ho voices came low and indistinct. Within the house, the mother was coaxing little Jack to bed. Jimmy and Connie, on the farthest end of the porch, were planning an extensive campaign against coyotes investing the unearned profits of their proposed industry. Kitty's thoughts were many miles away. In that bright, stirring life, so far from the gloomy stillness of her homeland, where she sat so alone, what gay pleasures held her friends? Amid what brilliant scenes were they spending the evening, 
while she sat in her dark and silent world alone. As her memories painted the pictures, the stirring movements, the music, the merry voice talk, the laughter, the gaiety, the excitement, the companionship of those whose life was so full of interest, her heart rebelled at the dull emptiness of her days. As she watched the gathering evening that was deepening as the darkness of night came on, and the outlines of the familiar landscape faded and vanished in the thickening gloom, she felt the dreary monotony of the days and years that were to come, blotting out her life all tone and color and forms of brightness and beauty. Then she saw, slowly emerging from the shadows of the meadow below, a darker shadow, mysterious and formless, that seemed as if approaching to shape itself out of the very darkness through which it came, until, still dim and indistinct, a horseman was opening the meadow gate. Before the cowboy answered Jimmy's boyish hello, Kitty knew that it was Phil. The young woman's first impulse was to retreat into the safe seclusion of her own room. But even as she arose to her feet, she knew how that would hurt the man who had always been so good to her. And so, she went generously down the walk to meet him, where he had dismounted and would leave his horse. "'Did you see father?' she asked, thinking as she spoke how little there was for them to talk about. "'Why, no. What's the matter?' he returned quickly, as if ready to ride again at her word. She laughed a little at his manner. "'Oh, there's nothing the matter. He, he just went over to see the dean, that's all.' "'I must have missed him crossing the meadow,' he returned. "'He always goes around by the road, I suppose.' And then when he stood beside her, he added gently, But there is something the matter, Kitty. What is it? Are you lonesome for the bright lights? That was always Phil's way, she thought. He seemed to always know instinctively her every mood and wish. Perhaps I'm a little lonely, she admitted. I'm glad you came. Then they were at the porch, and her ambitious brothers were telling Phil in detail their all-absorbed designs against the peace of the Coyote tribe and asking his advice. Ms. Reed came to sit with them a while, and again the talk followed around the narrow circle of their lives until Kitty felt she could bear no more. Then Ms. Reed, more merciful than she knew, sent the boys to bed and then retired to her own room. And so you're tired of us all and want to go back, mused Phil, breaking one of the long silent periods that in those days seemed so often to fall upon them when they found themselves alone. That's, that's not quite fair, Phil, she returned gently. You know it's not that. Well, then I guess I'm tired of this. His gesture indicated the sweep of the wide land. Tired of what we are and what we do? The girl stirred uneasily but didn't speak. I don't blame you, he continued as if speaking aloud. It must have been pretty empty to those who really don't know. And don't I know it? challenged Kitty. You seem to forget that I was born here, that I lived here almost as many years as you. But just the same, you don't know, returned Phil gently. You see, dear, you knew it as a girl, the same as I did when I was a boy. And now, well, I know it as a man, and you as a woman know something that you think is very different. Again the long silence lay a barrier between them, and then Kitty made the effort, hesitatingly. Do you love the life so very, very much, Phil? He answered quickly, Yes, but I could love any life that suits you. No, no, she returned hurriedly. That's not... I mean, Phil, why are you satisfied here? It seems like there's so little for a man such as you. So little? 
His voice told her that her words had stung. I told you that you don't know. Why, everything that a man has a right to want is right here. All that life can give anywhere is here. I mean, all of life that's worth having. But I suppose that it's hard for you to see it that way now. It's like trying to make a city man understand why a fellow's never lonesome when just because there's no crowd around. I guess I love this life, and I'm satisfied with it, just as the wild horses over there at the foot of old granite love it and are satisfied. Don't you feel sometimes that if you had greater opportunities... Don't you sometimes wish that you could live where... She paused with a loss of words. Phil somehow always made the things she craved seem so trivial. I know what you mean, he answered. You mean, don't the wild horses wish that they could live in a fine stable and have a lot of men to feed and care for them and rig them with fancy gold-mounted harnesses and let them prance down the street for crowds to see? No, horses have more sense than that. It, it takes a human to make that kind of fool of himself. There's only one thing in the world that would make me want to try it, and I guess you know what that is. His last words robbed his answer of its sting, and she said gently, you're, you're bitter tonight, Phil. It's not like you. He didn't answer. Did something go wrong today? She persisted. He turned suddenly to face her and spoke with a passion that was unusual to him. I saw you at the ranch this afternoon as you were riding away. You, you didn't even turn to look towards the corral where you knew I was at work. And it seemed like all the heart went clear out of me. Kitty, can't we bring back the old days as they were before you went away? Oh, hush, Phil, she said, almost as if she would have spoken to one of her boy brothers, but he went on recklessly. No, I'm going to speak tonight. Ever since you came home, you've refused to listen to me. You've put me off, made me keep still. I want to tell you, Kitty... If I was like Honorable Patches, would it make any difference? I don't know, Mr. Patches, she answered. You met him today, and you know what I mean. Would it make any difference if I was more like him? Phil, dear, how can I answer such a question? I, I don't know. Then it's not because I live here in this country instead of back east in some city that's made you change? I have changed, I suppose, because I have become a woman, Phil, just as you've become a man. Yes, I have become a man, but I have not changed except that the boy's love has become a man's love. Would it make any difference, Kitty, if you cared more for the life here? I mean, if you were content here, if these things that mean so much to all of us satisfied you? Again she answered, I don't know, Phil. How could I know? Will you try, Kitty? I mean, try to like your old home as you used to like it? Phil, I have tried, I do. She cried, but I don't think it's the life that I like or do not like that makes the difference. I'm sure, Phil, that if I could... She hesitated, then went on bravely. If I could give you the love you want, nothing else would matter. You said you could like any life that suited me. Don't you think that I could be satisfied with any life that the man I love suited? Yes, you could, and I guess that's the answer. What's the answer? she asked. Love. Just love, Kitty. Any place with love is a good place, and without love no life can satisfy. I'm glad you said that. It was what I was wanting you to say. I know now what I have to do. I am like Patches. I have found my job. There was no bitterness in his voice now. The girl was deeply moved. But I don't think I quite understand, Phil. 
she said. Why, don't you see, he returned. My job is to win your love and to make you love me for myself, for just what I am as a man, not try to be something or to live some way that I think you'd like. It's the man that you must love, not what he does or where he lives. Isn't that it? Yes, she answered slowly. I'm sure that is so. It has to be so, Phil. He rose to his feet abruptly. All right, he said roughly. I'll be going now, but don't make any mistake, Kitty. You're mine. Mine by laws that are higher than the things that they teach you at school. And you're going to find it out. I'm going to win you just as the wild things out there win their mates. You're going to come to me, girl, because you're mine and because you're my mate. And then, as she too arose and they stood for a silent moment facing each other, the woman felt his strength and, in her heart, it beat glad. Glad and proud, though she could not give all that he asked. As she watched him ride away into the night, the soft mystery of the darkness out of which he had come seemed to take his shadowy form again to itself, she wondered. Wondered with regret in the thought. Would he, perhaps, go thus out of her life? Would he? When Phil turned his horse in the meadow pasture, at home the big bay, from somewhere in the darkness, trumpeted his challenge. A low laugh came from nearby, and in the lights of the stars, Phil saw a man standing by the pasture fence. As he went towards the shadowy figure, the voice of Patches followed the laugh. I'll bet that was Stranger. I know it was, answered Phil. What's the matter that you're not in bed? I was just listening to the horses out here and thinking, returned Patches. Thinking about your job? asked Phil quietly. Perhaps, admitted the other. Well, you've no reason to worry. You'll ride him all right, said the cowboy. I wish I could be just as sure, the other returned doubtfully. They both knew they were using the big bay horse as a symbol. And I wish I was sure of making good at my job as I am that you'll win out with yours, returned Phil. Patch's voice was very kind as he said reflectively. So, you have a job too. I'm glad for that. Glad? Yes. The tall man placed a hand on the other's shoulders as they turned to walk towards the house. Because, Phil, I have come to the conclusion that this old world is a mighty empty place for the man who has nothing to do. But there seems to be a lot of fellows who manage to keep fairly busy doing nothing just the same, don't you think? Replied Phil with a low laugh. I said man, retorted Patches with emphasis. That's right, agreed Phil. A man just naturally requires a man's job. And, mused Patches, when it's all said and done, I suppose there's only one genuine... Simon Pure, full-sized man, job in the world. I reckon that's right, too, returned the cowboy. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 A few days after Jim Reed's evening visit to the Deans, two cowboys from the Diamond and Half Outfit, on their way to Cherry Creek, stopped at the ranch for dinner. The well-known, open-handed Baldwin's hospitality led many a passing rider thus aside from the main valley road and through the long meadow lane to the cross-triangle table. Always there was good food for man and horse, with a bed for those who came late in the day, and always there was a hearty welcome and talk under the walnut trees with the dean. And in all that broad land there was scarce a cowboy who, when riding the range, would not look out for Dean's cattle with almost the same interest and care that he gave the animals bearing the brand of his own employer. So it was that these riders from the Tonto Flats country told the Dean that was 
looking over the cross-triangle cattle watering at the tally hole that they had seen several cases of screwworm. We doped a few of the worst and branded a calf for you, said Shorty Myers. And his companion, Bert Wilson, added as though apologizing. We couldn't stop any longer because we got to make it over to Wheeler's before morning. Much obliged, boys, returned the dean, and then with his ever-ready set jest, Surely you put the right brand on the calf? We all aren't riding for no Tally Holt Mountain outfit this season, retorted Bert dryly as they all laughed at the dean's question. And at the cowboy's words, Patches, wondering, saw the laughing faces change and look of grim significance flash from man to man. "'Anybody see anything over your way lately?' asked the dean quietly. In the moment of silence that followed, the riders looked questioningly from the face of Patches to the dean and then to Phil. Phil smiled his endorsement of the stranger, and Shorty said, "'We found a couple fresh-branded calves which didn't seem to have no mothers last week, and Bud Stillwell says some things... I look kind of funny over there on the D1 neighborhood. Another significant silence followed. To Patches, it seemed as though the brooding hush that often precedes them storm. He had not missed those questioning looks of the visitors and had seen Phil's smiling endorsement, but he could not, of course, understand. He could only wonder and wait, for he felt intuitively that he mustn't speak. It was as though... These strong men, who had received him so generously into their lives, put him now outside their circle, while they considered business of grave importance to themselves. "'Well, boys,' as the dean, as if dismissing the subject, "'I've been in this cow business a good many years now, and I've seen all kinds of men come and go, but I ain't never seen the man yet that could get ahead very far without paying for what he's got. Sometime, one way or another, whether he's so minded or not, a man just naturally has got to pay. That law is not particular to the cattle business either, is it, Mr. Baldwin? The words came from Patches as they saw his face. They, it was their turn to wonder. The dean looked straight into the dark eyes that were so filled with painful memories and wistful desire. Sir? I mean, said Patches, embarrassed as though he had spoken involuntarily, that what you say applies to those who live idly and doing no useful work whatsoever, as well as to those who are dishonest in business of any kind or who deliberately steal outright. Don't you say so? The dean, his eyes still fixed on the face, the new man answered slowly. I reckon that's so, Patches. When you come to think about it, it must be so. One way or another, every man that takes what he ain't earned has to pay for it. Who's he? asked the visitors of Curly and Bob as they went for their horses when the meal was over. The cross-triangle men shook their heads. He just blew in one day, and the dean hired him, said Bob. But he's the handiest man with his fists that's ever been in this neck of the woods. If you don't believe it, you just go over there and start something, added Curly with enthusiasm. Found it out, did you? laughed Bert. In something less than a minute, admitted Curly. Kind of a funny name, mused Shorty. Bob grinned. That's what Curly thought at first. He had another think about it, did he? Yep, agreed Curly. He sure carries the proper credentials to make any name that he wants to wear good enough for me. The visitors mounted their horse and sat looking appraisingly at the tall figure of Honorable Patches as that gentleman passed them at a little distance on his way to the barn. Could be you're right admitted Shorty, but he sure talks like a smagool marm, don't he? He sure ain't no puncher, commented Bert. No, 
but I'm gambling he's going to be, retorted Curly, ignoring the references to Patch's culture. Me too, agreed Bob. Well, we'll all try him out on the fall rodeo. And better not let him drift far from the home ranch for a while, laughed the visitors. So long. And then they were away. Before breakfast the next morning, Phil said to Patches, Catch up Snip and give him some grain. You'll ride with me today. At Patches look of surprise, he explained laughingly. I'm going to be giving my school a little vacation, and Uncle Will thinks it's time you was out of kindergarten. Later, as they were crossing the big pasture towards the country that lays to the south, the foreman volunteered the further information that for the next few weeks that they would ride the range. May I ask what for? said Patches, encouraged by the cowboy's manner. It was one of the man's peculiarities that he rarely entered into the talk of his new friends when their work was the topic of conversation. And he never asked questions except when alone with Phil or the dean, and then only when led on by them. It was not that he sought to hide his ignorance, for he made no pretense whatsoever, but his reticence, rather, the, the result of a curious feeling of shame that he had so little in common with these men whose lives were so filled with useful labor. And this, if he had known, was one of the things that made them like him. Men who lived in such close daily touch with the primitive realities of life, who thereby acquire a simple directness with a certain native modesty, have no place in their hearts for, to use their picturesque vocabulary, a four-flusher. Phil tactfully did not even smile at the question, but answered in a matter-of-fact tone. We're looking out for screw worms. We'll brand a calf here and there, keep the water's hole open, and look out for the stocking, generally. And you mean, questioned Patches doubtfully, that I'm to ride with you? Sure. You see, Uncle Will thinks you're too good a man to waste on the odd jobs around the place, and... So I'm going to get you in shape for the rodeo this fall. The effects of his words were peculiar. A deep red colored Patch's face and his eyes shone with bright gladness as he faced his companion. And you, what do you think about it, Phil? He demanded. The cowboy laughed at the man's eagerness. Me? Oh, I think just as I have thought of all the time. Ever since you asked for a job that day at the corral. Patches drew a deep breath and sitting very straight in the saddle looked away toward Granite Mountain. While Phil watched him curiously felt something like kindly pity in his heart for this man who seemed so hunger for a man's work and a place among men. Just outside the deep wash gate of the big pasture, a few cattle were grazing in the open flat. As the men rode towards them, Phil took down his rope while Patches watched him questioningly. "'We might as well begin here,' said the cowboy. "'Do you see anything peculiar about that bunch?' Patches studied the cattle in vain. "'What about that calf yonder?' suggested Phil leisurely, opening the loop of his rope. "'I mean, that six-month youngster with the white face.' Still, Patches hesitated. Phil helped him again. Take a look at his ears. They're not marked, exclaimed Patches. And what should they be marked? asked the teacher. Under bit right and a split left, if he belongs to the cross triangle, returned the pupil proudly, and in the same breath he exclaimed, He's not branded either. Phil smiled approvingly. That's right. We'll just fix them now before anyone else beats us to them. He moved his horse slowly towards the cattle as he spoke. But, exclaimed Patches, how do you know that he belongs to the cross triangle in the first place? He doesn't, returned Phil laughing. He belongs to me. Well, I don't see how you can tell. I know because I know the stock. Phil explained, and 
because I remember that particular calf in the rodeo last spring. He got away from us with his mother in the cedars and brush over near the head of the mint wash. That's one thing you'll, you'll learn in this business, you see, but to be sure we're right, you watch him a minute now and you'll see him go to a five-bar cow. That five-bar is my iron, you know. I have a few head running with Uncle Will's. As he spoke, the calf, frightened at their close approach, ran to a cow that was branded, just as Phil had said, and the cow, with an unmistakable maternal interest in her offspring, proved the ownership of the calf. "'You see,' said Phil, "'we'll get that fella now, because before the next rodeo he'll be big enough to leave his mother, and then if he ain't branded he'll be a maverick, and then he'll belong to anyone who can put an iron on him. But couldn't someone brand him now with, with their iron and then drive him away from his mother? Asked Patches. Such things have been known to happen. And that not a thousand miles from here either, returned Phil dryly. But really, you know, Mr. Patches, it isn't done amongst the best people. Patches laughed aloud at his companion's attempt at a snippering affection. Then he watched with admiration while the cowboy set his horse after the calf, and too quickly for an inexperienced eye to see just how it happened, the deft Riata stretched the animal by the heels. With a short hog and rope, which he carried looped through a hole cut in the edge of his chaps near the belt, Phil tied the feet of his victim before the animal had recovered from the shock of the fall. And then, with Patches helping, proceeded to build a small fire of dry grass, sticks, and leaves with nearby brush. From a saddle, Phil took a small iron rod, flattened on one end, and only long enough to permit it being held in a gloved hand when the flattened end was hot. A running iron, he called it, and explained it to his interested pupil, as he thrust it in the fire, how some of the boys used an iron ring for range branding. Is there no way to change or erase the brand? Asked Patches while the iron was hot. Sure there is, replied Phil, and sitting on his heels cowboy fashion, he marked on the ground with a stick. Look, this is the cross triangle brand, and this is the four bar M, happens to be Nick Cambert's iron, over on Tally Holt Mountain. Now, can't you see how supposing if I was Nick, and this calf was branded with the cross triangle. I could work the iron over my brand. Patches nodded. But is there no way to detect such a fraud? It's a mighty hard thing to prove that an iron has been worked over, Phil answered shortly. About the only sure way there is is to catch the thief in the act. But there's also the earmarks, said Patches a few moments later, when Phil was releasing the branded and marked calf. The earmarks and the brand, they wouldn't agree. They would if I was Nick, said Cowboy. Then he added quickly, as if regretting his remark. Our earmark is a under bit right and a split left, you said. Well, the four bar M earmark is a crop and a under bit right and a swallow fork left. With the point of his iron now, he began again to mark in the dirt. Here's the cross triangle, and here is the four bar M. And if the calf branded with a tally holt iron were to be followed after a cross triangle cow, then what? Came Patch's very natural question. Then, returned the foreman of the cross triangle grimly, there'd be a mighty good chance for trouble. It seems to me, said Patches as they rode on, that it'd be easily possible for a man to brand another man's calf by mistake. A man always makes a mistake when he puts his iron on another man's property, returned the cowboy shortly. But couldn't it be done innocently just the same, persisted Patches. Yes, I, it, it might, admitted Phil. Well then... 
What would you do if you found a calf that you knew belonged to the dean, branded with another man's iron? I mean, how would you proceed? Oh, I see what you're driving at, said Phil in a quite a different tone. If you ever run on to a case, the first thing you do is be dead sure that the misbranded calf belongs to one of our cows. Then, if you're right, and it's not too far, you drive the cow and calf into the nearest corral and report it. If you can't get them to a corral without too much trouble, just put the cross triangle on the calf's ribs. When he shows up at the next rodeo with the right brand on his ribs, and some other brand where the right brand ought to be, you'll take pains to remember his natural markings, of course. You'll explain the circumstances, and the owner of the iron that put on him by mistake will be asked to vent his brand. A brand is vented by putting the same brand on the animal's shoulder. Look, there's one over there now. He pointed to an animal a short distance away. See, that steer is branded diamond and a half on the hip and shoulder and a cross triangle on his ribs. Well, when he was a yearling, he belonged to a diamond and a half outfit. We picked him up in the rodeo, away over towards mud tanks. He was running with our stock and still, well, didn't want to go to the trouble of taking him home. About 30 miles it was, so we sold him to Uncle Will and then he vented his brand, as you can see. I see, said Patches, but that's, that's different from finding a calf that's misbranded. Sure, there was no question of ownership there, agreed Phil. But in the case of the calf, the cowboy's pupil persisted. If it had left its mother when the man owning the iron was asked to vent it, there'd be no way to prove in the real ownership. Nothing but the word of the man who found the calf with his mother, and perhaps the knowledge of the men who knew the stock. What I'm getting at, smiled Patches, is this. It would come down at last to the question of men, wouldn't it? That's where most things come to in the end in this country, Patches. But you're right. With owners like Uncle Will, Jim Reed, and Stillwell, and dozens of others, and with cowboys like Curly, Bob, and Bert, and Shorty, there'd be no trouble at all about the matter. But with others, suggested Patches. Well, said Phil slowly, there are men in this country who, if they refused to vent a brand under such circumstances, would be seeing trouble, and mighty quick too. There is another thing that we got to watch out for just now, continued Phil a few minutes later, and that's sleepers. We'll suppose, he explained, that I want to build up my bunch of five bar, and that I'm not too particular about how I do it. Well, I run on to an unbranded pothook S calf that looks good to me, but I don't dare put my iron on him because he's too young to leave his mother. If I let him go until he's older... Some of Jim Reed's riders will brand them, and you see, I would never could work over the pothook S iron with my five bar. So I earmark the calf with the owner's marks and don't brand them at all. Then he's a sleeper. If the pothook S boys see him, they'll notice he's earmarked all right, and very likely they'll take it for granted that he's branded or perhaps let him go anyway. Before the next rodeo, I run on to my sleeper again, and he's big enough now to take away from the cow. So all I have to do is change the earmarks and brand them with my iron. Of course, I wouldn't get all my sleepers, but the percentage would certainly be in my favor. If too many sleepers show up at the rodeo, though, folks would be getting mighty suspicious that someone's been too handy with his knife. We had a lot of sleepers at the last rodeo, he concluded quietly. In patches, remembering what little Billy had said about Nick Cambert and Yakopi Joe, and with the talk of the visiting cowboys still fresh in his mind, realized that he was making some progress in his education. Riding leisurely, and turning frequently aside for a nearer view of the cattle, 
They sighted here and there. They reached Tally Ho a little before noon. Here in a rocky hollow of the hills, a small stream wells from under the granite walls only to lose itself a few hundred yards away in the sand and gravel of the wash. But, short as its run is in the daylight, the water never fails. And many cattle come from the open range that lay on every side to drink and in the summertime to spend the heat of the day standing in the cool and wet sands or laying in the shade of the giant sycamores that line the bank of the opposite of the bluff. There are corrals nearby and a rude cook shack under the widening spread of branches of an old walnut tree and the ground of the flat open space a little back from the water is beaten bare and hard by the thousands upon thousands of cattle that at many a past rodeo time have been gathered there. The two men found, as the diamond and a half riders had said, several animals suffering from those pests in the Arizona ranges, the screw worm. As Phil explained to Patches while they watered their horses, the screw worm is the larva of a blowfly that breeds in sores of living animals. The unhealed wounds of the branding iron make the calves by far the most numerous among the sufferers and were the most affected animals not treated, the loss during the season would be amount to the considerable. Look here, Patches, said the cowboy, as his practiced eyes noted the number needing attention. I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll just run this hospital bunch into the corral, and you can limber up that rope of yours. And so... Patches learned not only the unpleasant work of cleaning the worm-infested sores with coliform, but also received his first lesson in the use of the cowboy's indispensable tool, the rietta. "'What's next?' asked Patches as the last calf escaped through the gate when he had just opened and ran to find the waiting and anxious mother. Phil looked at his companion and laughed. Honorable Patches showed the effect of his strenuous and bulging efforts to learn the rudimentary of the apparent simple trick of rope and a calf. His face was streaked with dust and sweat, his hair was disheveled and his clothes soiled and stained, but his eyes were bright, and his bearing eager and ready. "'What's the matter?' he demanded, grinning happily at his teacher. "'What fool thing have I done now?' "'Oh, you're doing fine,' returned Phil, wondering. I was only thinking that you don't look much like the man I met up there on the divide that evening. I don't feel much like him either, as far as that goes, returned Patches. Phil glanced up at the sun. What do you say to dinner? Must be about that time. Dinner? Sure. I brought some jerky there on my saddle and some coffee. There ought to be an old pot in the shack yonder. Some of the boys don't bother, but... I never like to miss a feed when it's necessary. He did not explain that the dinner was really a thoughtful concession to his own companion. Oh, ejected Patches with a shrug of disgust. The work they'd been doing was still fresh in his mind. I couldn't eat a bite. Oh, you think that now, retorted Phil, but you just go down to the creek and drink all you can hold and wash up. And see how quick you'll change your mind when you smell the coffee. And thus, Patches received yet another lesson. A lesson in the art of forgetting promptly the most disagreeable features of his work. An art very necessity to those who aspire to master real work of any sort whatsoever. When they finished their simple meal and lay stretched full length beneath the overhanging limbs of the age-old tree that witnessed many a stirring scenes and listened to so many campfire tales of ranch and range they talked of things other than their work in low tones as men who feel a mystic and not to be explained bond of fellowship with half-closed eyes looked out into the untamed world that lay before them they spoke of life of its mystery and meaning and phil usually so silent when any conversation touched himself and so timid always in expressing his own self-thoughts was strangely moved to permit this man to look upon the carefully hidden and deeper things of his own life. But upon his cherished dream, upon his great ambition, 
he kept the door closed fast. The time for that revelation of himself was not yet. By the way, Phil, said Patches, when at last his companions signified it was time for them to go. Where were you educated? I don't think I've ever heard you say. I have no education, returned the young man with a laugh that to Patches sounded a bitter note. I'm just a common cowpuncher, that's all. I, I beg your pardon, returned the other, but I thought from the books that you mentioned. Oh, the books. Well, you see, some four years ago, a real honest-to-goodness book man came out to this country for his health and brought his disease along with him. His disease? questioned Patches. Phil smiled. His books, I mean. They killed him, and I fell heir to their trouble. He is a good fellow, all right. We all liked him. Might have been a man if he hadn't been so much of a scholar. I was curious at first just to see what it was that had such a grip upon him, and then I got interested in myself. About that time, too, there was a reason why I thought it might be a good thing for me, so I sent for more and have made a fairly good job of it the past three years. I don't think there's any danger, though, of the habit getting the grip on me that it had on him. He reflected with a whimsical grin. It was our book friend who first called Uncle Will the Dean. The title certainly fits him well, remarked Patches. I don't wonder that it struck. I suppose you received yours from your riding? Mine? Wild horse Phil, I mean, smiled the other. Phil laughed. Haven't you heard that yarn yet? I reckon I may as well tell you. No, wait, he explained eagerly. We got lots of time. We'll ride south a little ways and perhaps I can show you. As I rode away up the creek, Patches wondered much as his companion words as his manner. But the cowboy shook his head at every question, answering simply, Wait. Soon they left the creek bed, passing through a rock gateway at the beginning of a little stream and where, riding up a long, gently sloped hollow between two low and rugged ridges, the crest of the rocky wall on their left was somewhat higher than the ridge on their right. But, as the floor of the long, narrow hollow ascended, the sides of the little valley became correspondingly lower. Patches noticed that his companion was already keenly alert and watchful. He sat his horse easily, but there was a certain air of readiness in his pose as though he was anticipating sudden action while his eyes searched the mountain sides with eager expectation. They had nearly reached the upper end of the long slope when Phil abruptly reined his horse to the left and rode straight up that rugged, rock-strewn mountain wall. To Patches it seemed impossible that a horse could climb such a place, but he said nothing and wisely gave Snip his head. They were nearly at the top. So near, in fact, that Phil could see over the narrow crest when the cowboy suddenly checked his horse and slipped from the saddle. With a gesture, he bade his companion follow his example, and in a moment, Patches stood beside him. Leaving their horses, they crept the last remaining feet to the summit. Crouching low, then laying prone, they worked their way to the top of a huge rounded rock from which they looked over and down upon the country that lays beyond. Patches uttered a low exclamation, but Phil's instant grip on his arm checked further speech. From where they lay, they looked down upon a great mountain basin of gentle, rolling native grass. From the foot of that rocky ridge, the beautiful pasture stretched away several miles to the bold gray cliffs and mighty tower battlements of granite mountain on the south a range of dark hills to the north a series of sharp peaks that form the natural boundaries do you see them whispered phil patches looked at him inquiringly the stranger's interest in the wonderful scene that led him to overlook that which held his companion's attention over there whispered phil impatiently on the side of that hill there. They're not more than 400 yards away and they're working towards us. 
Do you mean those horses? Whispered Patches, amazed by his companion's manner. Phil nodded. Do those belong to the cross triangle? Asked Patches, still mystified. The cross triangle? Phil chuckled. Then, with a note of genuine reverence in his voice, he added softly, They belong to God, Mr. Honorable Patches. Then Patches understood. Wild horses, he ejected softly. There are few men, I think, who can look without admiration upon a beautifully formed, noble-spirited horse. The glorious pride and strength and courage of these most kindly of God's creatures, even when they're in harness and subject to their often inferior masters, compel respect and a degree of appreciation. But seen as they roam free in those pastures that, since creation, have never been marred by plow or fence, pastures that are theirs by divine right, and the sunny slopes and shady groves and rocky nooks of which consternate their kingdom, where in their lordly strength they're subject only to the dectities of their own being, and unmutilated by human cruelty, ruled by the power and authority of nature's law. They stir the blood of the coldest heart to a quicker flow, and thrill the mind of the dullest with admiring awe. There's twenty-eight in that bunch, whispered Phil. You see that big black stallion on guard? The one that throws up his head every minute or two to have a look around? Patches nodded. There was no mistaking the watchful leader in the band. He's the chap that gave me my title, as you might call it, chuckled Phil. Come on now, we'll go see them in action, then I'll tell you about it. He slipped from the rock and led the way back to the saddle horses. Riding along the ridge, just under the crest, they soon reached the point where the chain of low peaks merged into the hills that formed the southern boundary of the basin, and so suddenly came into full view of the wild horses that were feeding on the slopes a little below. As the horsemen appeared, the leader of the band threw up his head with a warning call to his fellows. Phil reined in his horse and motioned for Patches to do the same. For several minutes, the black stallion held his place, as motionless as the very rocks of the mountainside, gazing straight at the mounted men as though challenging their right to cross the boundaries of his kingdom, while his retainers stood as still, waiting his leadership. With his long black mane and tail rippling and waving in the breeze that swept down from Briar Pass and across the basin, with his raven black coat glistening in the sunlight with the sheen of richest satin, where the swelling muscles curved and rounded from the shadows to the high light, and with his pose a perfect strength of freedom, he looked, as he indeed as he was, a prince of his kind, a lord of the untamed life that homes in these God-cultivated fields. Patches glanced at his companion, as if to speak, but struck by the expression on the cowboy's face remained silent. Phil was leaning a little forward in his saddle, his body as perfect in its poise of alert and graceful strength as the body of the wild horse at which he was gazing with such fixed interest. The clear, deeply tanned skin of his cheeks glowed warmly with the red of his clean, rich blood. His eyes shone with suppressed excitement. His lips, slightly parted, curved into a smile of appreciation, love and reverence for the unspoiled beauty of wild creature that he himself in so many ways unconsciously resembled. And Patches, scoot bred and schooled in a world so far from this world of primitive things, looked from Phil to the wild horse and back again from the stallion to the man, felt the spirit and the power that made them kin, felt it with, to him, strange new feeling of reverence as though in the first unspoiled perfect life strength of man and horse he came into a closer touch with the divine that he'd ever known before then without taking his eyes from the object of his almost worship phil said now watch him patches watch him as he spoke he moved slowly towards the band while patches rode close by his side at their movement 
the wild stallion called another warning to his followers and went a few graceful steps towards the slowly approaching men. And then as they continued their slow advance, he whirled with smooth grace of a swallow and with a movement so light and free that he seemed rather to skim over the surface of the earth than tread upon it, circled here and there about his band, assembling them in closer order, flying with ears flat and teeth bared and mane and tail tossing, in lordly fury at the laggards, driving them before him, but keeping always between his charges and the danger until they were evidently judged to be, for their inferior strength, a distance of safety. And then again, he halted his company, and moved alone a short ways towards the horsemen stood motionless and watched their slow approach. Again, Phil checked his horse. God, he exclaimed under his breath, what a sight. Oh, you beauty, you're a beauty. But Patches had moved less by the royal beauty of the wild stallion than by the passionate reverence that reverberated from his companion's voice. Again the horsemen moved forward, and again the stallion drove his band to a safe distance and stood waiting between them and their enemies. Then the cowboy laughed aloud, a hearty laugh of clean enjoyment. All right, old fella, I'll just give you a whirl of luck, he said aloud to the wild horse, apparently forgetting his human companion. And Patches saw him shorten his reins and rise a little in his stirrups, while his horse, as though understanding, gathered himself for a spring. In a flash, Patches was alone, watching as Phil, riding with every ounce of strength that his mount could command, dashing straight towards the band. For a moment... The black stallion stood watching the now rapidly approaching rider. Then wheeling, he started his band driving them imperviously now to an utmost speed. And then, as though he understood this new maneuver of the cowboy, he swept past the running companions and with the clean, easy flight of an arrow, and taking his place at the head of this charge, led them away towards Granite Mountain. Phil stopped, and Patches could see him watching as the wild horses, with streaming manes and tails, followed their leader, who seemed to run with less than half the strength, swept away across the rolling hillside, growing smaller and smaller in the distance, until, as dark, swiftly moving dots, they vanished over the skyline. "'Wasn't that great?' cried Phil, when he had loped back to his companion. "'Did you see him go by the bunch like they were standing still?' There didn't seem to be much show for you to catch him, said Patches. Catch him, exclaimed Phil. Do you think I was trying to catch him? I just wanted to see him go. The horse doesn't live that could put a man within rope and distance of any one in that bunch on a straightaway run, and the black could run circles around the whole outfit. I had him once, though. You caught that black? explained Patches incredulously. Phil grinned. I sure had him for a little while. What is he doing out here running loose then? Demanded the other. Got away, did he? Got away nothing. Fact is, he belongs to me right now, in a way. And I wouldn't swap him for any string of cow horses that I ever saw. Then, as they rode towards the home ranch, Phil told the story that is known throughout all the country. It was when that black was a yearling, he said. I'd had my eye on him all year, and so had some of the other boys who had sighted the band. For you could see, even when he was a colt, he was going to be something. The wild horses were getting rather too numerous that season, and we planned a chase to thin them out a little, as we do every two or three years. Of course, everyone was after the black, and one day... Along towards the end of the chase, when the different bands had been broken up and scattered plenty much, I run upon him. I was trailing old Gray up that draw, the way we came in today, you know. And all at once I met him as he was coming over the top of the hill, right where you and I rode on to him. It was all so sudden that for a minute he was rattled as bad as me, and believe me, I was shaking like a leaf. I managed to come to first, though, and... 
hung my rope on him before he could get started. I don't know to this day where the old gray that I was after went. Well, sir, he fought like a devil, and for a spell, we had it around and around until I wasn't dead sure whether I had him or he had me. But he was only a yearling then, you see, and I finally got him down. Phil paused a particular expression on his face, and Patches waited silently. Do you know, said the cowboy at last, hesitating, I can't explain it, and I don't talk about it much, for it was the strangest thing that ever happened to me, but when I looked into that black stallion's eyes, and he looked me straight in the face, I never felt so sorry for anything in my life. I was sort of ashamed, like, like, well, like I'd been caught holding up a church, you know, or something like that. We were all alone up there, just him and me, and while I was getting my wind, and we were sizing each other up, I was feeling that way. I got to thinking what it all meant to him to be broken and educated and, well, civilized, you know. I thought what a horse he'd be if he was left alone to live as God made him, and so, well, he paused again with an embarrassed laugh. You let him go? cried Patches. It's the God's truth, Patches. I couldn't do anything else. I, I just couldn't. One of the boys came up just in time to catch me turning him loose, and of course, the whole outfit just naturally raised hell about it. You see, in a chase like that, we always bunch them all and sell them off to the highest bidder, and every man in the outfit shares alike. The cowboys figured the black was worth more than any five others they'd caught, so I couldn't blame them for feeling sore. But I fixed it with them by turning all my share into the pot so they couldn't kick. That, you see, makes the black belong to me, in a way. And it's pretty well generally understood that I proposed to take care of them. There was a fellow riding in the rodeo last fall that took a shot at him one day, and, well, he left the country right after it happened, and hasn't been seen around here since. The cowboy grinned at his companion as he laughed out. Do you know, Phil continued in a low tone a few minutes later, I believe that horse knows me yet. Whenever I'm over in that part of the country, I always have a look at him if he happens to be around. and We visit a little, as we did today. I got a funny notion that he likes it as much as I do, and I can't tell how it is, but it sort of makes me feel good all over just to see him. I reckon you think me some kind of fool, though. He finished with another short laugh of embarrassment. But that's the way I feel, and that's why they call me Wild Horse Phil. For a little they rode in silence, and then Patches spoke gravely. I don't know how to tell you what I think, Phil, but I understand. And from the bottom of my heart, I envy you. And the cowboy, looking at his companion, saw in the man's eyes something that reminded him of that which he'd seen in the wild horse's eyes. That day, when he had set him free. Had Patches, too, at some time in those days that had gone, had been caught by the riata of a circumstance, or environment, or in some degree robbed of his god inheritance? Phil smiled at the fancy, but smiled, felt its truth. With a genuine sympathy felt that also to be true, that this man might yet, by the strength that was deepest within him, regain that which he had lost. And so that day, as the man from the ranges and the man from the cities rode together, the feeling of kinship that each had instinctively recognized at their first meeting on the Divide was strengthened. They knew that a mutual understanding which could not have been put into words or if any tongue or land had drawn them closer together. A few days later, the incident occurred that fixed their friendship as they thought, for all time to come. Chapter 9 Phil and Patches were riding that day in the country about Old Camp. Early in the afternoon they heard the persistent bawling of a calf, 
and upon riding towards the sound found the animal deep in the cedar timber, which in that section thickly covers the ridges. The calf was freshly branded with the tally holt iron. It was done, Phil said, the day before, probably in the late afternoon, and the youngster was calling for his mother. It's strange that she's not somewhere around, said Patches. It'd be more strange if she was, retorted the cowboy shortly, and he looked from the calf to the distant Tally Holt Mountain as though he was considering some problem which he did not for some reason care to share with his companion. There's no use looking around for her, he added with grim disappointment. That's always the way. If we had ridden this range yesterday instead of away over there in the mint wash country, uh, I'm always about a day behind. There was something in the manner and in the quiet speech of the usual sunny-tempered foreman that made his companion hesitate to ask questions or to offer comment with the freedom that he had learned to feel the first day of their riding together. During the hours that followed, Phil said very little, and when he did speak, his words were brief and often curt, while, to Patches, he seemed to study the country over which they rode with unusual care. When they had eaten their rather gloomy lunch, he was in the saddle again almost before Patches had finished, with seemingly no inclination for their usual talk. The afternoon was nearly gone, and they were making their way homeward, when they saw a cross-triangle bull that had evidently been hurt in a fight. The animal was one of the Dean's much-prized Herefords, and the wound needed attention. "'We've got to dope that up,' said Phil, "'or the screw worms will be working on her for sure.' He was taken down as Riata and watching the bull, which was rumbling a sullen and deep voice challenge as he spoke. "'Can I be of help?' said Patches anxiously as he viewed the powerful beast, for this was the first full-grown animal that needed attention that he had seen in his first few days of experience. "'No,' returned Phil. "'Just keep in the clear, that's all. This chap is no calf, and He's sore over his scrap. He'll be on the prod right now. It all happened in a few seconds. The cowboy's horse, understanding from long experience that this threatening mark of his master's rieta was in no gentle frame of mind, fretted uneasily, as though dreading his part in the task before them. Patch saw the whirling rope leave Phil's hand and saw it tighten, and as the cowboy threw the weight of his horse against it, and then he caught a confused vision. A fallen, struggling horse with a man pinned to the ground beneath him, and a wickedly lowered head with sharp horns and angry eyes charging right at them. Patches did not think. There was no time to think. With a yell of horror, he struck deep with both spurs, and his startled, pain-maddened horse leapt forward. Again he spurred cruelty with all of his strength, and the next bound of his frenzied mount carried him upon those deadly horns. Patches remembered hearing a sickening rip and a scream of fear and pain as he felt the horse under him rise in the air. He never knew how he managed to free himself as he fell backwards with his struggling mount, but he distinctly saw Phil regain his saddle while his horse was in the very act of struggling to its feet and he was watching with anxious interest as the cowboy forced his excited mount in front of the bull to attract the beast's wicked attention. The bull, accepting the tantalizing challenge, charged again, and Patches, with a thrill of admiration for the man's coolness and skill, saw that Phil was coiling his rope, even while his frightened horse, with terrific leaps, avoided those menacing horns. The bull stopped and shook his head in anger over his failure, and looked back towards the man on foot. But again that horse and rider danced temptingly before him, so close that it seemed he could not fail, and again he charged, only to find his mad rush carried him still further from the helpless patches. And by now, Phil had recovered his rope, and the loop was whirling in easy circles above his head. The cow horse, as though feeling the security that was in that familiar motion of his master's arm, steadied himself, and in the few active moments that followed, 
obedient to every signal of his rider, did his part with almost human intelligence. When the bull was safely tied, Phil went to the frighteningly injured horse, and, with a merciful bullet, ended the animal's suffering. Then he looked thoughtfully at Patches, who stood gazing ruefully at the dead animal, as though he felt himself to blame for the loss of his employer's property. A slight smile lightened the cowboy's face as he noticed his companion's troubling thought. Well, I suppose I've done her now, said Patches, as though expecting well-merited chastisement. Phil's smile broadened. You sure have, he returned, as he wiped the sweat from his face. I'm much obliged to you. Patches looked at him in confused embarrassment. Don't you know that you just saved my life? asked Phil dryly. But, but I killed a good horse of the Dean's, stammered Patches. To which the Dean's foreman returned with a grin. I reckon Uncle Will can stand the loss, considering. This relieved the tension, and they laughed together. But tell me something, Patches said Phil curiously. Why didn't you shoot the bull when he charged me? I honestly didn't think of it, admitted Patches. It, I really didn't think of anything. The cowboy nodded with understanding approval. I've noticed that the man to tie to in sudden trouble is the man who doesn't have to think. The man, I mean, who just does the right thing instinctively and waits to think about it afterwards when there's time. Patches was pleased. I did the right thing then? It was the only thing you could have done to save my life, returned Phil seriously. If you had tried to use your gun, even if you had managed to hit him, you wouldn't have stopped him in time. If you had been where you could have put a bullet between his eyes, it might have worked, but he smiled again. I'm mighty glad you didn't think about trying any experiments. Tell me something else, he added. Did you realize the chance you were taking for yourself? Patches shook his head. I couldn't say that I realized anything except that you were in a bad fix and it was up to me to do something quick. How'd it happen, anyway? He seemed anxious to turn the conversation. Diamond stepped in a hole there, explained Phil. When he turned over, I sure thought it was all day for me. Believe me, I won't forget this, Patches. For another moment, there was an embarrassed silence, and then Patches said, What puzzles me is why you didn't take a shot out of him after you were up instead of risking your neck again trying to rope him. Well, there's no use in killing a good bull as long as there's any other way. It's our business to keep him alive. That's what I started in to do, wasn't it? And thus the cowboy, in a simple word or two, stated the creed of his profession. A creed that permits no consideration of personal danger or discomfort when the welfare of the employer's property is at stake. When they had removed saddle and bridle from the dead horse and had cleaned the ugly wound on the bull's side, Phil said, Now, Mr. Honorable Patches, You'd better move on down the wash a piece and get out of sight behind one of them cedars. This fella is going to get busy again when I let him up. I'll come along when I've got rid of him. A little while later, as Phil rode out of the cedars towards Patches, a deep bellowing challenge came from up the wash. He's just telling us what he'll do to us the next chance he gets, chuckled Phil. Hop up behind me now and to get on home. The gloom that all day had seemed to overshadow Phil had effectually banished by the excitement of the incident, and again he was his sunny, cheerful self. As they rode, they chatted and laughed merrily. And then suddenly, as it had happened that morning, the cowboy again turned grim and silent. Patches was wondering what had so quickly changed his companion mood when he caught sight of two horsemen, riding along the top of the ridge that forms the western side of the wash, their course 
paralleling that of the cross-triangle men who were following in the bed of the wash. When Patches directed Phil's attention to the riders, the cowboy said shortly, I've been watching them for the last ten minutes. And then, as if regretting the manner of his reply, he added more kindly, If they keep on the way they're going, we'll likely meet them about a mile down the wash where the ridge breaks. Do you know them? asked Patches curiously. It's Nick Cabert and that poor lost dog of Yakopi Joe, Phil answered. The Tally Holt Mountain Outfit, murmured Patches, watching the riders on the ridge with a quickened interest. Do you know them, Phil? I believe I've seen those fellows before. You have? shouted Phil. Where? When? Well, I don't know how to tell you where, Patches replied, but it was the day that I rode the drift fence. They were on a ridge across a little valley from me. That must have been this same horse wash that we're following now, replied Phil. It widened out a bit below here. What makes you think it was Nick and Joe? Why, those fellers up there look like the two I saw, one big one and one rather lightweight. They were the same distance from me, you know, and yeah, I'm, I'm sure it's the same horses. Pretty good, Patches, but you ought to have reported it when you got home. I I didn't think it was of any importance. There are two rules you must follow, always, said the cowboy, if you're going to learn to be a top hand in this business. The first is to see everything there is to see and to see everything about everything that you see. And the second is to remember it all. I don't mind telling you now that Jim Reed found a calf fresh branded with a tally holt iron that same afternoon in that same neighborhood, and that is on our side of the drift fence. He ran on to a cross triangle cow that had lost her calf. There comes our friends now. The two horsemen were riding down the side of the hill at an angle that would bring about the meeting which Phil had foreseen. Patches immediately broke the first of the two rules, for, while watching the riders, he did not notice that his companion loosened his gun in the holster. Nick Cabert was a large man, big-bodied and heavy, with sandy hair, and those particularly light blue eyes which do not beget confidence. But as the Tally Holt mountain men halted to greet Phil, Patches gave to Nick little more than a passing glance, so interested was he in the big man's companion. It is doubtful if blood, training, environment, and circumstances, the fates, or whatever it is that gives man to individuality, ever marked a man with less manhood than that was given to poor Jacopi Joe. Standing erect, he would have been perhaps a little more medium height, but thin and stooped, with a half-starved look as he slouched listlessly in the saddle. It was almost impossible to think of him as a matured man. The receding chin and coarse, loosely open mouth, the pale, lifeless eyes set too closely together under a low forehead, with a ragged thatch of dead mouse-colored hair and a fort of sneaking lost dog expression proclaimed him the outcast that he was. The big man eyed Patches as he greeted the cross-triangle foreman. Howdy, Phil. Hello, Nick, returned Phil coolly. Howdy, Joe. The younger man, who was gazing stupidly at Patches, returned the salutation with an unintelligible mutter and proceeded to roll a cigarette. You folks at Cross Triangle short of horses? asked Nick with evident attempt of jockletry and alluding to the situation of the two men who were riding one horse. We got mixed up with a bull back yonder, Phil explained briefly. They can put a horse out of game pretty quick sometimes, commented the other. 
I've lost a few that way myself. It's about as far from here to my place as it is to Baldwin, or, or I'd help you out. You'd welcome, you know. Much obliged, returned Phil, but we'll make it home all right. I reckon we'd better be moving along, though. So long. Adios. Throughout this brief exchange of courtesies, Yuck Pai Joe had not moved, except a puff on a cigarette, nor had he ceased to regard Patches with stupid curiosity. As Phil and Patches moved away, he still sat gazing after the stranger, until he was aroused by a sharp word from Nick as the latter turned his horse towards Tally Holt Mountain. Without changing his slouching position in the saddle, and with a final slinking sideways look towards Patches, the poor fella obediently trailed after his master. Patches could not resist the impulse to return for another look at the wretched shadow of manhood that was so interested in him. Well, what do you think of that pair? asked Phil, breaking in upon his companion's preoccupations. Patches shrugged his shoulders much as he had done that day of his first experiences with the screw worms, and then he said quietly, Do you mind telling me about them, Phil? Well, there's not much to tell, returned the cowboy. That is, there's not much that anybody knows for certain. Nick, he was born in Yockby County. His father, old George Cambert, was one of the kind that seemed honest enough and industrious too, but somehow always seemed to just miss out. They moved away to some place in Southern California when Nick was about growed. He came back six years ago and located over there at the foot of Tally Holt Mountain and started his 4 bar M iron. And one way or another, he's managed to get together quite a bunch of stock. You see, his expenses don't amount to anything, hardly. He and Joe batch in an old shack that somebody built years ago, and they do all the riding themselves. Joe, he's not much of a force, but he's handier than you think, as long as there's someone around to tell him what to do and sort of back him up. Nick, though, can do two men's work any day of the year. It's strange that a man like Nick would have anything to do with a creature of that poor specimen, mused Patches. Are they related in any way? Nobody knows, answered Phil. Joe first showed up at Prescott about four years ago with a man by the name of Dryden, who claimed that Joe was his son. They camped just outside in some dirty old tents and lived by picking up whatever was laying around loose. Dryden wouldn't work, and naturally, no one would have Joe. Finally, Dryden was sent up for robbing a store, and Joe nearly went after him. They let him off, I believe, because it was proved pretty well that he was only Dryden's tool, and didn't have nerve enough to do any real harm by himself. He drifted around for several months, living like a stray dog until Nick took him in tow. Nick treats him shamefully, abuses him like a beast, and works him like a slave. The poor devil stays on with him because he doesn't know what else to do, I suppose. Is he always like what we saw today? asked Patches, who seemed strangely interested in that bit of human drift. Does he ever talk? Oh yeah, he'll talk all right when Nick ain't around. Or when there's not too many present. Get off somewhere alone with him after he acquires and gets acquainted a little. He's not half bad company as he looks. I reckon that's the main reason why Nick keeps him. You see, no decent cowpuncher would dare work at Tally Holt Mountain. And a man gets mighty lonesome living so much alone. But Joe never talks about where he come from or who he is. Shuts up like a clam if you so much as mention anything that 
Looks like you were trying to find out about him. He's not so much a fool as he looks, either, so far as that goes, but he's always got that sneaking coyote sort of look, and whatever he does, he does it in the same way. So in other words, commented Patches thoughtfully, poor Joe must have someone to depend on, and taken alone, he don't count more than a cipher. That's it, said Phil. With someone to feed him and think for him and take care of him and be responsible for him in some way or another, he'd make almost one. After all, Phil, said Patches with some bitter sarcasm, poor Yockby Joe is not so much different from hundreds of men that I know. By their standards, he should be envied. Phil was amazed by his companion's words, for they seemed to hint at something of the man's past and Patches, so far as his reticence upon any subject that approached his own history, was always as silent as Joe himself. "'What do you mean by that?' demanded Phil. "'What sort of men do you mean?' "'I mean the sort that never do anything for their own free wills, the sort that have someone else to think for them and feed them and take care of them and take all the responsibilities for what they do or don't do.' I mean those who are dependents, and thus who inspire to be dependent. I can't see that it makes any essential difference whether they have inherited wealth of, of what we call culture, or whether they're poverty-stricken semi-imbeciles like Joe. The principle's about the same. As they dismounted at the home corral gate, Phil looked at his companion curiously. You seem mighty interested in Joe, he said with a smile. I am, retorted Patches. He reminds me of of someone I know, he finished with his old self-mocking smile. I have a fellow feeling for him, the same as you have for that wild horse, you know. I'd like to take him away from Nick and see if it'd be possible to make a real man of him. He mused more to himself than his companion. I don't believe I'd try any experiments along them kind patches, cautious Phil. You got to have something to build on when you start to make a man. The raw material's not in Joe, and besides, folks might not understand, he added significantly. Patches laughed bitterly. Well, I got my hands full right now anyway. The next morning, the foreman said that he would give that day to the horses he was training, and sent Patches alone after the saddle and bridle which they had left near the scene of the accident. "'You can't miss finding the place again,' he said to Patches. "'Just follow up the wash. You'll be back by noon if you don't try any of those silly experiments,' he added, laughing." Patches had ridden as far as the spot where he and Phil had met the Tally Holt men and was thirsty. He thought of the distance he had yet to go, and then of the return back to the ranch in the heat of the day. He remembered that Phil had told him, as they were riding out the morning before of a spring a little way up the small side of a canyon that opens into the main wash through that break in the ridge. For a moment he hesitated, and then turned aside, determined to find the water. Riding perhaps two hundred yards into that narrow gap in the ridge, he found the way suddenly becoming steep and roughly strewn with boulders, and thinking to make better time, he left his horse tied to a bush in the shadow of the rocky wall while he climbed up the dry water course on foot. He found, as Phil had said, that it was not far. Another hundred yards up the boulder-strewn break in the ridge, and he came out into a beautiful glade where he found the spring, cold and clear, under the moss-grown rock in the deep shade of an old gnarled and twisted cedar. Gratefully, he threw himself down and drank long and deep, and then sank and sat for a few moments' rest before making his way back to his horse. The moist black earth of the cup -like hollow was roughly trampled by cattle that knew the spot, and there were well-marked trails leading down through the heavy growth of brush and trees that clothed the hillsides. 
So dense was the forest growth, and so narrow the glade, that the sunlight only reached the cool retreat through a network of leaves and branches in an ever-shifting spot of bars and brightness. Nor could one see very far through the living screens. Patches was on the point of going when he heard voices and the sound of horses' feet somewhere above. For a moment, he sat silently listening. Then he realized that the riders were approaching down one of the cattle trails. A moment more, and he thought he recognized one of the voices. There was a low, murmuring, whining tone, and then a rough, heavy voice raising seemingly in anger. Patches felt sure now that he knew the speakers, and obeying one of those impulses that so often propelled his actions, he slipped quietly into the dense growth on the side of the glade opposite of the approaching riders. He was scarcely hidden, a hundred feet away or so from the spring, when Nick Cabert and Yakpi Joe rode into the glade. If Patches had paused to think, he likely would have disdained to play the part of a hidden spy. But he had acted without thinking, and no sooner had he been concealed than he realized it was too late. So he smiled mockingly at himself and awaited developments. He had heard and seen enough, since he had been in the dean's employ, to understand the suspicion in which the owner of the 4 bar M iron was held. And from even his few days of work on the range in company with Phil, he came to understand how difficult it was for the cattlemen to prove anything against the men who had every reason to believe was stealing their stock. It was the possibility of getting some pause of evidence and of thus protecting his employer's property that he had prompted to take action of the chance situation. As the two men appeared, it was clear to the hidden observer that the weakling had in some way incurred his master's displeasure. The big man's face was red with anger and his eyes were hard and cruel, while Joe had more than ever the look of a lost dog that expected nothing less than a curse and a kick. Nick drank at the spring, and then turned his back to his companion, who had not dismounted, but sat on his horse, cringing and frightened, trying with fluttering fingers to roll a cigarette. A moment the big man surveyed his trembling follower, and then taking a heavy quirt from his saddle, he said with contemptuous sneer, Well, why don't you get your drink? I'm not thirsty, Nick, faltered the other. You're not thirsty, mocked the man with a jeering laugh. You're lying and you know it. Get down. Honest to God, Nick, I don't want no drink whimpered Joe, as his master toyed with the curt suggestively. "'Get down, I tell you,' commanded the big man. Joe, obeying his thin form shaken with fear, and stood shrinking against his horse's side, his fearful eyes fixed on the man. "'Now, come here!' "'Don't, Nick. Don't hit me. I didn't mean no harm.' Let me off this time, won't you, Nick? Come here. You got it coming, damn you, and you know it. Come here, I say. As if it were beyond his power to refuse, the wretched creature took a halted step or two towards the man whose brutal will dominated him. Then he paused and half turned as if attempting to escape, but the menacing voice stopped him. Come here whimpering and bagging with disconnected, inintelligible words, the poor man again started towards the man with a quirt. At the critical moment, a quiet, well-schooled voice interrupted the scene. I beg your pardon, Mr. Cambert. Nick whirled with an oath of surprise and astonishment to face Patches, who had come leisurely towards him from the brush above the spring. "'What are you doing here?' demanded Nick, while his victim shrunk back to his horse. His eyes fixed upon the intruder with dumb amazement. "'I came for a drink,' replied Patches coolly. "'Excellent water, isn't it? "'And the day's quite warm. "'Makes one appreciate such a delightful cool retreat, don't you think?' 
Heard us coming and thought you'd play the spy, did you? Growled the tally holt mountain man. Patches smiled. Really, you know, I'm afraid I didn't think much about it, he said gently. I'm troubled that way, you see, he explained with elaborate politeness. I often do things upon impulse, don't you know? It's beastly embarrassing sometimes. Nick glared at this polite, soft-spoken gentleman with half-amused anger. I heard there was a dude tenderfoot hanging around the cross triangle, he said at last. You're sure hell of a fine specimen. You've had your drink now. Suppose you get going. I beg your pardon? Drawled Patches looking at him with innocent inquiry. Get going. Go on with your business. Really, Mr. Cambert, I understood that this was open range. Patches looked about as though carefully assuring himself that he was not mistaken in the spot. The big man's eyes closed wickedly. It's closed to you. And then, as Patches did not move, Well, are you going or do I gotta get you started? He took a threatening step towards the intruder. No, returned Patches easily. I'm certainly not going. Not just at present. And, he added thoughtfully, If I were you, I wouldn't try to start anything. Something in the extraordinary self-possession of this soft-spoken stranger made the big man hesitate. Oh, you wouldn't, huh? He returned. You mean, I suppose, that you propose to interfere with my business? If, by your business, you mean beat a man who's unable to protect himself, I certainly propose to interfere. For a moment, Nick glared at Patches as though doubting his own ears, and then rage at the tenderfoot's insolence mastered him. With a vile amphitheat, he caught the loaded quirt in his hand by its small end and strode towards the intruder. But even as the big man swung his wicked weapon aloft, a hard fist with the weight of a well-trained and well-developed shoulder back of it found the point of his chin with scientific accuracy. The force of the blow augmented as if it was by Nick's weight as he was rushing to meet it was terrific. The man's head snapped back and he swung half around as he fell so that the uplifted arm with the threatening weapon was twisted under the heavy bulk that lay quivering and harmless. Patches bent coolly over the unconscious man and extracted his gun from the holster and then stepping back a few paces he quietly waited. Yockby Joe who had viewed the proceedings thus far with gaping mouth and frightened wonder, scrambled into his saddle and reined his horse about as if to ride for his life. "'Wait, Joe!' called Patches sharply. The weakling paused in pitiful indecision. "'Nick will be all right in a few minutes,' continued the stranger reassuringly. "'Stay where you are.' Even as he spoke, the man on the ground opened his eyes. For a moment he gazed about, collecting his shocked and scattered senses, and then with a mad roar he jumped to his feet and reached for his gun. But when his hand touched the empty holster, a look of dismay swept over his heavy face, and he looked doubtfully towards Patches with a degree of respect and somewhat humbled air. "'Yes, I have your gun,' said Patches soothingly. "'You see, I thought it would be best to remove the temptation.' You don't really want to shoot me anyway, you know. You only think you do. When you have time to consider it all calmly, you will thank me. Because, don't you see, I'd make you a lot more trouble dead than I could possibly alive. I don't think Mr. Baldwin would like to have me all shot to pieces, and particularly if the shooting was done by someone from Tally Holt Mountain. And I'm quite sure that Wild Horse Phil would be very much put out by it too. Well, what do you want? growled Nick. You got the drop on me. What are you after, anyway? What particular expressions you Western people use? muttered Patches. You say that I got the drop on you, when to be exact, you should have said that you've got the drop from me. 
Do you see? Good, isn't it? Nick's effort at self-control was heroic. Patches watched him with insolence taunting smile that goaded the man to reckless speech. If you didn't have that gun, I'd... The big man began, and then stopped, for as he spoke, Patches placed the weapon carefully in a rock and went towards him barehanded. You'd do what? At the crisp, eager question that came in such clear contrast to Patch's former speech, Nick hesitated and drew back a step. Patch has promptly moved a step nearer, and his words came now in answer to an unfinished threat with a cutting force. What would you do, you hulking swine? You can bully a weakling not half your size. You can beat a helpless in incompetent like a dog. You can bluster and threaten a tenderfoot when you think he fears you. You can attack a man with a loaded quirk when you think he's unable to defend himself. Show me what you can do now. The tally -holt man drew back another step. Patches continued his remark. You are a healthy specimen, yes you are. You have the frame of a bull with the spirit of a coyote and the courage of a sucking dove. Now, in your own vernacular, get a going. Vamoose, get out. I want to talk to your superior over there. Sullenly, Nick Cabert mounted his horse, turned away from towards one of the trails leading out from the little arena. Come along, Joe, he called to his follower. No, you don't. Patch is cut in with force. Joe, stay where you are. Nick paused. What do you mean by that? He growled. I mean, returned Patches, that Joe is free to go with you or not, as he chooses. Joe, he continued addressing the cause of controversy, you need not go with this man. If you wish, you can come with me. I'll take care of you and I'll give you a chance to make a man of yourself. Nick laughed coarsely. So that's your game, is it? Well, it won't work. I know now why Bill Baldwin got you hanging around, pretending you're a tenderfoot, you, you damn spy. Come on, Joe. He turned to ride on, and Joe, with a slinking sideways look at Patches, started to follow. Again, Patches called. Wait, Joe. His voice is almost pleading. Can't you understand, Joe? Come with me. Don't be a dog for any man. Let me give you a chance. Be a man, Joe. For God's sakes, be a man. Come with me. Well, growled Nick to his follower as Patch is finished. Are you coming, or have I got to go and get you? With a sickened, hangdog look, Joe mumbled something and rode after his master. As they disappeared up the trail, Nick called back. I'll get you yet, you sneaking spy. Not after you've had time to think it over, answered Patch cheerfully. It would interfere too much with your real business. I'll leave your gun at the gate on the old corral up the wash. Goodbye, Joe. For a few minutes longer, the strange man stood in the glade listening to the vanishing sounds of their going, while that mirthless, self-mocking smile curled his lips. Poor devil, he muttered sadly, as he turned at last to make his way back to his horse. Poor Joe. I know just how he feels. It's hard. It's beastly hard to break away. I'm afraid I've made trouble for you, sir. Patches said ruefully to the dean as he briefly related the incident to his employer and to Phil that afternoon. I'm sorry. I really didn't stop to think about it. Trouble, retorted the dean, his eyes twinkling his approval while Phil laughed joyously. Why, man, we've been praying for trouble with that damned tally-hole mountain outfit. You're a plumb wonder, young man, but... 
What in thunder was you aiming to do with that ornery Yockby Joe, if he took you up on your fool proposition? Really, to tell the truth, murmured Patches, I don't exactly know. I fancied the experiment would be interesting, and I was so sorry for the poor chap that I... He stopped shamefaced to join in on the laugh. But later, the dean and Phil talked together privately, with the result that during the day that followed, as Patches and his teacher rode the range together, the pupil found revolver practice added to his studies. The art of drawing and shooting a six-gun with quickness and certainty was often a useful part of the cowboy's training. That's what Phil explained. In the case, for instance, of a mix-up with a bad steer when your horse falls or something like that, you know. End of chapter 9. Chapter 10. As the remaining weeks of the summer passed, Patches spent the days riding the range with Phil, and under the careful eye of that experienced teacher, made rapid progress in the work he had chosen to master. The man's intense desire to succeed, his quick intelligence with his instinct for acting without hesitation, and his reckless disregard for personal injury, together with his splendid physical strength, led him to a mastery of the details of a cowboy's work with remarkable readiness. Occasionally, the two cross-triangle riders saw the men from Tally Holt Mountain sometimes merely sight them in the distance and again meet them face to face at some watering place or on the range. When it happened that Nick Cambert was thus forced to keep up a show of friendly relations with the Cross Triangle, the few commonplaces of the country were exchanged, but always the Tally Holt man addressed his words to Phil, and, save for some surly looks, ignored the foreman's companion. He had evidently, as Patch had said that he would, come to realize that he could no more afford to arouse the cattlemen to action against him as he would have certainly have done had he attempted to carry out his threat to get the man who had so humiliated him. But Patch's strained interest in Yawk by Joe in no way lessened. Always he had a friendly word for the poor unfortunate, and sought persistently to win the weakling's friendship. And Phil saw this wondering, but held his peace. Frequently Kitty Reed, sometimes alone, often with the other members of the Reed household, came across the big meadow to spend an evening at the neighboring ranch. Sometimes Phil and Patches stopped at the Pothook S. home ranch at the close of a day for a drink at the windmill pump, would linger a while to chat with Kitty, who would come from the house to greet them. And now and then Kitty, out for a ride on midnight, would chance to meet the two cross-triangle men on the range, and so would accompany them for an hour or more. And thus the acquaintance between Patches and the girl grew into friendship. For Kitty loved to talk with this man of the things that play so large a part in that life which so appealed to her. And with Phil's ever ready and hearty endorsement of Patches, she felt safe in permitting the friendship to develop. And Patches, quietly observing, with now and then a conversational experiment, at which game he was adept, came to understand almost as well as if he'd been told. Phil's love for Kitty and her attitude towards the cowboy, her one-time schoolmate and sweetheart. Many times when the three were together, and the talk guided by Kitty, led far from Phil's world, the cowboy would sit a silent listener, until Patches skillfully turned the current back to the land of Granite Mountain and the life in which Phil was so vital a part of. In the home life, at the Cross Triangle too, Patches gradually came to hold his particular place. His cheerful helpfulness and gentle, never-failing courtesy, no less than the secret pain and sadness that sometimes, at some chance remark, drove the light from his eyes and brought that wistful look into his eyes that won Miss Baldwin's heart. Many an evening, under the walnut trees, with Stella and Phil, and Curly, and Bob, and little Billy near, the dean was led by the rare skill and ready wit of Patches to open the book of his kindly philosophy, 
as he talked of the years that had passed. And sometimes Patches himself, yielding to temptations offered by the dean, would speak in such vain that the older man came to understand that this boy, as he so often called him, had somewhere, somehow, already experienced that Gethsemane which sooner or later, the dean maintained, leaves its shadow upon us all. The cowboys, for his quick wit and genuine appreciation of their skill and knowledge, as well as his unassuming courage, and hearty good nature, and ready laugh, took them into their fellowship without question and reserve. While little Billy, loyal ever to his ideal, the wild horse Phil, found a large place in his boyish heart for the tenderfoot, who was so ready always to recognize superior wisdom and authority. So the stranger found his place among them, and in finding it, found also, perhaps, that which he most sorely needed. When rodeo time came, Patches was given a string of horses, and thus the hard, grilling work that followed took his place among the riders. There was no leisurely roaming around the range now, with only an occasional short dash after some animal that needed the iron or some dope can. But systematically and thoroughly, the thirty or forty cowboys covered the country, mountain and mesa and flat and wash and timbered ridge and rocky pass for many miles in every direction. In this section of great western cattle country, at the time of my story, the roundups were cooperative. Each of the several ranchers whose cattle, marked by the owner's legally recorded brand, ranged over a common district that was defined only by natural boundaries, was represented in the rodeo by one or two or more of his cowboys, the number of his riders being relative to the number of cattle marked by his iron. This company of riders, each with from three to five saddle horses in a string, would assemble at one of the ranches participating in the rodeo. From the center, they would work until a circle of country within riding distance was covered, the cattle gathered and worked, or in other words, sorted, and the animals belonging to the various owners disposed of as the representatives were instructed to by their employers. Then the rodeo would move to another ranch, and would so continue until the entire district of many miles was covered. The owner, or the foreman of each ranch, who was in charge of the rodeo, as long as the riders worked in his territory. When the company moved to the next point, this leader took his place in the ranks, and cheerfully received his orders from some comrade who, the day before, had been willingly obedient to him. There was little place in the rodeo for weak, incompetent, and untrustworthy men. Each owner, from his long experience and knowledge of men, sent as his representative the most skillful and conscientious riders that he could secure. To make a top hand at the rodeo, a man needed to be, in the truest sense, a man. Before daylight, the horse wrangler had driven in the saddle band and the men with nose bags fashioned from grain sacks were out in the corral to give the hard-working animals their feed of barley. The gray quiet of the early dawn was rudely broken by the sounds of the crowding, jostling, and kicking, squealing band mingled with the merry voices of men, with now and then a shout of anger or warning as the cowboys moved here and there among their restless four-footed companions and always... Like a deep undertone came the sound of trampling iron-shod hooves. Before the sky had changed to crimson and gold, the call sounded from the ranch house. Come and get it! And laughing and joking in friendly rivalry, the boys rushed to breakfast. It was no dainty meal of toast or light cereals that these hardy ones demanded, but huge cuts of fresh-killed beef with slabs of bread piles of potatoes and stacks of hot cakes and buckets of coffee and whatever else the hard working Chinaman could lay his hands on to satisfy their needs. As soon as each man reached the utmost limit of his capacity, 
he left the table without formality and returned to the corral where, with Riata or persuasion, as the case demanded, he selected from his individual string of horses his first mount for the day. By the time the sun was beginning to gild the summit of old granite mountain, the castle-like walls and touch with glorious colors the peaks of the neighboring sentinel hills the last rider had saddled, and the company was mounted and ready for their foreman's word. Then, to the music of jingling spurs and tinkling bridle chains, squeaking saddle leather and the softer swish and rustle and flap of chaps, the rommels and riatas, they rode forward, laughing and joking, still with now and then a roaring chaos of shouting comment or with wild yells, as some half-broken horse gave an exhibition of his prowess in a mad effort to unseat his grinning rider. Soon the leader would call the name of a cowboy, known to be familiar in particular with that part of the country, which was to be the scene of that day's work, and telling him to take two or three men with him, as the case may be, would direct him to ride over a certain section, indicating the assigned territory by its natural marks of valley, or flat, or wash, or ridge, and designated the point where the cattle would first be brought together. The cowboy named would rein his horse astride from the main company, calling the men of his choice as he did so, and a moment later with his companions would be lost from sight. A little farther, and again, the foreman would name a rider, telling him to pick his men, would assign them to another section of the district to be covered, and this cowboy with his chosen mates would ride away. These smaller groups would, in their turn, separate, and thus the entire company of riders would open up like a huge fan to sweep the countryside. It was no mere pleasure canter along smoothly graded girdled paths or well-kept country highways that these men rode. From roughest rock-strewn mountainsides and tree-cad slopes, with boulder-piled watercourses and tangled brush, they must drive in the scattered cattle. At reckless speed, as their quarry ran and turned and dodged, they must hesitate at nothing. Climbing to the tops of the hills and scrambling Cat Lake to the ragged crests of the ridges, sliding down to the bluffs, and then jumping deep canyons, leaping brush and boulders, twisting, dodging through the timber, they must go as fast as the strength and endurance of their mounts would permit. And so... Gradually, as the sun climbed higher above the peaks and crags of old granite, the great living fan of men and horses closed, and the courses of widely scattered riders leading them, with the cattle they had found to the giving point. And then the cattle, urged by the act of horsemen, came streaming from the different sections to form the herd, and the quiet of the great range was broken by the bawling of confused and frightened calves, the lowing of the anxious mothers, and the shrill, long-drawn call of the steers, and the deep bellowing of the bulls, as the animals so rudely driven from their peaceful feeding grounds moved restlessly into the circle of darting cowboys, whose cows found their calves, and the monarchs of the range met in fierce combat. A number of the men, those whose mounts most needed the rest, were left to hold the herd, or perhaps to move it quietly on to some other point, while the others again were sent out to cover another section of territory, including in that day's riding. As the hours passed, and the great fan of the horsemen opened and closed, sweeping the cunt cattle scattered over the range into the steady growing herd, the rodeo moved gradually towards chosen open flat or valley that afforded a space large enough for the operations that followed the work of the gathering. At this rodeo ground, a man would be waiting with fresh mounts for the riders and sometimes with lunch. Quickly, those whose names were called by the foreman would change their saddles from dripping exhausted horses to fresh animals from their individual strings, snatch a hasty lunch, often beaten in the saddle, and then in their turn would hold the cattle while their companions followed their example. Then came the fast, hot work of parting the cattle. The representatives from one of the ranches interested 
would ride in among the cattle held by the circle of cowboys and following their instructions would select such animals bearing their employer's mark as were wanted cutting them out and passing them through the line of guarded riders to be held in a separate group when the representatives of one owner had finished they were followed by the men who rode for some other outfit and so on until the task of parting was finished as the afternoon sun moved steadily towards the skyline of the western hills the tireless activity of men and horses continued the cattle as the mounted men moved among them drifted about crowding and jostling in uneasy discontentment with sometimes an indistinct protest and many attempts to escape by the more restless and venturesome when an animal was singled out the parting horses chosen and prized for their quickness dashed here and there through the herd with fierce leaps and furious rushes stopping short in a terrific sprint to whirl and flash like charge in another direction as the quarry dodged and doubled and now and then an animal would succeed for a moment in passing the guard line only to be brought back after a short sharp chase by the nearest cowboy from the rodeo ground where for long years the grass had been trampled out the dust lifted by the trampling of thousands of hooves and dense choking cloud and heavy with the pungent odor of warm cattle and the smell of sweaty horses rising high into the clear air could be seen for miles away while the mingling voices of the bellowing and bawling herd with now and then the shrill piercing yells of the cowboys could be heard almost as far when this part of the work was over and some of the riders set out to drive the cattle selected to the distant home ranch corrals while others of the company remained to brand the calves and start the animals that were to have their freedom until the next rodeo time came back to the open range. And so at last, often, not until the stars were out, the riders would dismount at the home corral ranch, then and at that time that was the center of their operations, or perhaps at some rodeo camping ground. At supper, the day's work was reviewed with many a laugh and jest of pointed comment and then those whose horses needed attention because of saddle sores or it might be because of some injury from a fall on the rocks or busied themselves at the corral while others met for a friendly game of cards or talked or yarned over a restful pipe or cigarette and then bed and blankets and all too soon the revile sounded by the beating hooves of the saddle band as the wrangler drove them in announced the beginning of another day not infrequently there were accidents from falling horses from angry bulls from ill-tempered steers or excited cows or perhaps from a careless handling of a rope in a critical moment horses were killed men with broken limbs or with bodies busted and crushed were forced to drop out and many a strong horseman who rode forth in the morning to the day's work laughing and jesting with his mates had been borne by his grave and silent comrades to some quiet resting place to wait in long dreamless sleep the morning of that last great rodeo which we are all told shall gather us all day after day as patches rode with these hardy men phil watched him finding himself and winning his place among the cowboy. They did not fail, as they said, to try him out. Nor did Phil, in these trials, attempt any way to assist his pupil. But the men learned very quickly, as Curly had learned at the time of Patch's introduction, that while the new man was always ready to laugh with them when a joke was turned against him, there was a line beyond which it did not go well. In the work... He was, of course, assigned only to such parts as did not require the skill and knowledge of long training and experience. But he did all that was given to him with such readiness and skill, thanks to Phil's teaching that the men wondered. In this, together with his inevitable ability in the art of defending himself, and the story of his strange coming to the cross triangle caused not a little talk, 
with many and varied opinions as to who he was and what it was that had brought him among them. Strangely enough, very few believed that Patch's purpose in working for a cowboy for the dean was simply just to earn an honest livelihood. They felt instinctively, as in fact did fail in the dean, that there was something more beneath it all than just some commonplace. Nick Cambert, who, with Yak by Joe, rode in the rodeo, carefully avoided the stranger. But Patches, by his persistent, friendly interest in the Tally Holt man's follower, added greatly to the warmth of the discussions and conjectures regarding himself. The rodeo had reached the Pothook S Ranch, with Jim Reed in charge, when the incident occurred, which still further stimulated the various opinions and suggestions as to the new man's real character and mission. They were working the cattle that day on the rodeo ground just outside the home corral ranch. Phil and Curly were cutting out some cross-triangle steers when the riders who were holding the cattle saw them separate a nine-month-old calf from the herd and start it, not towards the cattle they had already caught out, but towards the corral. Instantly, everybody knew what had happened. The cowboy nearest the gate did not need Phil's word to open it for his neighbor next in line to drive the calf inside. Not a word was said until the calves to be branded were also driven into the corral. And then Phil, after a moment's talk with Jim Reed, rode up to Nick Cambert, who was sitting on his horse a little apart from the group, intensely interested cowboys. The cross-triangle foreman's tone was curt. I reckon I'll have to trouble you to vent your brand on that cross-triangle calf, Nick. The Tally Holt mountain man made no shallow precedence that he did not understand. Not by a damn sight, he returned roughly. I ain't raising calves for Bill Baldwin, and I happen to know what I'm talking about this trip. That's a four-bar M calf, and I branded him myself over in horse wash before he left the cow. Some of your punchers are too damned handy with their running irons, Mr. Wild Horse Phil. For a moment, Phil looked at the man. While Jim Reed moved his horse nearer, and the cowboys waited breathlessly. Then, without taking his eyes from the tally holt man's face, Phil called out sharply, Patches, come here. There was a sudden movement among the riders and a subdued murmur as Patches rode forward. Is that the calf you told me about in the corral, Patches? As asked Phil when the man was beside him. Yes, sir. That's him over there by that brindle cow. Patches indicated the animal in question. And you put your iron on him? asked Phil, still watching Nick. I did, returned Patches coldly. Tell us about it, directed the dean's foreman. And Patches obeyed, briefly. It was that day you sent me to fix up the fence on the southwest corner of the big pasture. I saw a bunch of cattle a little away outside the fence and went to look over there. This calf was following a cross-triangle cow. Are you sure? Yes, I am. I watched them for half an hour. What was in the bunch? There's four steers, a pothook S bull, five cows, and this calf. There were three five-bar cows, one diamond and a half and one cross-triangle. The calf went to the cross triangle cow every time. And besides, he is marked just like his mother. I saw her again this afternoon while we were working the cattle. Phil nodded. I know her. Jim Reed was watching Patches keenly with a quiet look now and then at Nick. The cowboys were murmuring among themselves. Pretty good work for a tenderfoot. Tenderfoot hell. They got Nick this trip. Got nothing. Can't you see it's a frame up? Phil spoke to Nick. Well, 
Are you satisfied? Will you venture, Bran? The big man's face was distorted with passion. Vent nothing, he roared. On the word of a damned squeaking tenderfoot, I... He stopped as patches before Phil could check the movement pushed close to his side. In the sudden stillness, the new man's cool, deliberate voice sounded clearly. I am positive that you made a mistake when you put your iron on that calf, Mr. Cambert. And he added slowly, as though with the kindest possible intention, I am sure you can safely take my word for it without further question. For a moment, Nick glared at Patches speechlessly. And then, to the amazement of every cowboy in the corral, the big man mumbled a surly something and took down his riata to rope the calf and disclaim his ownership of the animal. Jim Reed shook his head in puzzled doubt. The cowboys were clearly divided. He's too good of a hand for a tenderfoot, argued one. He carried that off like an old timer. Taint like Nick, though, to lay down so easy for anyone, added another. Oh, Nick's on to something about Mr. Patches that we ain't next to, insisted the third. Or else we've all been strung along like a bunch of suckers, offered still another. You boys just hold your horses and ride easy, said Curly. My money is still on honorable Patches. And Bob added his loyal support with his cheerful, Count me in on that too. It all looks straight enough, Jim Reed admitted to the dean that evening. But I can't get away from the notion that there's some sort of understanding between your man and that damn Tally Holt mountain thief. It looked like it was all too quiet and easy somehow, like it had been planned beforehand. The dean laughed and told his neighbor that he was right, that there was an understanding between Patches and Nick, and then explained by relating how Patches had met that Tally Holt man up there by that spring. When the dean had finished, the big cowman asked several very suggestive questions. How did the dean know that the Patches story was anything more than a clever arranged tale? invented for the express purpose of allaying any suspicion as to his true relationship with Nick. If Patch's character was so far above suspicion, why did he always dodge any talk about when it comes to his past? Was it necessary or usual for men to keep so closed mouth about themselves? What did the dean, for, or anyone else for that matter, really know about this man who had appeared so strangely from nowhere and had given a name even that was so plainly a ridiculous invention. The dean must remember that the suspicion as to the source of Nick's two rapidly increasing herds had so far been directly wholly against Nick himself, and that the owner of the four bar M iron was not altogether a fool. It was quite time, Reed argued, for Nick to cease his personal activities and trust the actual work of branding to some confederate whose movements would not be so closely questioned. In short, Reed had been expecting some stranger to seek a job with some of the ranches that were in position to contribute to the Tally Holt Mountain outfit, and, for his part, he would await developments before coming too enthusiastic about honorable patches, all of which the good dean found very hard to answer. But look here, Jim, he protested. Don't you go making it unpleasant for the boy. Whatever you think, you don't know any more than the rest of us. If we're guessing on one side, you're guessing on the other. I admit that what you say sounds reasonable, but dang it, I like Patches. As for his name, well, we didn't used to go so much on names in this country, you know. The boy may have some good reason for not talking about himself. Just give him a square chance, and don't be putting no burrs under his saddle blanket, that's all I'm asking. 
Jim laughed. The speech was so characteristic of the dean, and Jim Reed loved his old friend and neighbor, as all men did for being, as was commonly said, so easy. Oh, don't worry, Will, he answered. I'm not going to start nothing. If I should happen to be right about Mr. Honorable Patches, he's exactly where we want him. I propose to keep an eye on him, that's all. And I think you and Phil had better do the same. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 As the fall rodeo swept on its way over the wide ranges, the reluctant bent bits of summer passed, and the hints of a coming winter began to appear. The yellow glory of the goldenrod and the gorgeous banks of color on the sunflower flats faded to the earthly russet and brown, and the white cups of jimson reed were broken and lost, and the dainty pepper grass and the thin-leafed gamma grass and the heavier-bladed bare grass of the great pasture lands were dry and tawny and the broomweed that had toughed the rolling hills were brighter with green. At the touch of the first frost turned a dull and somber gray, while the very beauties of the valley meadow became even as the dead and withering leaves of the dean's walnut trees that, in falling, left the wide-spreading limbs and branches so bare. Then the rodeo and the shipping were over, the weeks of the late fall range riding were past, and it was winter. From skyline to skyline the world was white, save for the dark pines upon the mountain sides, and the brighter cedars and junipers upon the hills and ridges, and the living green of the oak bush that, where all else was covered with snow, gave the cattle their winter feed. More than ever now, with the passing of the summer and fall, Kitty longed for the stirring life that, in some measure, had won her from the scenes of her home and from her homeland friends. The young woman's friendship with Patches, made easy by the fact that the bald ones had taken him so wholly into their hearts, served to keep alive her memories of that world to which she was sure he belonged, and such memories did not tend to make Kitty more content and happy in Williamson Valley. Toward Phil, Kitty was unchanged. Many times her heart called for him so instantly that she wished that she had never learned to know any other life than that life to which they were both been born to. If only she had not spent those years away from home, she often told herself, it would all be so different. She could have been happy with Phil, very happy, if only she had remained in his world. But now, now she was afraid. Afraid for him as well as for herself. Her friendship with Patches had, in so many ways, emphasized the things that stood between her and the man whom, had not been for her education, she would have so accepted gladly as her mate. Many times when the three were together, and Kitty had led the talk far from the life with which the cowboy was familiar, the young woman was forced, against the wish of her heart, to make comparisons. Kitty did not understand that Phil, unaccustomed to speaking of things outside of his work and his life interests of his associates, and timid always to express his own real thoughts, found it very hard to reveal the real wealth of his mind to her when she assumed so readily that he knew nothing beyond his horses and cattle. But Patches, to whom Phil had learned to speak with little reserve, understood. And knowing that the wall which the girl felt separated her from the cowboy had built almost wholly of her own assumptions, Patches never lost an opportunity to help the young woman to fuller acquaintance with the man whom she thought she had known since childhood. During the long winter months, many an evening at the Cross Triangle, at the Reed home, or perhaps at some neighborhood party or dance, afforded Kitty opportunities for a fuller understanding of Phil, but resulted only in establishing a closer friendship with Patches. Then the spring came. The snow melted, the rains fell, 
The washes and creeks, channels were filled with roaring floods. Hill and ridges and mountain slopes and mesas awoke to new life that was swelling in every branch and leaf and blade, and the beauties of the valley meadow appeared again in fresh, fragrant lovingness. While from fence post and brush and grassy bank and new leaf trees the larks and mocking birds and doves voiced their glad return. And with the spring came a guest to the Cross Triangle Ranch, another stranger. Patches had been riding the drift fence, and as he made his way towards the home ranch in late afternoon, he looked a very different man from the Patches who, several months before, had been rescued by Kitty from humiliating experience from that same fence. The fact that he was now riding stranger, the big bay with the blazed face more than anything else, perhaps, marked the change that came to the man whom the horse had so viciously tested on that day when they began together their education and work on the Cross Triangle Ranch. No one, meeting the cowboy, who handled his powerful and wildly spirited mount with such easy confidence and skill, would have identified him with the white-faced and well-tailored gentleman who Phil had met on the Divide. The months of active outdoor life had given his tall body a lithe and supple strength that was revealed in his every movement, while wind and sun had stained his skin that deep tan which marks those who face the elements every waking hour. From tinkling brindle chains and jingling spurs to the coiled riata, his equipment showed the unmistakable marks of use. His fringe chaps, shaped by so many days in the saddle, to his long legs expressed experience, while his broad hat, soiled by sweat and dust, had acquired individually, and his very jumper, once blue, now faded and patched, disclaimed the tenderfoot. Riding for a little way along the top of the ridge that forms the western edge of the valley, Patches looked down upon the red roofs of the buildings of the home ranch and smiled as he thought of the welcome that awaited him there at the close of his day's work. The dean and Stella, with little Billy and Phil and the others of the home circle, had grown very dear to this strong man of whom they still knew nothing. And great as was the change in his outward appearance and manner, the man himself knew that there were other changes as great. Honorable Patches had not only acquired a name and a profession, but in acquiring them he had gained something of much greater worth to himself. And so he was grateful to those who, taking him on trust, had helped him more than they knew. He had left the ridge and was halfway across the flat towards the corral when little Billy, spurred old Shep, in desperate energy, rode wildly out to meet him. As the lad approached, he greeted his big friend with a shrill boyish shouts, and Patches answered with a cowboy yell which did credit to his training, while Stranger, with a wild preliminary bound into the air, proceeded with many weird contortions to give an exhibition which fairly expressed his sediments. Little Billy grinned with delight. Yip, yip, yippee! He shrilled for Stranger's benefit, and then, as the big horse continued his manifestations, the lad added the cowboy's encouraging admonishment to the rider. Stay on him, Patches! Stay with him! Patches laughingly stayed with him. What you aiming to do there, partner? He added good-naturedly when Stranger at last consented to keep two feet on the ground at the same time. You trying to get me piled up? Oh, shucks, retorted the youngster admiringly. I don't reckon anything could pile you now. I come out to tell you that we got company he added, as side by side they rode towards the corrals. Patches was properly surprised. Company? he exclaimed. Little Billy grinned proudly. Yep, he's a man from way back east somewhere. Uncle Will brought him out from town. They just got here after dinner. I don't guess he's ever seen a ranch before, but gee, won't we have fun with him? Patch's face was grave as he listened. How do you know he's from back east, Billy? He asked, concealing his anxious interest with a smile at his little comrade. 
I heard Uncle Will tell Phil and Kitty that. Oh, Kitty at the house too, is she? Billy giggled. She and Phil's up and off somewhere riding together most all day. They just got back a little while ago. They was talking with the company when I left. Phil saw you when you was back there on the ridge and I come out to tell you. Phil and Kitty were walking towards their horses well, which were standing near the corral fence as Patches and little Billy came up through the gate. The boy dropped from his saddle and ran on into the house to tell his Aunt Stella that Patches had come, leaving Shep to be looked after by whoever volunteered the service. It was one of little Billy's humiliations that he was not yet tall enough to saddle or bridle his own horse, and the man tactfully saw to it that his mount was always ready in the morning and properly released at night without any embarrassing comments on the subject. Pat checked his horse and, without dismounting, greeted his friends. "'You not going?' he said to Kitty, with a note of protest in his voice. "'I ain't seen you for a week. It's not fair for Phil to take advantage of his position and send me off somewhere alone while he spends his time riding over the country with you.' They laughed at him as he sat there on the big bay, hat in hand, looking down at their upturned faces, with the intimate, friendly interest of an older brother. Patches noticed that Kitty's eyes were bright with excitement, and Phil's were twinkling with suppressed merriment. "'I must go, Patches,' said the young woman. "'I ought to have been gone a couple hours ago, but I was so interested that the time was slipping away before I realized it.' "'We got company,' explained Phil, looking at Patches and deliberately closing one eye the one that Kitty could not see. A distinguished guest, if you please. I'll loan you a clean shirt for supper. That is, if Mother lets you eat at the same table with him. Phil, how can you? protested Kitty. The two men laughed, but Phil fancied that there was a mere hint of anxiety in Patch's face as the man on the horse said, Little Billy broke the news to me. Who is he? He's a friend of Judge Morris and Prescott, answered Phil. The judge asked Uncle Will to take him on the ranch for a while. He and the judge were... Kitty interrupted with enthusiasm. It's a professor. His name is Park Hill Patches. The famous professor of anesthetics, you know. Advert Charles Park Hill. And he's going to spend the summer in Williamson Valley. Isn't it wonderful? Phil saw a look of relief in his friend's face as Patches answered Kitty with sympathetic interest. It certainly will be a great pleasure, Ms. Reed, especially for you to have one so distinguished for his scholarship in the neighborhood. Is Professor Parkhill visiting Arizona for his health? Something in Patches' voice caused Phil to turn hastily aside. But Kitty who was thinking how perfectly Patches understood her, noticed nothing in his grave tones save his usual courteous deference. Partly because of his health, she answered, but he's going to prepare a series of lectures, I understand. He says that in the crude, uncivilized mentalities of our... Here he is now, interrupted Phil, as the distinguished guest of the cross triangle appeared, coming slowly towards them. Professor Everett Charles Parkhill looked the part of which, from his birth, he had been assigned by his overcultured parents. His slender body, with its narrow shoulders and sunken chest, frail as it was, seemed almost too heavy for his feeble legs. His thin face, bloodless and shallow, with a sparse, daintily trimmed beard and weak, watery eyes, was characteristic by a solemn and portentous gravity as though fully realizing the profound importance of his mission in life, he could prevent no trivial thought to enter his bald, dome-like head. One knew instinctively that, in all the forty-five to fifty years of his little life, no happiness or joy that had not been scientifically sterilized and certified had ever been permitted to stain his super-anesthetic soul. 
As he came forward, he gazed at the long-limbed man on the big bay horse with curious eagerness, as though he were considering a strange and interesting creature that could scarcely be held to belong to the human race. "'Professor Parkhill,' said Phil coolly, "'you were saying that you had never met a genuine cowboy in his native haunt. "'Well, permit me to introduce a typical specimen, Mr. Honorable Patches.' "'Patches?' This is Professor Parkhill. Phil, murmured Kitty, how could you? The professor was gazing at Patches as though fascinated, and Patches, his weather-beaten face as grave as the face of a wooden Indian, stared back at the professor with a blank, open mouth and wide-eyed expression of rustic wonder that convulsed Phil and made Kitty turn away to hide a smile. Howdy! Proud to meet you, mister! drawled the typical specimen of a genuine cowboy. And then, as though he suddenly remembered his manners, he leapt to the ground and strode awkwardly forward, one hand outstretched in greeting, the other holding fast the stranger's bridle rein, while the horse danced and plunged about with reckless indifference to the plight intentions of his master. The professor backed fearfully away from the dangerous-looking horse and the formidable-appearing cowboy. Whereat Patches addressed Stranger with a roar of savage wrath. Whoa, you consternated, square-headed, stiff-legged, squinty-eyed, lop-eared, four-flusher, you! Whoa, I tell ya! Can't you see I be wantin' to shake hands with this here man who has the boss was introducing me to? Phil nearly choked. Kitty was looking unutterable things. They did not know that Patches was suffering from a reaction caused by the discovery that he had never before met Professor Parkhill. "'You see, mister,' he explained gravely, advancing again with stranger following nervously, "'this here fool horse ain't used to strangers know how, especially them as don't look as you might say just natural-like.' He finished with a sheepish grin as he grasped the visitor's soft little hand and pumped it up down with virile energy. And then, staring with wonder, at the distinguished representative of the highest culture, he said, Be you an honest-to-God professor? I've heard about such, but I ain't never seen one before. The little man hurriedly replied, but with timid pride, Certainly, sir, yes, certainly. Well, you be, explained the cowboy, as though overcome by his nearness to such dignity. Well, excuse me for asking, but... If you don't mind now, what be a professor of? The other answered with more courage, as though his soul found strength at the very word. Aesthetics. The cowboy's jaw dropped and his mouth opened in gaping awe, and he looked from the professor to Phil and Kitty, as if silent appearing to them to verify this startling thing of which he heard. You don't say he murmured at last with innocent admiration. Well, now, to think of a little feller like you being all that. But just what be them th things aesthetics of which you're professor of, if you don't mind me asking? The distinguished scholar answered promptly in his best platform voice. It's the science or doctrine of the nature of beauty and of judgment of taste. At this, stranger... With a snort of fear, stood straight up on his hind legs, and Professor Parkhill scuttled to a position of safety behind Phil. "'Excuse me, folks,' said Patches. "'I'm just naturally obliged to tend to this here thing what thinks he's a horse. Come along, you ornery, pigeon-toed, knock-kneed, suede-back, woolly-haired excuse, you. You ain't got no manners more than a measly coyote.' The famous professor of aesthetics stood with Phil and Kitty, watching Patches as that gentleman reviled the dancing bay of the saddle and led him away through the corral to the gate leading into the meadow pasture. "'I beg your pardon,' murmured the visitor in his thin little voice, "'but what did you say that feller's name was?' "'Patches. Honorable Patches.' answered Phil. How strange, extraordinarily strange. I, 
I should be very interested to know something of his ancestry and, if possible, to trace the origin of such a particular name. Phil replied with exaggerated concerns. Oh, for heaven's sake, sir, don't, don't say anything about the man's name and his hearing. He, he's dangerous, you mean? Oh, he is. If he thinks anyone's making light of his name, you should ask some of the boys who've tried it. But, but I assure you, Mr. Acton, I had no thought of ridicule far from it. Oh, very, very far. Kitty was obliged to turn away as she arrived at the corral in time to meet Patch as he was returning. You ought to be ashamed, she scolded, but in spite of herself, her eyes were laughing. Yes, ma'am, said Patch as meekly, hat in hand. How could you do such a thing? she demanded. How could I help but to do it? How could you help it? Yeah, you saw how he looked at me. Really, Miss Reed, I couldn't bear to disappoint him such cruelty. Honestly, now, wasn't I exactly what he was expecting me to be? I think you should give me a compliment. I thought I did it quite well. But... He'll think you're nothing but a cowboy, she protested. Fine, retorted Patches quickly. I thank you, Miss Reed. That is most certainly the best compliment I have yet to receive. You're mocking me now, said Kitty, puzzled by his manner. No, I am not. I'm quite serious, he returned, but here he comes again. With your gracious permission, I'll make my exit, and please don't explain to the professor, or it would humiliate me, and think how it would shock and disappoint him. Lifting his saddle from the ground and starting towards the shed, he said in a louder tone, Sure, I won't forget, Miss Kitty, and you can tell your pa that that there bald-faced steer and his, which gived us the slip last rodeo time, is over in our big pasture. I sure seen him over there today. During the days immediately following their first meeting, Kitty passed many hours with Professor Parkhill. Phil and his cowboys were busy preparing for the spring rodeo. Miss Baldwin was wholly occupied with the ministering to the animal comforts of her earthly household. And the dean, most courteously and kind to his guest, managed nevertheless to think of some pressing business that demanded his immediate and personal attention whenever the visitor sought to engage him with conversation. The professor, quite naturally holding the cattleman to but a rude and illiterate wholly manneristic creature, but little superior in his intellectual and spiritual powers to his own beasts, sought merely to investigate the dean's mental works with so little regard for the dean's feeling as a biologist would feel towards a bug. The dean confided to Phil and Patches one day when he was escaping to the blacksmith shop where the men were shoeing their horses that the professor had was harmlessly insane. Just think, he exploded, of the poor little fellow living in Chicago for three years and never once going out to the stockyards even. It remained, though, for Kitty, the only worshipper of the professor's gods in Williamson Valley, to supply that companionship which seemed so necessary to even those whose souls were so far removed from material wants. In short, as little Billy put it with a boy's irreverence, Kitty rode herd on that professor, and strangely enough to them all, Kitty seemed to like the job either because of her friendship with Patches, which had come to mean a great deal to Kitty, outweighed her respect and admiration for the distinguished object of his fun, or because she waited for some opportunity to make the revelation a punishment to the offender. The young woman did not betray the real character of the cowboy to the stranger. And the professor, thanks to Phil's warning, not only refrained from investigating the name of Patches, but carefully avoided Patches himself. In the meantime, the typical specimen was forced to take a small part in the table talk lest he betray himself. So marked was this that 
Miss Baldwin one day, not understanding, openly chided him for being so glum. Whereon the dean, to whom Phil had thoughtfully explained, teased the deceiver unmercifully with many a laughing alleged reasons for his grouch, while Curly and Bob attributed their comrade's manner to the embarrassing presence of the stranger, grinned sympathetically, and the professor himself unconsciously agreed with the cowboys with kindly condescension, tried to make the victim of his august superiority at much at ease as possible, which naturally, for the dean and Phil, added not a little to the situation. Then the spring rodeo took the men far from home ranch, and for several weeks the distinguished guest of the Cross Triangle was left almost wholly to the guardianship of the young woman who lived on the other side of the big meadow. It was the last day of the rodeo when Phil rode to the home ranch late in the afternoon to consult with the dean about the shipping. Patches and the cowboys who were to help in the long drive to the railroad were at Tolly with the cattle. While the cowboys were finishing their early breakfast the next morning, the foreman returned and Patches knew, almost before Phil spoke, that something had happened. They shouted their greetings as he approached, but he had no smile for their cheery reception, nor did he answer, until he had ridden close to the group about the campfire. And then, with a short, "'Morning, boys,' he dismounted and stood with the bridle reins in his hands. At his manor, a hush fell over the little company, and they watched him curiously. "'No breakfast, Sam.' He said shortly to the Chinaman, just a cup of coffee. Then to the cowboys. You fellows saddle up and get that bunch of cattle to moving. We'll load at Skull Valley. Sam brought his coffee and he drank it as he stood, while the men hurriedly departed for their horses. Patches was the last to go. Paused a moment, as though to speak, but Phil prevented him with a gruff order. Get a move on, Patches. Those cars will be there long before we are. And Patches, seeing the man's face dark and drawn with pain, moved away without a word. Great snakes, softly ejected Curly in a few moments later, as Patches stooped to take his saddle from where it lay on the ground beside Curly's. What you reckon's eating the boss? Him and the Dean couldn't have mixed it up last night, could they? You reckon the Dean crawled on for something? Patches shook his head with a search me, partner, as he turns to his horse. Something's happened for sure, muttered the other, busy with his saddle blanket. Suffering cats, but I felt like he is pouring a bucket of ice water down my back. He drew the clinch tight with a vigorous jerk that brought a grunt of protest from his mount. That's right, he continued to dress the horse. You hump yourself and swell up and grunt, damn you. You ought to be thankful that you ain't nothing but a horse, no how. Ain't no feeling except what's in your belly. He dropped the heavy stirrup with a vicious slap and swung to his saddle. If Phil's a-gonna keep up that way, he's starting. We'll sure have a pleasant little old ride to Skull Valley. But I wish I was a professor of them there aesthetics or something nice and gentle-like just for today anyhow. Patches laughed. Think you'd qualify, Curly? The cowboy grinned as they rode together. So far as I've noticed, the main part of the work I could. The shade of them walnut trees at the home ranch or that pothook ass front porch, and a nice easy rocking chair with fat cushions, and maybe the buckboard once in a while with Kitty to do the driving. Say, this has been some little rodeo, ain't it? I ain't got a hoss in my string that can more than stand up and honest to God patches. I'm just corns all over. How's your saddle feeling this morning? Oh, it's got corns too, admitted patches, but there's Phil. We better get doing some riding. All that day Phil kept to himself, speaking to his companions only when speech could not be avoided, and then with the fewest possible words. That night, he left the company as soon as he had finished his supper and went off somewhere alone, and Patches heard him finding his bed, 
long after the other members of the outfit were sound asleep. The following morning, through the trying work of loading the cattle, the young foreman was so little like himself that, had it not been that his men were nearly all old-timers and boyhood friends who had known him all his life, there surely would have been a mutiny. It was late in the afternoon when the last reluctant steer was prodded and pushed up the timbered runway from the pens and crowded into the car. Curly and Bob were going with the cattle train. The others would remain at Skull Valley until morning, when they would start for their widely separated homes. Phil announced that he was going to the home ranch that night. You can make it home sometime tomorrow, Patches, he finished, when he had said his goodbye to the little group of men with whom he had lived and worked in close intimacy over the long weeks of the rodeo. He reined his horse about even as he spoke and set out on his long ride. The cross triangle foreman was beyond hearing of the cowboys when Patches overtook him. Do you mind if I go back to the cross triangle with you tonight, Phil? The cowboy asked quietly. Phil checked his horse and looked at his friend a moment before without answering. Then, in a kindlier tone that he had used in the past two days, he said, You better stay here with the boys and get your night's rest, Patches. You've had a hard spell of it this rodeo, and yesterday and today haven't been exactly easy. Shipping is always hell, even when everybody is in good humor, he smiled grimly. Well, if you don't object, I'd really like to go, said Patch simply. But your horse is as tired as you ought to be, protested Phil. I'm riding stranger, you know, the other answered. To which Phil replied tensely, Well, let's be riding then. The cowboys who had been watching the two men looked at each other in amazement as Phil and Patches rode away together. Well, what do you make of that? It looks like Honorable Patches was next, commented another. Us old-timers ain't in it when it comes to associating with the boss, offered a third. You shut up on that line came sharply from Curly. Phil ain't turning us down for nobody. I reckon if Patches is fool enough to want to ride to the cross triangle tonight with Phil, he ain't got no reason for stopping him. If any of you punchers want to make the ride, the way's open, ain't it? Well, now don't you go on the prod, too, soothed the other. We wasn't mean of nothing again, Phil. Well, what's the matter with Patches? demanded the cross-triangle man whose heart was solely troubled by the mystery of his foreman's mood. Ain't nobody said that there's anything against the matter. Fact is, don't nobody know that there is anything. And, for some reason, Curly had no answer. Don't it just naturally beat thunder the way he's been caught up to that yeller dog of Yockby Joe? mused the other, encouraged by Curly's silence. Three or four of the boys told how they'd been seeing them off together off and on, but I didn't think nothing of it until I seen them myself when I was working over at Tally Holt. It was one evening after supper. I went down to the corral to fix up that Pedro's horse's back when I heard horses kind of low-like. I stopped a minute and then sort of eased along in the dark and run right into them where they were setting in the door of the saddle room cozy as you please. Yakpai sneaked away while I was getting the lantern and lighting it, but Patches, he just stayed and held the light for me while I was fixing old Pedro, just as if nothing had happened. Well, said Curly sarcastically, what had happened? I don't know, nothing, maybe. If Patches was that what some of you boys seem to be thinking, do you reckon he'd be a-riding for the cross triangle? demanded Curly. Well, he might, and he might not, retorted two or three at once. Nobody can't say nothing in case like that until there's a showdown, added one. I don't reckon the dean knows any more than the rest of us. Unless Patches is what some of the other boys are guessing, said another. Which means, 
finished Curly in a tone of disgust, that we've got to mill around the same old ring again. Come on, Bob, let's go see what they got for supper. That little engine will happen along directly or we'll be starting out hungry. Phil Acton was not ignorant of the different opinions that were held by the cattlemen regarding honorable patches, nor as the honorable foreman of the cross triangle could be he remained indifferent to them. During those first months of Patch's life on the ranch, when the cowboy's heart had so often been moved to pity for the stranger who had come to them apparently from some pain crisis in his life, he had laughed at the suspicions of his old friends and associates. But as the months passed, and Patches had so rapidly developed into a strong, self-reliant man, with a spirit of bold recklessness that had marked even among those hardy riders of the ranges, Phil forgot, in a measure, those characteristics that the strangers had shown at the beginning of their acquaintance. At the same time, the persistent suspicions of the cattlemen, together with Patch's curious and in a way secret interest in Joe, could not but have a deciding influence upon the young man who was responsible for the dean's property. It was inevitable, under the circumstances that Phil's attitude towards Patch's should change, even as the character of Patches himself had changed. While the foreman's manner of friendship and kindly regard remained so far unaltered, and while Phil still in his heart believed in his friend, and, as he would have said, would continue to back his judgment until the showdown, nevertheless that spirit of intimacy which had been marked those first days of their work together had gradually been lost to them. The cowboy no longer talked to his companion, as he had talked that day when they lay in the shade of the walnut tree of the tallyho, and during the following days of their riding range. He no longer admitted his friend into his inner life, as he had done that day when he told Patches the story of the wild stallion. And Patches, feeling the change, and unable to understand the reason for it, waited patiently for the time when the cloud that had fallen between them should lift. So they rode together that night, homeward bound at the end of a long, hard weeks of the radio, in the deepening gloom of the day's passing, in the hushed stillness of the wild land, under the wild sky where the starry sentinels' hosts were gathering for their ever-faithful watch. And, as they rode, their stirrups almost touching, each was alone in his own thoughts. Phil, still in the depths of his somber mood, brooded over his bitter trouble. Patches, sympathetically wondered, silently questioning, wished he could help. There are times when a man's very soul forces him to seek companionship. Alone in the night with this man of whom, even at the first moment of their meeting of the Divide, he had felt a strange sort of kinship. Phil found himself drifting far from the questions that had risen to mar the closeness of their intimacy. The work of the rodeo was over. His cowboy associates, with their suggestive talk, were far away. Under the influence of long, dark miles of that night, and the silent presence of his companion, the young man for the time being, was no longer the responsible foreman of the Cross Triangle Ranch. In all that vast and silent world there was, for Phil Acton, only himself, his trouble, and his friend. And so it came about, little by little, the young man told Patch the story of his dream, and of how it was now shattered and broken. Sometimes bitterly, as though he felt injustice, sometimes harshly, as though in contempt of some weakness of his own, was sentence broken by the pain he strove to subdue, with halting words and long silences, Phil told of his plans to rebuild the home of his boyhood and of restoring the business that, through the generosity of his father, had been lost. Of how, since his childhood almost, he had worked and saved to that end, and of his love for Kitty, which had been the very light of his dreams, and without which, for him, there was no purpose in dreaming. And the man who rode so closely beside him listened with a fuller interest and a deeper sympathy than Phil knew. And now, said Phil hopelessly, it's all over. I've sure come to the end of my string. 
Reed has put the outfit on the market. He's going to sell out and quit. Uncle Will told me night before last when I came home to see about the shipping. Reed's going to sell? exclaimed Patches, and there was a curious note in his voice which Phil did not hear. Neither did Phil see that his companion was smiling to himself under the cover of darkness. It's that damned Professor Parkhill that's brought it out, continued the cowboy bitterly. Ever since Kitty came home from the east, she's been discontent and dissatisfied with ranch life. That was all right when she went away, but when she came back, she discovered that I was nothing but a cowpuncher. She has been fair, though. She has tried to get back to where she was before she left, and I thought that I could win her back again in time. I was so sure of it that it never troubled me. You've seen how it was, and you've learned how she was always wanting the life that she learned to want while she was away, and the life that you came from, Patches. I have been mighty glad for your friendship with her, too, because I thought she would learn from you to a man that could have all that was worth having in that life and still be happy and content here. And she would have learned, I'm sure of it. She couldn't help but see it. But now that damned fool who knows no more of real manhood than I do of his profession has spoiled it all. I don't understand, Phil. What has Park Hill to do with Reed selling out? Why, don't you see it? Phil returned savagely. He's the supreme representative of the highest and high-browed culture, ain't he? He's a Lord High Admiral, Duke, or Pontificate of some sort in the world of loftiness thought, isn't he? He lives and moves and has his being in the lofty realms of pure spirituality, don't he? He's cultured and cultivated and spiritualized until he vibrates nothing but pure soul, whatever that means. And he's refined himself and mentally disciplined himself and soul dominated himself until there's not an ounce of red blood left in his carcass. Get him betwixt you and the sun after what he calls a dinner and you can see every material mouthful that he has disgraced himself by swallowing. He's not human, I tell you. He's only a kind of a he-ghost and ought to be fed on sterilized moonbeams and pasteurized sunlight. Amen, said Patches solemnly when Phil paused from lack of breath. But Phil, your eloquent description of his character does not explain how the he-ghost has to do with the sale of the pothook house outfit. Phil's voice again dropped into a hopeless key as he answered. You remember how, from the very first, Kitty well sort of worshipped him, don't you? You mean how he worshipped his aesthetics cult, don't you? Corrected Patch as quietly. I suppose that's it, responded Phil gloomily. Well, Uncle Will says that they've been together mighty near every day for the past three months. Not about half the time they've been over at Kitty's home. He's discovered, he says, that Kitty possesses a rare and wonderful capacity for absorbing the higher truths of more purely intellectual and spiritual planes of life, and that she has a marvelously developed appreciation of those ideas of life which are so far removed from the base and material interests and passions which belong to mere animal existence of a common herd. Oh, hell, groaned Patches. Well, that's what he told Uncle Will, returned Phil. And he was harping on that string so long and yammering so much to Jim and Kitty's mother about the girl's wonderful smartness and what a record-breaking career she would have if only she had the opportunity and what a shame and a loss it is to her, to the world to have here being remained and buried in the soul-dwarfing surroundings that they got to believe in it themselves. You see, Kitty herself has in a way of getting used to them ideas that Williamson Valley isn't much of a place, 
and that the cow business don't rank very high amongst the best of people. So old Jim is going to sell out and move away somewhere where Kitty can have her career and the boys can grow up to be something better than low-down cow punchers like you and me. Jim, he's able to retire anyway. Thanks, Phil, said Patches quietly. What for? For including me in your class. I consider it a compliment, he said, and then he added with a touch of his old mocking humor. I think I know what I'm saying better, perhaps, than the he-ghost knows what he's talking about. It may be that you do, returned Phil wearily, but you can see where it puts me. The professor has sure got me down and hog-tied so tight I can't think. Perhaps, and again, perhaps not, returned Patches. Reed ain't found a buyer for the outfit yet, has he? Not yet, but they'll come along fast enough. The Pothook S Ranch is too well known for the sale to hang fire for long. The next day, Phil seemed to slip back again into his attitudes toward Patches, to the temper of those last weeks of the rodeo. It was though the young man, with his return to the home ranch and the dean and their talks and plans of the work, again put himself, his personal convictions and particular regard for Patches aside, and became the unprejudiced foreman, careful of his employer's interests. Patches, very quickly, but without offense, found that the door which his friend had opened in the long, dark hours on that lonely, dark ride had closed again, and thinking that he understood, he made no attempt to force his way. But for some reason, Patches appeared to be an unusual happy frame of mind, went singing and whistling about the corrals and buildings, as though exceedingly well pleased with himself and the world. The following day was Sunday. In the afternoon, Patches was roaming about the premises, keeping at a safe distance from the walnut trees in front of the house, which the professor had cornered the dean, thus punishing both Patches and his employer by preventing one of their long Sunday talks which they both come to enjoy. Phil had gone off somewhere to be alone, and Miss Baldwin was reading aloud to little Billy. Honorable Patches was left very much to himself. From the top of the little hill near the corral, he looked across the meadow at exactly the right moment to see someone riding away from the neighborhood ranch. He watched until he was certain that whoever it was was not coming to the cross triangle, at least, not by way of the meadow lane. Then, smiling to himself, he went to the big barn and saddled a horse. There were always two or three that were not always turned out to pasture, and in a few minutes was riding leisurely away on the Simmons Road, along the western edge of the valley. An hour later, he met Kitty Reed, who was on her way from Simmons to the Cross Triangle. The young woman was sincerely glad to meet him. "'But you were going to Simmons, were you not?' she asked as he reined his horse about to ride with her. Well, to be truthful, I was going to Simmons if I met anyone else, or if I had not met you, he answered. And then, at her puzzled look, he explained. I saw someone leaving your house and guessed it was you, and I guessed, too, that you'd be coming this way. And you rode out to meet me? Yep, he smiled. They chatted about the rodeo and the news of the countryside, for it had been several weeks since they had met and so reached the point of the last ridge before he come to the ranch. Then Patches asked, Might we ride over to that ridge and sit for a while in the shade of the old cedar for a wee talk? It's early yet, and it's been ages since we had us a little powwow. Reaching the point which Patches had chosen, they left their horses and made themselves comfortable on the brow of the hill, overlooking the wide valley meadow and the ranches. And now said Kitty, looking at him curiously. What's all the talk about, Mr. Honorable Patches? Just you, said Patches gravely. Me? Your own charming self, he returned. But please, good sir, what have I done? she asked. Or perhaps what have I not done? 
Or, perhaps, it's what you're going to do. Oh. Miss Reed, I'm going to ask you a favor. A great favor. Yes. You've known me for almost a year. Yes. And yet, to be exact, you don't know me at all. She did not answer, but he looked at her steadily. In that, in a way, he continued, makes it easy for me to ask the favor. That is, if you feel that you can trust me ever so little, trust me, I mean, to the extent of believing me sincere. I know that you're sincere, Patches, she answered gravely. Thank you, he returned. Then he added gently, I want you to let me talk to you about what is most emphatically none of my business. I want you to let me ask you questions. I want you to talk to me about... He hesitated and then finished with meaning. About your career. She felt his earnestness and was big enough to understand and be grateful for the spirit that prompted his words. Why, Patches, she cried. After all that your friendship has meant to me these past months, I could not think any question that you would ask is impertinent. Surely you know that, don't you? I hope that you would feel that way, and I know that I'd give five years of my life if I knew how to convince you of the truth which I have learned from my own bitter experience, and save you from yourself. She could not mistake his earnestness, and in spite of herself, the man's intense feeling moved her deeply. Save me from myself? What in the world do you mean, Patches? Is it true that your father is offering the ranch for sale, and that you're going out of the Williamson Valley life? Yes, but it's not such a sudden move as it seems. We've often talked about it at home, mother and father and I. But the move is to be made chiefly on your account, is it not? She flushed a little at this, but answered stoutly. Yes, I suppose that is true. You see, being the only one in our family to have the advantage of, well, the advantage that I have had, it was natural that I should. Surely you've seen, Patches, how discontent and dissatisfied I've been with life here. Why, until you came here, there was no one to whom I could speak. Not even one. I mean, who could understand? But what is it you want? Or expect to find that you might not find right here? Then she told him all that he'd expected to hear. Told him earnestly and passionately of the life she craved, of the sordid and commonplace narrowness and emptiness, as she saw it, of the life of which she sought to escape. And as she talked, the man's good heart was heavy with sadness and pity for her. Oh, girl, girl, he cried when she was finished. Can't you or won't you understand? All that you seek is right here, everywhere about you, waiting for you to make it your own. And with it, you may have here these greater things without which no life can abundantly be or as joyous. The culture the intellectual life that is dependent upon mere environment. It's a crippling culture and sickly life. The mind that cannot find its food for thought wherever it may be placed will never hobble very far on crutches or on superficial cults or societies. You're leaving the substance, child, for a shadow. You're seeking the fads and fancies of shallow idlers and turning your back upon eternal facts. You're following after silly fools who are chasing bubbles over the edge of God's good world. Believe me, girl, I know. But I know what that life stripped of its tinseled and spangled life shows means. Take the good grain, child, and let the husks go. As the man spoke, Kitty watched him as though she were intently interested. But in truth, her thoughts were more on the speaker than on what he said. You're in earnest, aren't you, Patches? She muttered softly. I am, he returned sharply, for he saw that she was not even considering what he said. I know how mistaken you are. I know what it will mean to you when you find how much you've lost and how little you've gained. But how am I mistaken? 
I do not know what I want. Am I not better able than anybody to say what satisfies me and what doesn't? No, he retorted almost harshly. You are not. You think it's culture, as you call it, that you want, but that it was really it. You would not go. You'd find it here, the greatest minds that the world has ever known. You may have right here in your home, on your library table. And you may listen to their thoughts without being disturbed by the magpie chatterings of vain and shallow pretenders. You're attracted by the pretentious forms and manners of that life. You think that because a certain class of people who have nothing else to do and talk a certain jargon and profess to follow certain teachers who nine times out of ten are charlatans or fools, that they're the intellectual and spiritual leaders of the race. You're mistaking the very things that prevent intellectual and spiritual development for the things you think you want. She did not answer his thought, but replied to his words. And supposing I am mistaken, as you say, still, I do not see why it should matter so to you. He made a gesture of hopelessness and sat for a moment in silence, and then he said, I fear you will not understand, but did you ever hear the story of how Wild Horse Phil earned his title? She answered and laughed. Why, of course. Everybody knows about that. Dear foolish old Phil, I'll miss him dreadfully. Yes, he said significantly. You will miss him. The life you're going to does not produce Phil Acton's. It produced an honorable patches, she retorted slyly. Indeed it did not, he answered quickly. It produced... He checked himself, as though fearing that he would say too much. But what have Phil and his wild horse to do with the question? Nothing, I fear. Only I feel about your going away as Phil felt when he gave that wild horse its freedom. I, I don't think I understand, she said, genuinely puzzled. I said you wouldn't, he retorted bluntly, and that's why you're leaving all this. He gestured to indicate the vast sweep of country with old granite mountain in the distance. And then with a nod and a look, he indicated Professor Parkhool, who was walking towards them along the side of the ridge skirting the scattering timbers. Here comes a product of that culture to which you aspire. Behold the ideal manhood of your higher life. When the intellectual and spiritual life you so desire succeeds in producing racial fruit of that superior quality, it will have justified its existence and will perish from the earth. Even as Patches spoke, he saw something just beyond the approaching man that made him start, as if to rise to his feet. It was the unmistakable face of Yak Pai Joe, who, from behind an oak brush, was watching the professor. Patches glanced at Kitty, saw that she had not noticed. Before the young woman could reply to her companion's derisive remarks, the object which had prompted his comments, arrived within speaking distance. "'I trust I'm not intruding,' began the professor in his small, thin voice. Then as patches, his eyes still on the oak brush stood up, the little man added, with hasty condensation, "'Keep your seat, man. Keep your seat. I assure you it's not my purpose to derive you of Miss Reed's company.' Patches grinned. By that, my man, he knew that Kitty had not enlightened her teacher as to the typical cowboy's real character. Well, that's all right, Professor, he said awkwardly. I just seen a maverick over yonder place. I reckon I'd better mosey along and have a closer look at him. Me and Kitty here weren't talking about nothing important know how, just gossiping about. I reckon she'd rather go home with you anyhow, and it's all right with me. Maverick? questioned the professor. And what may I ask is a maverick? It's a critter which don't belong to nobody, answered Patches, moving towards his horse. At the same moment, Kitty, who had risen, was looking in the direction from which the professor had come, exclaimed, 
Why, there's Yuck P. Joe, Patches. What's he doing here? She pointed, and the professor, looking, caught a glimpse of Joe's back as the fellow was slinking over the ridge. I reckon maybe he wants to see me about something or other. Patches returned as he mounted his horse. Anyway, I'm a-going over to look that way anyway. So long. Patches rode up to Joe just as the tally holt man was regaining his horse on the other side of the ridge. Hey, Joe, said the cross-triangle rider easily. The wretched outcast was so shaken and confused that he could scarcely find the stirrup with his foot, and his face was pale and twitching with excitement. He looked at Patches wildly, but spoke in a sullen tone. What's, what's he doing here? What, 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 what does he want? How did he get in this country, anyhow? Patches was amazed, but spoke calmly. Who do you mean, Joe? I mean that man back there, Parkhill. Professor Parkhill. What's he looking for hanging around here? You can tell him it ain't no use, I... He stopped suddenly with a characteristic look of cunningness turned away. Patches rode beside him for some distance, but nothing he could say would persuade the wretched creature to explain. Yeah, I know you're my friend all right, Patches, he answered. You sure been mighty friendly to me, but I ain't forgetting it. But I, I ain't telling nobody, and it ain't gonna do you no good to keep asking about him, about me, and don't ask him neither. I'm not gonna ask Professor Parkill anything, Joe said Patches shortly. Y you ain't? Certainly not. If you don't want me to know, I'm not trying to find out about anything that's not my business. Joe looked at him with a cunning leer. Oh, you ain't, is ya? Nick, low as it you're sure. Again he caught himself. But I ain't telling nobody for nothing. Well, have I ever asked you anything? demanded Patches. No, no, you, you ain't, that's right. You've always been square with me, Patches, and I ain't forgetting it. Be you sure enough, my friend, Patches. Honest to God, now be you? His question was pitiful, and Patches assured the poor fellow that he had no wish to do anything but be his friend. If only would Yock by Joe accept his help. Then, said Joe pleadingly, if you mean all that you've been saying about wanting to help me, you'd do something for me right now. What can I do for you, Joe? You can promise that you won't say nothing to nobody about him and me back there. Patches, to demonstrate his friendliness, answered without thought. Certainly, I'll promise that, Joe. You, you won't tell nobody? Nope, I won't say a word. Poor fellow's face re revealed his gratitude. I'm obliged to you, Patches. I sure am, and I ain't forgetting nothing either. You're my friend, all right, and I'm yours. I gotta be a hitting it out now. Nick just naturally give me hell for being gone so long. Goodbye, Joe. So so long, Patches. Don't you get to thinking that I'm forgetting how you and me are friends. When Patches reviewed the incident, as he rode back to the ranch, he questioned if he had done right in promising Joe. But after all, he reassured himself he was under no obligations to interfere with what was clearly none of his business. He could not see that the manor in any possible way touched his employer's interests. As he reflected, he was already tr tried the useless experiment of meddling with other people's affairs and he did not care to repeat the experience. That evening, Patches asked Phil's permission to go to Prescott the next day. It'd be the first time he had been to town since his coming to the ranch, and the foreman readily granted his request. A few minutes later, as Phil passed through the kitchen, Miss Baldwin remarked, I wonder what Patches is feeling so gay about. Ever since he got home from the rodeo, he's been a-singin' and a-whistlin' and grinnin' to himself all the time. He went out to the corral just now as merry as a lark. Phil laughed. Anyone would be glad to be through with that rodeo, Mother. Besides, 
He's going to town tomorrow. Is he? Well, you mark my word, son. There's something up to make him feel as good as he does at the moment. And then, when Phil had gone out to the yard, Professor Parkhill found him. Mr. Acton, began the guest timidly, there's a little matter of which I should feel I should speak to you about. Very well, sir. I feel that it'd be better for me to speak to you rather than Mr. Baldwin, because rather you're younger and will, I'm sure, r r understand more readily. All right, what is it, Professor? asked Phil encouragingly, wondering at the man's manner. Do you mind walking a little way down the road? As they strode towards the gate to the meadow road, the professor continued. I think you should tell me about your man Patches. Phil looked at his companion sharply. Well, what about him? I, I trust you will not misunderstand my interest, Mr. Acton, when I say that it also includes Mrs. Reed. Phil stopped short. Instantly, Mrs. Baldwin's remarks about Patch's happiness, his own confessions that he had given up all hope of winning Kitty and the thought of the friendship which he had seen developing during the past months with the realization that Patches belonged to that world to which Kitty aspired, all swept through his mind. He was looking at the man beside him so intently that the professor said again uneasily, I trust, Mr. Acton, that you'll understand. Phil laughed shortly. I think I do, but just the same you'd better explain it. What about Patches and Miss Reed, sir? The professor told them how he found them together that afternoon. Is that all? laughed Phil. But surely, Mr. Acton, you do not think that a man of that fellow's brutal instincts is fit to associate with a young woman of Mrs. Reed's character and refinement. Perhaps not, admitted Phil, still laughing. But I guess that Kitty can take care of herself. I do not agree with you, sir, said the other authoritatively. A young woman of Mrs. Reed's uh, spirituality and worldly inexperience might always be, to a certain extent, injured by contrast with such illiterate, unrefined, and I have no doubt morally deficit characters. But look here, Professor, returned Phil, still grinning. What do you expect me to do about it? I'm not Kitty Reed's guardian. Why don't you talk to her yourself? Really? returned the little man. I, there are reasons why I do not see my way clear to such a course. I had hoped that you might keep an eye on the fellow and, if necessary, use your authority over him to prevent such incidences in the future. I'll see what I can do, answered Phil, thinking how the dean would enjoy the joke. But look here. Kitty was with you when you got to the ranch. What became of Patches? Run did he when you appeared on the scene? Oh, no, he, he went away with a maverick. Went away with a maverick? What in heaven's name do you mean by that? That's what your fellow Patches said. Mrs. Reed told me his name was Joe. Joe something. Phil was not laughing now. The fun of the situation had vanished. Was it Yakpai Joe? he demanded. Yes, that was it. I'm quite certain that was his name. He belongs to Tail End Mountain, I think, Miss Reed said. You've such curious names in this country. And Patches went away with them, did you say? Oh, yes. The fellow seemed to be hiding in the bushes when we discovered him, and when Miss Reed asked what he was doing there, your man said that he had come to see him about something. They went away together, I believe. As soon as he could escape from the professor, Phil went straight to Patches, who was in his room reading. The man looked up with a welcoming smile as Phil entered, but as he saw the foreman's face, his smile vanished quickly and he laid aside his book. Patches, said Phil abruptly, what's this talk of the professor about you and Yock by Joe? I don't know what the professor's talking. 
Patches said coldly, as though he did not exactly like the tone of Phil's question. He said that Joe was sneaking about in the bush over on the ridge wanting to see about something, returned Phil. Joe was certainly over there on the ridge, and he may have wanted to see me. At any rate, I saw him. Well, I've got to ask you what sort of business you have with that Tally Holt thief that makes it necessary for him to sneak around the bush for a meeting with you. If he wants to see you, why hasn't he come to the ranch like a man? Honorable Patches looked at the dean's foreman straight in the eyes as he answered in a tone that he had never used before in speaking to Phil. And I have an answer, sir, that my business with Yawk by Joe is entirely personal, and that it has no relation whatsoever to your business as the foreman of this ranch. As to why Joe didn't come to the house, you must ask him, I don't know. Are you refusing to explain? demanded Phil. I certainly refuse to discuss Joe Dryden's personal affairs that, so far as I can see, are of no importance to anyone but himself, with you, or anyone else. Just as I should refuse to discuss any of your private affairs, with which I happen, by some chance, to be in a way familiar. I have made all the explanations necessary when I say that my business with him has nothing to do with your business. You have no right to ask me anything further. I have the right to fire you, retorted Phil angrily. Patches smiled as he answered gently. You have the right, Phil, but you won't use it. And why not? Because you're not that kind of a man, Phil Acton, answered Patches slowly. You know perfectly well that if you discharge me because of my friendship with poor Yawk by Joe, no ranch in this part of the country will ever give me a job. You are too honest yourself to condemn any man on mere suspicion, and you're too much of a gentleman to damn any simply because he, too, aspires to that distinction. Very well, Patches, Phil returned with less heat. But I want you to understand one thing. I am responsible for the Cross Triangle property, and there's no friendship in the world strong enough to influence me in the slightest degree when it comes to question of Uncle Will's interests. Do you understand that? I got that months ago, Phil. Without another word, the dean's foreman left the room. Patches sat for some time considering the situation, and now and then his lips curled in the old self-mocking smile, realizing that he was caught in a trap of circumstances, and he found a curious humor in his predicament. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 Again, it was July, and it was the time of the cattlemen's celebration of the fourth at hand, Riders from every part of the great western cow country assembled in Prescott for their annual contests. From Texas and Montana, from Oklahoma and New Mexico and Wyoming, the cowboys came with their saddles and riatas to meet each other and the men of Arizona in friendly trials of strength and skill. From many a wild pasture, Outlaw horses famous for their vicious, unsubdued spirits and their fierce, untamed strength were brought to match their wicked, unbroken wills against the cool, determined courage of the riders. From the wild ranges, the steers that were to participate in the roping and bulldogging contests were gathered and driven in. From many a ranch, the fastest and best of the trained cow horses were sent for the various cowboy races. And the little city, in its rocky mile-high basin, upon which the higher surrounding mountains look so steadily down, again decked itself in gala colors and opened wide its doors to welcome all who chose to come. From the cross triangle and the neighboring ranches, the cowboys, dressed in their best of their picturesque outfits, rode into town to witness and take part in the sports. 
with them rode honorable patches. But this was not the carefully groomed and immaculate attired gentleman who, in troubled spirit, had walked alone over that long, unfenced way a year before. This was not the timid, hesitating, shamed-faced man at whom Phil Acton had laughed on the summit of the Divide. This was a man among men, a cowboy of the cowboys, bronzed and leaned and rugged, vitally alive in every inch of his long body, with self-reliant courage and daring hardihood written all over him, expressed in every tone of his voice and ringing in every note of his laughter. The dean and Miss Baldwin and little Billy drove in on the buckboard, but the distinguished guest of the cross triangle went with the Reed family in the automobile. The professor was not at all interested in the celebration, but he could not well remain at the ranch alone, and it may be supposed the invitation from Kitty helped to make the occasion endurable. The celebration this year, the posters and circulars declared, was to be the biggest and best that Prescott had ever offered. In proof of the bold assertion, the program promised, in addition to its usual events, an automobile race. Shades of those mighty heroes of the saddle, whose names were not erased by the histories of the Great West, think of it. An automobile race offered as the chief event in the frontier day of celebration. No wonder that Ms. Manning said to her husband that day, But Stan, where are the cowboys? Stanford Manning answered laughingly, Oh, they're here all right, Helen. Just wait a little and you'll see. Mr. and Mrs. Manning had arrived from Cleveland, Iowa, the evening before, and Helen was eager and excited with the prospect of meeting the people and witnessing the scenes of which her husband had told her of with so much enthusiasm. As the dean had told Patches that day when the cattlemen had advanced the money for the stranger's outfit, the young mining engineer had won a place for himself amid the scenes of and among the people of those western country. He had first come to the land of this story, fresh from his technical training in the east. His employers, quick to recognize not only his ability in his profession, but his character and manhood, as well, had advanced him rapidly, and less than a month before Patches asked for work at the Cross Triangle, had sent him on an important mission to their mines in the north. They were sending him now, again, to Arizona, this time as the resident manager of their properties in the Prescott District. This new advance in his profession, together with the substantial increase in salary which brought, meant much to the engineer. Most of all, it meant his marriage to Helen Wakefield. A stopover for two weeks at Cleveland, on his way west, from the main offices of his company in New York, had changed his return to Prescott from a simple business trip to a wedding journey. At the home of the Yakpai Club, on top of a hill, a block above the plaza, a number of Prescott citizens with their guests had gathered to watch the beginning of the automobile race. The course, from the corner in front of the St. Michael Hotel, followed the street along one side of the plaza and climbed straight up the hill, past the clubhouse and so away into the open country. From the clubhouse or veranda, from the lawn and walks in front, or from their seats in convenient automobiles standing nearby, the company enjoyed thus an unobstructed view of the starting point of the race and could look down as well upon the crowds that pressed against the ropes which were stretched along either side of the street. From a friendly automobile, Helen Manning, with her husband's field glasses, was as eager and excited an observer of the interesting scene, while Stanford nearby was busy meeting old friends, presenting them to his wife and receiving their congratulations. And often, he turned with a fond look and a merry word to the young woman, as though reassuring himself that she was really there. There was no doubt about it. Stanford Manning 
strong and steady and forceful, was very much in love with this girl who looked down into his face with such an air of sweet confidence and companionship. And Helen, as she turned from the scene that so interested her, to greet her husband's friends, to ask him some question, or to answer some laughing remark, could not hide the love light in her soft brown eyes. One could not fail to see that her woman's heart was glad, glad and proud that this stalwart, broad-shouldered leader of men had chosen her for his mate. But Stan, she said with an air, air of disappointment, I thought it was all going to be so different. Why, except for the mountains and those poor Indians over there, this might all be some little town back home. I thought there'd be cowboys riding about everywhere with long hair and big hats and guns and things. Stanford and his friends were standing nearby laughing. I fear, Miss Manning, remarked Mr. Richards, one of the Prescott's bank presidents, that Stanford has been telling you some Wild West stories. The West moves as well as the East, you know. We're becoming quite civilized. Oh, indeed you are, Mr. Richards, Helen returned, and I don't think I like it a bit. It's not fair to your poor Eastern sightseers like myself. If you're so anxious to get a sure look at a cowboy, just look over there, said Stanford, and pointed across the street. Where? demanded Helen eagerly. Over there, smiled Stanford. The dark-faced chap near that automobile, standing by the curb. The machine with the pretty girl at the wheel, see? He stopped to talk to the girl. What? That nice-looking man dressed like a thousand men that we might see any day on the streets of Cleveland? cried Helen. Exactly, chuckled her husband while the others laughed at her surprise. But just the same, that there's Phil Acton. Wild Horse Phil, if you please. He is the cowboy foreman of the Cross Triangle Ranch, and he won the championship in the Bronco riding last year. I don't believe it. You're making fun of me, Stanford Manning. Then, before he could answer, she cried with quick excitement. But Stan, look. Look at the girl in the automobile. She, she looks like... It is, Stan, it is! And to the amazement of her husband and her friend, Miss Manning sprang to her feet and waved her handkerchief and called, Kitty! Oh, Kitty! Kitty Reed! As her clear voice rang out, many people turned to look and then to smile at the picture as she stood there in the bright Arizona day, so animated and wholesomely alive in the grace and charm of her beautiful young womanhood above the little group of men who were looking up at her with laugh and admi admiration. On the other side of the street, where she sat with her parents and Professor Parkhill, talking to Phil, Kitty heard the call and looked. A moment later, she was across the street, and the two young women were greeting each other with old-time schoolgirl enthusiasm. Introductions and explanations followed with a frequent feminine exclamation of surprise and delight. Then the men drew away a little, talking and laughing as men will on such occasions, leaving the two women to themselves. In that eastern school which, for those three years, had been Kitty's home, Helen Wakefield and the girl from Arizona had been close and intimate friends. Indeed, Helen, with her strong womanly character and the rare gift of helpful sympathy and understanding, had been to the girl fresh from the cattle ranges more than a friend. She had been a counselor and a companion, and in many ways a wide guardian and a teacher. But why in the world didn't you write me about it? demanded Kitty a little later. Why didn't you tell me that you'd become Miss Stanford Manning and that you were coming to Prescott? Helen laughed and blushed happily. Why, you see, Kitty, it all happened so quickly that there was no time to write. You remember when I wrote you about Stan, I told you how poor he was and how we didn't expect to marry for several years? Yes. Well, then, you see, Stan's company, all unexpectedly to him, called him to New York and gave him this position out here. He had to start at once and wired me from New York. 
Just think, I had only a week for the wedding and everything. I knew, of course, that I could find you after I got here. Well, now you're here, said Kitty decisively. You and Mr. Mannings are coming right out to Williamson Valley to spend your honeymoon on the ranch. But Helen shook her head. Stan has it all planned, Kitty, and he won't listen to anything. There's a place around here somewhere he calls the Granite Basin, and he has it all arranged that we'll camp out there for three weeks. His company has given him that much time, and we are going just as soon as the celebration's over. After that, when Stan gets started with his work and fixes some place for us to live, I'll give you a little visit. I suppose there's no use trying to contend against the rights of a brand new husband, returned Kitty. But it's a promise that you will come as soon as your camping trip's over. It's a promise, agreed Helen. You see, that's really part of Stanford's plan. I was so sure you would want me, you know. Want you? I should say I want you. I need you, too, cried Kitty. Something in her voice made Helen look at her questioningly, but Kitty only smiled. I'll tell you all about it when there's more time. Let me see, said Helen. There used to be, why, of course, that nice-looking man you were talking to when I recognized you, Phil Acton. She looked across the street as she spoke, but Phil was gone. Please don't, Helen, dear, said Kitty. That was only my schoolgirl nonsense. When I come home, I found it how impossible it was. But i got to run back to the folks now. Will you come and meet them? Before Helen could answer, somebody shouted, They're getting ready for the start! And somebody looked down the hill towards the place where the racing machines were sputtering and roaring in their clouds of blue smoke. Helen caught up the field glasses to look, saying, We can't go right now, Kitty. You stay here with us until after the race has started, and then we'll go. As Helen lowered the glasses, Stanford who had come to stand beside the automobile, reached out his hand. Let me have a look, Helen. They say my old friend Judge Morris is the official starter. He put the field glasses to his eyes. There he is, as big as life. Finest man that ever lived. Look, Helen. He returned the glasses to his wife. If you want to see a genuine western lawyer, scholar and a gentleman... Take a look at that six foot three or four there down in the gray clothes. I see him, said Helen. But there's something seems to be the matter. There he goes, back to the machines. Now now he's laying down the law to the drivers. Oh, they won't put anything over on Morris, said Stanford admiringly. And then a deep, kindly voice at his elbow said, Howdy, Manning. Ain't you got time to speak to your old friends? Stanford whirled and with glad exclamation grasped the dean's outstretched hand. Still holding fast to the cattleman, he turned again to his wife, who was looking down at them with smiling interest. Helen, this is Mr. Baldwin, the dean, you know. Indeed, I ought to know the dean, she cried, giving him her hand. Stanford has told me much about you. And I'm already in love with you. And I, retorted the dean, looking up at her with his blue eyes twinkling in approval. I reckon I've always been in love with you. I'm sure glad to meet this young man, that he's found a justified reputation with good judgment. Have they got any more girls like you back east? Because if they have, I'd sure be obliged to take a trip to that part of the world before I get too old. Oh, you're just as Stan said you were, retorted Helen. Uncle Will, cried Kitty. I'm ashamed of you. I didn't think you had turned down your own home folks like that. The dean lifted his hat and rumpled his grizzly old hair as the thought fairly caught. And then, why, Kitty, you, you know I couldn't love any girl more than I do you. Why, you belong to me most as much as you belong to your own father and mother. But you see, honey, well, you see, we just naturally gotta be nice to strangers, you know. 
When they had laughed at this, Kitty explained to the dean how Miss Manning was Helen Wakefield, with whom she had been such good friends with at school, and that, after the Manning outfit in the Granite Basin, Helen was to visit the Williamson Valley. "'Camping out on the Granite Basin, eh?' said the dean to Stanford. "'I reckon you'll be seeing some of my boys. They're heading up into that country after outlaw steers next week.' I hope so, returned Stanford. Helen's sure been complaining that there's no cowboys to be seen. I pointed out Phil Acton, but I guess he didn't seem to fit the bill. She doesn't believe he's a cowboy at all. The dean chuckled. He's never been anything else. They don't make him any better. Then he added soberly, Phil's not riding in the contest this year, though. What's the matter? I don't know. He's got some fool notion in his head that he doesn't want to make an exhibition of himself. That's what he said. I've got another man on the ranch now, he added as though to change the subject. That'll be mighty near as good as Phil in another year. His name is Patches. He's a good one, all right. Kitty, who had been looking away down the street, while the dean was talking, put her hand on Helen's arm. Look down there, Helen. I believe that's Patches now. That man sitting on his horse at the cross street at the foot of the hill just outside the ropes. Helen was looking through the field glasses. I see him, she cried. Now that's more like it. He looks like what I was expecting to see. What a big fine chap he is. And then, as she studied the distant horseman, a puzzled expression came over her face. "'Why, Kitty,' she said in a low tone, so the men who were talking did not hear. "'Do you, do you know that man sort of reminds me?' She hesitated, and lowered the glasses to look at her companion with half-amused, half-embarrassed eyes. "'He reminds me of Lawrence Knight.' Kitty's brown, fun-loving eyes glowed with mischief. Really, Miss Manning, I'm ashamed of you. Before the honeymoon has waned your thoughts with no better excuse than the appearance of a poor cowpuncher, go back to the captivating dreams of your old millionaire lover, I... Kitty, hush! pleaded Helen. She lifted her glasses for another look at the cowboy. I don't wonder why your conscience repudes you teased Kitty in a low tone. But tell me, poor child, how did it happen that you lost your millionaire? I didn't lose him, retorted Helen, still watching Patches. He lost me. Kitty persisted with playful mockery. What? The great, wonderful knight of so many millions failed with all of his glittering charm to captivate the fair but simple Helen? Really, I can't believe that. Look at that man right there, flashed Helen proudly, indicating her husband, and you can believe it. Kitty laughed so gaily that Stanford turned to look at them with smiling inquiry. Oh, never mind, Mr. Manning, said Kitty. We're just reminiscing, that's all. Well, don't be missing the race, he answered. They're getting ready to start. Looks like it's a go this time. And to think muttered Kitty, that I never so much as saw your knight's picture. But you used to like Lawrence Knight, didn't you, Helen? She added, as Helen lifted her field glasses again, and now Miss Manning caught a note of earnest inquiry in her companion's voice. It was though the girl was seeking conferment of some purpose or decision of her own. Why, yes, Kitty, I, I liked Larry Knight very much, she answered frankly. He was a fine fellow in many ways, a dear good friend. Stanford and I are both very fond of him. They were college mates, you know. But, my dear girl, no one could ever consider poor Larry seriously. As a man, you know, he was so utterly and hopelessly worthless. Worthless? With how many millions is it? Oh, Kitty, you know what I mean, but really, dear, we've talked enough about Mr. Lawrence Knight. I'm going to have another look at that cowboy. He looks like a real man, doesn't he? 
What is it the dean calls him? Patches. Oh, yes, what a funny name, Patches. Honorable Patches, said Kitty. How odd, she mused. Stan, come here a minute. Take the glasses and look at that cowboy down there. Stanford trained the field glasses as she directed. Doesn't he remind you of Larry Knight? Larry Knight? Stanford looked at her in amazement. That cowpuncher, Larry Knight? I should say not, Lord, but... But wouldn't cultured and correct old Larry feel complimented to know you found him anything in common with that cowpuncher you remind you of? But here, take your glasses, quick. They're going to start, finally. Even as Helen looked, Judge Morris gave the signal, and the first racing car, with a mighty roar, leapt away from the starting point and thundered up the street between the lining of the crowds and cheering people. An instant more, and Helen Manning witnessed a scene that thrilled the hearts of every man, woman, and child in that great crowd. In the big racing car, gathering speed at every throb of the powerful motor, sweep towards the hill, a small boy, but no more than a toddler baby, escaped from his mother, who, with the exciting throng, was crowded against the rope barrier, and before those eyes were fixed on the automobiles noticed, the child was in the street, fairly in the path of the approaching machine. A sudden hush fell on the shouting multitude. Helen, through the field glasses, could even see the child's face as, laughing gleefully, he looked back when his mother screamed. Stricken with horror, the young woman could not lower her glasses. Fascinated, she watched. The people seemed for an instant paralyzed. Not a soul moved or uttered a sound. Would the driver of the racing car swerve aside of his course in time? If he did, would the baby in sudden fright dodge in front of another machine? Then... Helen saw the cowboy who had so interested her lean forward in his saddle, strike his spurs deep in the flanks of his already restless horse. With a sudden bound, the animal cleared the rope barrier and in an instant was leaping towards the child in the approaching car. The people gasped at the daring of the man who had not waited to think. It was over in a second, and as Patches swept by the child, he leaned low from the saddle, and in the next leap of his horse, carried him barely clear of the machine. They saw his tall, lithe body straighten as he swung the baby up into his arms. Then, indeed, the crowd went wild. Men yelled and cheered, women laughed and cried as the cowboy returned the frightened baby to the distressed mother. A hundred eager hands were stretching forth to greet him. But the excited horse backed away. Somebody raised the rope barrier and patches, disappeared down the side street. Helen's eyes were wet, but she was smiling. No, she said softly to Kitty and Stanford. That was not Lawrence Knight. Poor old Larry, Larry could never have done that. It was little after the noon hour when Kitty, who, with her father, mother, and brothers, had been for dinner at the home of one of their Prescott friends had crossed the plaza on her way to join Mr. and Mrs. Manning, with whom she was spending the afternoon. In a less frequent corner of the little park, back of the courthouse, she saw Patches. The cowboy, who had changed from his ranch costume to a less picturesque business garb, was seated alone on one of the benches that was placed along the walks reading a letter. With his attention fixed upon the letter, he did not notice Kitty as she approached. And the girl, when she first caught sight of him, paused for an instant. Then she went towards him, slowly, studying him with new interest. She was quite near when, looking up, he saw her. In an instant, he rose to his feet and slipped the letter into his pocket and stood before her hat in hand, to greet her with genuine pleasure and with that gentle courtesy that always marked his bearing. And Kitty, as she looked up at him, felt, more convincingly than ever, that this man would be perfectly at ease in the most exact social company. "'I fear I'm interrupting you,' said the young woman. "'I was just passing.' "'Oh, not at all,' he protested. "'Surely you can give me a moment of your busy gala day. 
I know you have a host of friends, of course, but, well, I am lonely. Curly and Bob and the boys are all having the time of their lives, and the dean and mother are lunching with friends. I don't know where Phil is hidden himself. It was like him to mention Phil in almost his first words to her. And Kitty, as Patches spoke Phil's name instantly, as she had so often done these past few months, mentally placed the men two side by side. I just wanted to tell you, she hesitated, Mr. Patches. I beg your pardon, he interrupted, smiling. Well, Patches, then, but you seem so different somehow, dressed like this. I just wanted to tell you that what I saw happen this morning, it was splendid. Why, Miss Reed, you know that was nothing. The driver of the car would have probably dodged the youngster anyway. I was just acting on impulse on the moment without thinking. I'm always doing something unnecessarily foolish, you know. The driver of the car most likely would have dodged into the child, she returned warmly, and it was fortunate that someone in all that stupid crowd could act without taking time to think. Everybody says so. The dear old Dean is pleased and proud as though you were one of his own sons. Oh, really, you're making too much of it, he returned, clearly embarrassed by her praise. Tell me, are you enjoying the celebration and... What's the matter with Phil? Can't you persuade him to ride in the contest? We don't want the championship to go out of York by County, do we? Why must he always bring Phil into their talk? Kitty asked herself. I'm sure that Phil knows how his friends feel about his riding, she said coolly. If he doesn't wish to gratify them, it's really a small matter, isn't it? Patches saw that he made a mistake and changed easily to a safer topic. You saw the beginning of the automobile race, of course. I suppose you will be on hand this afternoon for the finish? Oh, yes. I'm on my way now to join my friends, Mr. and Mrs. Stanford Manning. We're going to see the finish of the race together. She watched his face closely as she spoke of her friends, but he gave no sign that he'd ever heard the name before. It'll be worth seeing, I fancy, he returned. At least everybody seems to feel that way. I'm sure to have a good time, anyway. Because, you see, Miss Manning is one of my dearest girlfriends, whom I have not seen for a long time. Indeed, you will enjoy the afternoon, then. Was there a shade of too much enthusiasm in the tone of his reply? Kitty wondered. Could it be that his plea of loneliness had been merely a convenient courtesy and that he was really relieved to find that she was engaged for the afternoon? Yes, and I must hurry on to them, or they will think I'm not coming. Have a good time, Patches. You've surely earned it. Goodbye. He stood for a moment, watching her cross the park, and then with a quick look around as though he did not wish to be observed, he hurried across the street to the Western Union office. A few moments later, he made his way by little frequent side streets to the stable where he had left his horse. And while Kitty and her friends were watching the first of the racing cars cross the line, Patches was several miles away, riding as though pursued by the sheriff straight for the Cross Triangle Ranch. Several times that day, while she was with her eastern friends, Kitty saw Phil nearby, but she gave him no signal to join them, and the cowboy, shy as always, and hurt by Kitty's indifference, would not approach the little party without her invitation. But that evening, while Kitty was waiting in the hotel lobby for Mr. and Mrs. Manning, Phil, finding her alone, went to her. I've been trying to speak to you all day, he said reproachfully. Haven't you any time at all for me, Kitty? Don't be foolish, Phil, she returned. You've seen me a dozen times. I have seen you, yes. But, Phil, you could have come to me if you wanted to. I have no desire to go where I'm not wanted, he answered. Phil! Well, you gave no sign that you wanted me to. 
Well, there's no reason why I should, she retorted. You're not a child. I was with my friends from the East. You could have joined us if you had cared to. I should be very glad indeed to present you to Mr. and Mrs. Manning. Thank you, but I don't care to be exhibited as an interesting specimen to people who have no use for me except when I do some fool stunts to amuse them. Very well, Phil, she returned coldly. If that's your feeling, I do not care to present you to my friends. They are every bit as sincere and genuine as you are, and I certainly shall not trouble them with anyone who cannot appreciate them. Kitty was angry, as she had good reason for being. But beneath her anger, she was sorry for the man whose bitterness she knew was born of his love for her. And Phil saw only that Kitty was lost to him, saw in the girl's eastern friends those who he felt had robbed him of his dream. I suppose, he said, after a moment's painful silence, that I'd better go back to the range where I belong. I'm out of place here. The girl was touched by the hopelessness in his voice, but felt it would be no kindness to offer him the relief of an encouraging word. Her day with her eastern friends and the memories that her meeting with Miss Manning had aroused convinced her more than ever that her old love for Phil and the life of which he was part were for her impossible. When she did not speak, the cowboy said bitterly, I notice that your fine friends do not take quite all your time. You found an opportunity for a quiet little visit with honorable patches. Kitty was angry now in earnest. You are forgetting yourself, Phil, she answered with cold dignity. And I think that as long as you feel as you do towards my friends, and can speak to me like this about Mr. Patches, you are right to say that you belong on the range. Mr. and Mrs. Manning are here, I see. I'm going to be dining with them. Goodbye. She turned away, leaving him standing there. A moment he waited, as though stunned, and then he turned to make his way blindly out of the hotel. It was nearly morning when Patches was awakened by the sound of someone moving about the kitchen. A moment he listened, then rising, went quickly to the kitchen door, thinking to surprise some chance night visitor. When Phil saw him, standing there, the foreman for a moment said nothing, but with a bread knife in one hand and one of Stella's good loaves in the other, stared at him in blank surprise. Then the look of surprise changed to an expression of questioning suspicion, and he demanded harshly, What the hell are you doing here? Patches saw that the man was laboring under some great trouble. Indeed, Phil's voice and manner were not unlike one under the influence of strong drink, but Patches knew that Phil never drank. I was sleeping, he answered calmly. You woke me up, I suppose. I heard you and came to see who was prowling around the kitchen at this time of night, that's all. Oh, that's all, is it? But what are you here for? Why aren't you in Prescott where you're supposed to be? Patches, because he saw Phil's painful state of mind, exercised admirable self-control. I supposed I had perfect right to come here if I wished. I did not dream that my presence in this house would be questioned. That depends, Phil retorted. Why'd you leave Prescott? Patches, still calm, answered gently. My reasons for not staying in Prescott are entirely personal, Phil. I don't care to explain it just now. Oh, you don't? Well, it seems to me, sir, that you have a devil of a lot of personal business that you can't seem to explain. I'm afraid I have, returned Patches with his old self-mocking smile. But look here, Phil. You are disturbed and all wrought up about something or you wouldn't attack me like this. You don't really think me a suspicious character and you know you don't. You're not yourself, old man. You know, I'll be hanged if I take anything you say as an insult until I know that you say it deliberately in cold blood. 
I'm sorry for your trouble, Phil. Damn sorry. I'd give anything if I could help you. Perhaps I may be able to prove the latter, but just now I think the kindest and wisest thing I can do for both of us is just say goodnight. He turned at the last word without waiting for Phil to speak and went back to his room. End of chapter 12. Chapter 13 On the other side of Granite Mountain from where Phil and Patches watched the wild horses that day, there was a rocky hollow set high in the hills but surrounded on every side by still higher peaks and ridges. Laying close under the sheer towering cliffs of the mountains, those fortress-like walls so grey and grim and old seemed to overshadow the place with somber quiet, as though the memories of many ages that had brought their countless years into those mighty battlements gave to the very atmosphere a feeling of solemn and sacred seclusion. It was though, as nature had thrown about this spot a strong protecting guard, that here, in her very heart, she might keep unprofaned the sweet and strength and beauty of her primitive and everlasting treasures. In its wild, rugged setting, Granite Basin has, for the few who have had the hardihood to look for them and find them, many beautiful glades and shady nooks, where the grass and wild flowers weave their lovely patterns for the earth floor, and tall pines spread their soft carpet of brown, while giant oaks and sycamores lift their cathedral arches to support the ceilings of the green, and dark, rocky fountains set in banks of moss and fern hold water, cold and clear. It was to one of those that Stanford Manning brought his bride for their honeymoon. Stanford himself pitched their tent and made their simple camp, for it was not in his plan that the sweet intimacy of those the first weeks of their mating life should be marred even by servants. And Helen, wise in her love, permitted him to realize his dream in the fullness of every detail. As she lay in the hammock which he had hung for her under the canopy of living green, in watching him while he brought wood for their campfire and made ever ready for the night which was drawing near, she was glad that he had planned it so. But more than that, she was glad that he was the kind of man who would care to plan it such. Then, when all was finished, he came to sit beside her, and together they watched the light of the setting sun fade from the summit of old granite, and saw the flaming cloud banner that hung above the mountain's castle towers furrowed by the hand of night. In silence, they watched those mighty tower battlements grow cold and grim, until against the sky the shadowy bulk stood mysterious and awful, as though evidence to its grandeur and strength, the omnipotent might and power of the master builder of the world and the giver of all life. And when the soft darkness was fully come, and the low murmuring voices of the night whispered from forest deep and the mountainside, while the stars peered through, weaving of leaf and branch, and the ruddy light of their camp fire rose and fell. The man talked of the things that had gone into the making of his life. As though he wished his mate to know him more fully than anyone had ever known, he spoke of those personal trials and struggles, those disappointments and failures, those plans and triumphs of which men so rarely speak, of his boyhood, of his boyhood home life, of his father and mother, of those hard years of his youth and his struggle for an education that would equip him for his chosen life's work. He told her many things that she known only in a general way, but most of all he talked of those days when he had first met her, and of how quickly and surely the acquaintance had grown into friendship, and then into a love which he dared not yet confess. Secretly and smiling, he told how he had tried to convince himself that she was not for him, and how, believing that she loved him and would wed his friend, Lawrence Knight, he came to the far west to his work 
and, if he could, forget. But I couldn't forget, he said. I cannot escape the conviction that you belong to me, as I felt that I belonged to you. I could not banish the feeling that was mysterious and a higher law, the law that governs the mating of the beautifully free creatures that live in these hills, had mated you and me together. And so, as I worked and tried to forget, I went on dreaming just the same. He was that way when I first saw this place. I was crossing the country on my way to examine some prospects for the company and camped at this very spot. And that evening I planned it all, just as it is tonight. I put the tent there and built our fire and stretched your hammock under that tree and sat with you in the twilight. But even as I dreamed it, I laughed at myself for being a fool, for I couldn't believe that the dream would ever come true. And then, when I got back to Prescott, there was a letter from a Cleveland friend telling me that Larry had gone abroad to be away a year or more and another letter from the company calling me east again. And so I stopped at Cleveland, and he laughed happily. I know now that dreams come true. You foolish boy, said Helen softly, to think that I did not know. Why, when you went away, I was so sure you'd come for me again that I never even thought that it could be any other way. I thought you didn't speak because you felt that you were too poor because you felt that you had so little to offer and because you wished to prove yourself and your work before asking me to share in your life. I did not dream that you could doubt my love for you or think for a moment that there could be anyone else. I I felt you must know. So you see, when I waited, I, I had my dreams too. But don't you see, he answered, as though for a moment he found it hard to believe his own happiness. Don't you see? Larry is such a splendid fellow, and you two were such good friends. And you always seemed so fond of him, and with his wealth he could give you so much that I knew I could never give. Of course, I was fond of Larry. Everyone is. He has absolutely nothing to do in the world but to make himself charming and pleasant and entertaining and amusing. Why, Stan... I don't suppose that in all of his life he ever did one single thing that was necessary or useful. He, he even had a man to help him get dressed. He's cultured and smart and bright and witty and clean and good-natured, possessing, in fact, all the qualities of a desirable lapdog. But you can't help like him, just like you'd like a pretty useless pet. Stanford chuckled. She had described Lawrence Knight quite accurately. Poor old Larry, he said. What a man he would have been if he hadn't been so pampered and petted, all because of his father's money. His heart was good, and at the bottom he had the right sort of stuff in him. His athletic record at school showed us that. I think that was why we all liked him in spite of his uselessness. I wish you would have known my father, Stan, said Helen thoughtfully, as though she too were moved to speak by the wish that her mate might know of the things that had touched her deeper life. I wish I did too, he answered. I know that he must have been a fine man. He was my ideal, she answered softly. My other ideal, I mean. From the time I was a slip of a girl, he made me his chum. Until he died, we were always together. Mother died when I was a baby, you know. Many, many times he would take me with him when he made his professional visits to his patients, leaving me in the buggy to wait at each house to be his hitching post, he would say. And on those long rides, sometimes out of the country, he talked to me as though I suppose not very many fathers talked to their daughters. And because he was my father and a physician... And because we were so much alone in our companionship, I believe he was the wisest and best man in all the world and felt that nothing he said or did could ever be wrong. And so you see, my ideal man, the, the man to whom I give myself, 
came to be the kind of a man that my father placed in the highest ranks among men. A man just like you, Stan. In almost the last talk we had before he died, father said to me, and I remember his very words. He said, My daughter, it will not be long now until men will seek you, until someone will ask you to share his life. Make sure you keep your ideal man safe in your heart, daughter, and remember that no matter what a suitor may have to offer of wealth or social rank, if he's not your ideal, if you cannot respect and admire him for his character and manhood alone, say no. Say no, my child, at any cost. But when your ideal man comes, the one who compels your respect and admiration for his strength of character and for the usefulness of his life, the one who you cannot help but love for his manhood alone, mate with him, no matter how light his purse or how lowly his rank in the world. And so you see, as I soon learned to know you, I realized that you were for me. But I wish, oh how I wish that Father could have loved to know you as well. For some time, they watched the dancing campfire flames in silence, as though they had found in their love the true oneness that needed no spoken word. Then Stanford said, to think we've been expecting to wait two years or more. And now, thanks to a soulless corporation, here we are in little less than a year. Thanks to no soulless corporation for that, sir, retorted Helen the Spirit, but thanks to the brains and strength and character of my husband. Two of the three weeks' vacation granted the engineer had passed when Miss Manning, one afternoon, informed her husband that on the ordained provider of the household, it was imperative that he provide some game for their evening meal. And what does Her Majesty the cook desire? he asked. Venison, perhaps? She shook her head with decision. You'd be obligated to go too far and be gone too long to get a deer. But you're going with me, of course. Again, she shook her head. I have something else to do. I can't always be tagging around after you while you're providing, you know. And we might as well begin to be civilized again. Just go a little way, not so far where you can't hear me call, and bring me some nice fat quail like those we had the day yesterday. She watched him disappear into the brush and then busied herself about camp. Presently she heard the gun and smiled as she pictured him hunt for their supper, much as though they were... Two primitive children of nature, instead of the two cultured members of a highly civilized race that they really were. Then, presently, she must go to the spring for water, that he might have a cool drink when he returned. She was halfway to the spring, singing softly to herself, when a sound on the low ridge above camp attracted her attention. Pausing, she looked and listened. The song died on her lips could not be Stanford coming so noisily through the brush from that direction. Even as the thought came, she heard the gun again, a little further away down the narrow valley behind camp, and in the same moment, the noise on the ridge grew louder, as though some heavy animal was crashing through brush. And then, suddenly, as she stood there in frightened indecision, a longhorned Wild-eyed steer broke through the brush on the crest of the ridge and plunged down the steep slope towards the camp. Weak and helpless with fear, Helen could neither scream nor run, but stood fascinated by the very danger that menaced her, powerful even to turn her eyes away from the frightened creature that had so rudely broken the quiet seclusion of the little glade. Behind the steer... Even as the frenzied animal leapt from the brow of the hill, she saw a horseman, as wild as his appearance and his recklessness running nature, as the creature he pursued. Curiously, as in a dream, she saw the horse's neck and shoulders dripping wet with sweat, as with ears flat, nose outstretched, and nostrils wide, the animal strained every nerve in an effort to put his rider in a few feet closer to the escaping quarry. 
She even noted the fringed leather chaps, the faded blue jumper, the broad hat of the rider. In that, in his rein hand, he held the coil of a rope high above the saddle horn, while in his right was the half-open loop. The bridle reins were loose, as though he gave the horse no thought, and they took the steep downward plunge from the summit of the ridge without an instant's pause, and apparently with all the ease and confidence that they would have felt on smooth and level ground. The steer, catching sight of the woman and seeing in her perhaps another enemy, swerved a little in his plunging course and with lowered head charged straight at her. The loop of that rawhide rope was whirling now above the cowboy's head and his spurs drew blood from the heaving flanks of the straining horse as every mad leap of the steer brought death a few feet closer to the helpless woman. The situation must have broken with frightful suddenness upon the man, but he gave no sign, no startled shout, no excited movement. He even appeared to Helen to be deliberately cool, as though no thought of her danger disturbed him. And she realized, even in that awful moment, the cowboy whom she had watched through the field glasses that day of the celebration at Prescott. She could not know that in the same instant as his horse plunged down from the summit of the ridge, Patches had recognized her, and that as his hand swung the riata with such cool, deliberate precision, the man was praying, praying as only a man, seeing the girl he loves face a dreadful death, with no hand but his to save her could pray. God help him if his training of nerve and hand should fail now. Christ pity him if that whirling rope should miss its mark or fall short. His eyes told him that the distance was still too great. He must, he must lessen it again. His spurs drew blood. He must be cool, cool and steady and sure, and he must act now. Helen saw the racing horse make a desperate leap as the spurs tore his heaving sides, and she saw that swiftly whirling loop leave the rider's hand as the man leaned forward in a saddle. Curiously, she watched the loop open with beautiful precision as the coils were loosened and the long, thin line lengthened through the air. It seemed to move so slowly. Those wicked, lowering horns were so near. Then she saw the rider's right hand move with flashlight quickness to the saddle horn as he threw his weight back and the horse with legs braced and hoofs plowing into the ground stopped in half his own length and set his weight against the weight of that steer. The flexible riata straightened as a rod of iron and the steer's head jerked sideways his horns burned themselves into the ground he fell almost at her feet. And then... As the cowboy leapt from his horse, Helen felt herself sinking into the soft, thick darkness that, try as she might, she could not escape. Still master of himself, but with kind of a fierce coolness, Patches ran to the fallen steer and securely tied the animal down. But when he turned to the woman who lay unconscious on the ground, a sob burst from his lips and tears were streaming down his dust-grim cheeks. As he knelt beside her, he called her again, again that name which, a year before, he had whispered as he stood with an empty, outstretched arms alone on the summit of the Divide. Lifting her in his arms, he carried her to the hammock, and finding water and towel, wet her brow and face, and all the while in agony of fear, he talked to her with words of love. Overwrought by the unexpected and to him, Almost the miraculous meeting with Helen, weak and shaken by the strain of those moments of her danger, when her life depended so wholly upon his coolness and skill, unnerved by the sight of her lying so still and white, and beside himself with the strength of his passion, the maiden made no effort to account for her presence in that wild and lonely spot, so far from the scenes amid which he had learned to know and love her. He was conscious only that she was there, that she had been very near to death, that he had held her in his arms, and that he loved her with all the strength of his manhood. Presently, with a low cry of joy, 
he saw the blood creep back into her white cheeks. Slowly, her eyes opened, and she looked wonderingly up into his face. Helen, he breathed. Helen. Why, Larry, she murmured, still confused and wondering. So it was you, after all. But what in the world are you doing here like this? They told me your name was Patches. Then the man spoke. Almost fiercely, his words come without thought. I'm here because I'd do anything. I'd be anything that a man could be and do to win your love. A year ago, when I told you my love and asked you to be my wife, and like the silly, pampered, petted fool that I was, thought that my wealth and the life that I offered could count for anything for a woman like you, you laughed at me. You told me that if ever you married, you'd wed a man, not a fortune or social position. You made me see myself as I was, a useless idler, a dummy for tailors, a superficial chatterer of nothing but vain and shallow women. You told me that I possess not one manly trait of character that could compel the genuine love of an honest woman. You let me see the truth, and that my proposal to you was almost an insult. You made me understand that your very friendship for me was such a friendship as you would have with an amusing, irresponsible boy or spoiled child. You could not even consider my love for you seriously, as a woman like you would consider the love for a strong man, and you were right, Helen. But good grief, it was a bitter, bitter lesson. I went from you, ashamed to look men in the face. I felt myself guilty, a pitiful, weak, and cowardly thing with no right to even exist. In my humiliation, I ran from all who knew me. and I came out here to escape from the life that made me what I was, that robbed me of my manhood. And here, by chance... In the contests at the celebration in Prescott, I saw a man, a cowboy, who possessed everything that I lacked, and for the lack of which you had laughed at me. And then, alone one night, I faced myself, and I fought it out. I knew you were right, Helen, but it was not easy to give up the habits and luxury to which my life I had been accustomed. It was not easy, I say. But my love for you made it a glorious thing to do. And I hoped and believed that if I proved myself a man, I could go back to you in the strength of my manhood and you would listen to me. And so, penniless and a stranger, under an assumed name, I sought useful, necessary work that called for the highest quality of manhood. And I won, Helen. I know that I've won. Today, Patch is the cowboy can look any man in the face. He can take his place and hold his own among men of any class anywhere. I have regained that of which circumstance of birth and inheritance and training robbed me. I have won the right of a man to come to you again. And I claim you now, Helen. I tell you again that I love you. I love you as... Larry, Larry, she cried, springing to her feet, drawing away from him as though not suddenly awake from a strange spell. Larry, you mustn't. What do you mean? How can you say such things to me? He answered her with reckless passion. I say such things because I'm a man and because you are the woman I love and want. Because... She cried out again in protest. Oh, stop, stop. Please stop. Don't you know? Know what? He demanded. My husband, she gasped. Stanford Manning, we're here on our honeymoon. She saw him flinch as though from a heavy blow and put out his hand on the trunk of a tree near where they stood to steady himself. He did not speak, but his lips moved as though he repeated her words to himself over and over again. And he gazed at her with a strange, bewildered, doubting look as though he could not believe his own suffering. Impulsively, Helen took a step towards him. Larry! 
Her voice seemed to arouse him, and he stood erect as though by conscious will of effort. Then, that old self-mocking smile was upon his lips. He was laughing at his hurt, making sport of himself in his cruel predicament. But to Helen, there was that in his smile which wrung her woman heart. Oh, Larry, she said gently, forgive me, I'm sorry, I... He put out his hand with a gesture of protest, and his voice was calm and courteous. I beg your pardon, Helen. It was stupid of me to not have understood. I forgot myself for a moment. It was all so unexpected meeting you like this. I didn't think. He turned away towards his waiting horse and to the steer laying on the ground. So, you and Stanford Manning. Good old Stan. I'm glad for him. And for you too, Helen. Why, it was I who introduced him to you, do you remember? He smiled again, that mirthless, self-mocking smile as he added, without giving her time to speak. If you'll excuse me for a moment, I'll rid your camp of this unwelcome presence of that beast over yonder. Then he went towards his horse, as though turning for relief to the work that had become so familiar to him. She watched him while he released the steer and drove the animal away over the ridge, where he permitted it to escape into the wild haunts where it lived its outlaw companions. When he rode back to the little camp, Stanford had returned. For an hour they talked together as old friends, but Helen, well, she offered now and then a word or remark or asked a question, or laughed and smiled with them, left the talk mostly to the two men. Stanford, when the first shock of learning of Helen's narrow escape was over, was gaily enthusiastic and warm of his admiration of his old friend, who, for no apparent reason but the wish to assert his own manhood, turned his back upon the ease and luxury of his wealth to live a life of adventurous hardship. And Patches, as he insisted they should call him, with many a jesting laugh and droll comment, told them of his new life and work. He was only serious when he made them promise to keep his identity a secret until he himself was ready to reveal his real name. And what do you propose to do when your game of patches is played out? Stanford asked curiously. For an instant, they saw him smiling mockingly at himself and answered lightly, Well, probably try some other fool experiment, I reckon. Stanford chuckled. The reply was so like the cowboy patches, and so unlike his old friend Larry Knight. As for that, Stan, Patches continued, I don't see that the game will ever be played out, as you say. Certainly, I can never now go back altogether to what I was. The fellow you used to know in Cleveland is not really I, you see. Fact is, I think that fellow's quite dead. Peace to be his ashes. The world is wide and there's always work for a man to do. The appearance of Phil Acton on the ridge, at the spot where the steer, followed by Patches, had first appeared, put an end to the further conversation with Lawrence Knight. My boss, said that gentleman, in his character of the Patches the Cowboy, as the cross triangle foreman halted his horse, on the brow of the hill, and sat looking down upon the camp. Be careful, please, and don't let him suspect that you ever saw me before. I'll sure catch it now for loafing so long. I know him, said Stanford. Then he called to the man above. Come on down, Acton. Be sociable. Phil rode into camp and shook hands with Stanford quarterly, and was presented to Miss Manning, to whom he spoke with a touch of embarrassment. And then he said, with a significant look at Patches, I'm glad to meet you people, Mr. Mannings, but we really haven't much time for to be social right now. Mr. Baldwin sent me with an outfit into this granite basin country to gather some of those outlaw steers. He expects us to be on the job. Turning to Patches, he continued, when you didn't come back, I thought you must have met with some serious trouble and trailed you. We've managed to lose a good deal of time altogether. 
That steer you were after to get away, did he? Helen spoke quickly. Oh, Mr. Acton, you mustn't blame Mr. Patches for what happened. Really, you mustn't. No one was to blame, it just happened. She stopped, unable to ex finish the explanation, for she was thinking of the part of the incident which was known only to herself and Patches. Stanford told in a few words of his wife's danger and how the cowboy had saved her. That's some mighty good work, Patches, Phil said heartily. Mighty good work. I'm sorry, Mr. Mannings, that are coming up here after those outlaws happened just at this time. It's too bad that we disturbed you and Miss Manning. We're going home Friday. However, I'll tell the boys to keep clear your neighborhood in the meantime. As the two cross triangle men walked their horses, Helen and Stanford heard Phil ask, But where's that steer, Patches? I'll let him go. You let him go? exclaimed the foreman. After you had him roped and tied? What'd you do that for? Patches was confused. Really, I don't know. I'd like to know what you figure we're up here for, said Phil sharply. You not only wasted two or three hours visiting with those people, but you take my time trailing you up, and then you lose a steer after you get them. It looks like you've lost your head mighty bad after all. I'm afraid you're right, Phil, Patches answered quietly. Helen looked at her husband, but Stanford was grinning with delight. To think, he murmured, of Larry Knight taking a dressing down like that from a mere cowboy foreman. But Patches was by no means so meek in spirit as he appeared on his outward manner. He had been driven almost to the verge of desperation by the trying situation and was fighting for self-control. To take his foreman's rebuke in the presence of his friends was not easy. I reckon I'd better send you to the home ranch tonight instead of Bob, continued Phil, as the two men mounted their horses and sat for a moment facing each other. It looks like we could spare you best. Tell Uncle Will to send the chuck wagon and three more punchers and that we'll start for the home ranch Friday. And be sure you get back here tomorrow. Shall I go now? Yes, you can go now. Patches wheeled his horse and rode away while Phil disappeared over the ridge in the direction from which he had come. When the two cowboys were out of sight, Helen went straight to her husband, and to Stanford's consternation when he took her into his arms, she was crying. What? What is it? he said, holding her close. But she only answered between sobs as she clung to him. It's, it's nothing. Never mind, Stan. I'm just upset. And Stanford quite naturally thought it was only a case of nerves caused by the danger through which she had just passed. For nearly an hour, Patches rode towards the home ranch, taking only such notice of his surroundings as was necessary in order for him to keep direction. Through the brush and timber, over the ridges, down into the valleys and washes, and along the rock-strewn mountain slides, he allowed his horse to pick his way and take his own gait with scarcely a touch of rein or spur. The twilight hour was beginning when he reached a point from which he could see in the distance the red roofs of the cross triangle buildings. Checking his horse, he sat for a long time motionless, looking away over the broad land that had come to mean so much to him, as though watching the passing of the day. But the man did not note the changing colors in the western skies. He did not see the shadows deepening. He was not thinking of the coming of night. The sight of the distant spot that, a year before, had held such possibilities for him when, on the summit of the Divide, he had chosen between two wildly separated ways of life brought to him now a keener realization of the fact that he was again placed where he must choose. The sun was down upon those hopes and dreams that in the first hard weeks of his testing had inspired and strengthened him. The night of despairing, recklessness, abandonment of the very ideals of manhood 
for which he had so bravely struggled, was upon him. While the spirit and strength of that manhood, which he had so hardly attained, fought against its surrender. When Stanford had asked, What will you do when your game of patches is played out? He had said that the man whom they had known in the old days was dead. Would this new man also die? Deliberately the man turned about and started back the way he had come. In their honeymoon camp that evening, when the only light in the sky was the light of the stars and the campfire's ruddy flames made weird shadows come and go in the little glade, Helen, laying in the hammock and Stanford, sitting near her, talking of their old friend Lawrence Knight. But as they talked, they did not know that a lonely horseman had stopped on the other side of the low ridge, and leaving his horse had crept quietly through the brush to a point on the low brow of the hill where he could look down into the camp. From where he lay in the darkness, the man could see against the camp's firelight the two, where the hammock swung under the trees, he could hear the low murmur of their voices with now and then a laugh. But it was always the man who laughed, for there was little mirth in Helen's heart that night. Then he saw Stanford go into the tent and return again to the hammock, and soon there came floating up to him the sweet, plaintive music of Helen's guitar, and then her voice, full and low, with a wealth of womanhood in the tone, as she sang a love song to her mate. Later, when the dancing flames of the campfire had fallen to a dull red glow, he saw them go arm in arm into their tent, and then all was still. The red glow of the fire dimmed to a spark, and darkness drew close about the scene. But even in the darkness, the man could still see under the wide, sheltering arms of the trees a lighter spot, the white tent. Gethsemane said the dean to me once, when our talk had ranged wide and touched upon many things. Gethsemane ain't no place, it's something that happens. Whenever a man goes up against himself, right there is where Gethsemane is. And right there, too, it's sure to be a fight. A man might not always know about it at the time. He might be too busy fighting to understand just what it means, but He'll know about it afterward. No matter which side of him wins, he'll know afterwards that it was one big fight for his life. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 When those days at Prescott were over and Mr. and Mrs. Manning had left their camp in Granite Basin, Kitty Reed returned to Williamson Valley reluctantly. She felt that with Phil... Definitely, out of her life, the last interest that bound her to the scenes of her girlhood was broken. Before many weeks, the ranch would be sold. A Prescott agent had opened negotiations for an eastern client who would soon be out to look over the property, and Mr. Reed felt, from all that the agent had said, the sale was assured. In the meantime, Katie would wait as patiently as she could to help her there would be Helen's visit, and there was her friendship with Professor Parkhill. It was not strange, considering all the circumstances, that the young woman should give her time more generously ever to the only person in the neighborhood, except Patches, perhaps, who she felt could understand and appreciate her desires for the higher life of which her own parents had been ignorant. And the professor did understand her fully. He told her so many times every day. Had he not given all the years of his little life to the study of those refined and spiritual truths that were so far above the comprehension of the based and ignorant common herd? Indeed, he understood her language. He understood fully why the sordid, brutal materialism of her crude and uncultured environment so repulsed and disgusted her. He understood more fully than Kitty herself, in fact, and explained to her clearly that her desires for a higher intellectual and spiritual life was born of her own rare gifts, evidence beyond all questions the fineness and delicacies of her nature. 
he rejoiced with her, with a pure and holy joy that she would so soon be set free to live amid the surroundings that would afford her those opportunities for the higher development of her intellectual and spiritual powers which her soul was craving. All this he told her from day to day, and then one afternoon he told her more. It was the same afternoon that Patches had so unexpectedly found Helen and Stanford in the, their granite basin camp. Kitty and the professor had driven in the buckboard to Simmons for the mail and were coming back by the road to the cross triangle when the man said, "'Must we return to the ranch so soon? "'It's so delightful out here where there's no one to intrude with their vulgar commonplace "'and mar our companionship.' "'Why, no,' returned Kitty. "'There is no need for us to hurry home.' "'She glanced around. "'We might sit over there under those cedars on the hill, "'where you found me with Mr. Patches that day, "'the day we saw Yawk by Joe, you remember?' "'Well, if you think it's quite safe to leave the vehicle,' he said, "'I'll be delighted.' Kitty tied the horses to the convenient bushes at the foot of the low hill, and soon they were in the welcoming shade of the cedars. "'Miss Reed,' the professor began with much gravity, "'I must confess that I have been rather puzzled to account for your presence here that day,' with such a man as that fellow Patches. You'll pardon my saying so, I'm sure, but you must have observed my very deep interest in you. I also chanced to see you with him one day in Prescott in the park. You don't mind me speaking of it. Not at all, Professor Parkhill. Kitty returned, smiling, as she thought of how ignorant the professor was of the cowboy's real character. I like Patches. He interests me very much and there's really no reason why I should not be friendly with them. Do you think I should not be friendly with all of our cowboys? I suppose, the professor sighed, but it hurts me to see you with anything whatever is common with such a man. It shocks me to know that you must in any degree come in touch with such fellows. I shall be very glad indeed when you're free of such kindly obligations and safe from those amongst your own class. Kitty found it very hard to reply. She did not wish to be disloyal to Patches and her many Williamson Valley friends, nor did she like to explain how Patches had played a part for the professor's benefit, for she felt that by not exposing the deception she had, in a way, been a party to it. So she said nothing but seemed to silently weigh the value of her learned companion's observations. At least, it so appeared to the professor, and in her ready acceptance of his implied criticism of her conduct, he found the encouragement he needed for what followed. "'You must understand, Miss Reed, that I have become exceedingly zealous of your welfares. In these months that we've been together, your companionship, your spiritual and intellectual companionship, I should say, has been very dear to me. As our souls have communed, I have felt myself uplifted and inspired. I have been strengthened and encouraged, as never before, to, to climb on towards the mountain peaks of pure education. If I am not mistaken, you have, too, felt a degree of uplift as a result of our fellowship, have you not? "'Yes, indeed,' Kitty answered sincerely. "'Our talks together have meant much to me, more than I could tell. "'I'll never forget this summer. "'Your friendship has been a wonderful influence in my life.' "'The little man moved uneasily and glanced timidly around. "'I'm glad to know that our friendship has not altogether been distasteful to you. "'I felt sure that it wasn't, but I... Uh, I'm glad to hear you confirm my opinion, and it enables me to say which for several weeks have been weighing heavily on my mind. Kitty looked at him with the manner of a trusting disciple waiting for the gems of truth that were about to fall from the lips of the venerable teacher. Miss Reed, uh, why need our beautiful, mutual, profitable companionship cease? 
I fear I don't understand, Professor Parkhill. She answered, puzzled by his question. He looked at her with a shade of mild, very mild rebuke as he returned. Why, I think that I've stated my thought clearly. I mean, I'm very desirous of our relationship. The relation which we have both found so helpful should continue. I'm sure that we have, in these months which we've spent together, sufficient evidence that our souls vibrate in perfect harmony. I need you, dear friend. Your understanding of my soul's desires is so sympathetic. I feel that you compliment and fill out, as it were, my spiritual self. I need you to encourage, to inspire, to assist me in the noble work to which I am devoted, all in my strength. She looked at him now with an expression of amazement. Do you mean, she faltered in confusion while the red blood colored her cheeks. Yes, he answered confidently. I'm asking you to be my wife. Not, however, in the common vulgar understanding of the relationship. I'm offering you, my dear friend, that, that which is vastly higher than the union of a mere animal which is based wholly upon the pure physical and material attraction, I'm proposing marriage of our souls, a union, if you please, of, of our higher intellectual and spiritual selves. I feel, indeed, that by these higher laws, which the vulgar and beast-like minds are incapable of recognizing, we are as one. I sense, as it were, that oneness, which can exist only when two souls are mated by the great oversoul, I feel that you are already mine, and that I am, that we are already united in spiritual union, that is. The young woman checked him with a gesture which, had he interpreted it rightly, was one of repulsion. Please stop, Professor Parkhill, she gasped in a tone of disgust. He was surprised and not a little chagrin. Am I to understand that you do not reciprocate my sentiment, Mrs. Reed? Is it possible that perhaps I've been mistaken? Kitty turned her head as though she could not even bear to look at him. What you ask is impossible, she said in a low tone. Impossible. Strive as she might, the young woman could not altogether hide her feeling of abhorrence. And yet, she asked herself, why should this man's proposal arouse in her such a agitism and such repugnance? He was a scholar, famed for his attainments in the world of the highest culture. As his wife, she would be admitted at once into a, the very inner circle of that life to which she aspired, and for which she was leaving her old home and friends. He had couched his proposal in the very terms of the spirituality and intellectual intellect. He had declared himself in that language which she was so proudly thought that she understood, and in which she had so often talked with him, and yet she was humiliated and ashamed. It was to her as though, in placing his offer of marriage upon the high, pure ground of spiritual union, he had insulted her womanhood. Kitty realized wonderingly that she had not felt like this when Phil had confessed his love to her. In her woman heart she was proud and glad to have won the love of such a man as Phil, even though she could not accept a cowboy as her mate. On that very spot, which the professor had chosen for his declaration, Patches had told her that she was leaving the glorious and enduring realities of life for vain and foolish bubbles, that she was throwing aside the good grain and choosing the husks. Was this what Patches meant? she wondered. I regret exceedingly, Mrs. Reed, the professor said, that the pure and lofty sentiments which I have voiced did not seem to find a like response in your soul. I... Again she interrupted with a gesture of repulsion. Please do not say any more, Professor Parkhill. I fear that I'm very human after all. Come, it's time we return to the house. All through the remaining hours of that afternoon and evening, Kitty was disturbed and troubled. At times she wanted to laugh at the professor's ridiculous proposal, and again 
her cheeks burned with anger, and she could have cried in her shame and humiliation. And, with it all, her mind was distraught by the persistent question. Was it not the professor's conception of an ideal mating the legitimate and logical conclusion of those very advanced ideas of culture which he represented, and which she had so admired? If she sincerely believed the life represented by the professor and his kind was so superior, so far above the life represented by Phil Acton, why should she not feel honor, instead of being humiliated and shamed by the professor, that she could not call it love? If the life which Phil had asked her to share was so low in the scale of civilization, if it were so far beneath the intellectual and spiritual ideals which she had formed, why did she feel so honored by the strong man's love? Why had she not felt humiliated and ashamed that Phil should have asked her to mate with him? Could it be, she asked herself again and again, that there was something, after all, superior to that culture which she was so truly thought stood of the highest ideals of the race. Could it be that in the land of Granite Mountain there was something, after all, that was superior to the things which she had been taught, as Granite Mountain itself was superior to the primitive strength and enduring grandeur to the man-made buildings of her school? It was not strange that Kitty's troubled thoughts should turn to Helen Manning. Clearly, Helen's education had led to no confusion. On the contrary, she had found an ideal love and a happiness such as every true womanly woman must in her hearts of hearts desire. It was far into the night when Kitty, wakeful and restless, heard the sounds of the horse's feet. She could not know that it was Honorable Patches riding past on his way to the ranch on the other side of the broad valley meadows. Weary in body, and with mind and spirit exhausted by the trials through which he had passed, Patches crept to his bed. In the morning, when he delivered the message, the dean, seeing the man's face, encouraged him to stay for the day at the ranch. But Patches said no, Phil was expecting him, and he must return to the outfit in Granite Basin. As soon as breakfast was over, he set out. He had ridden as far as the head of Mint Wash, and had stopped to drink water his horses and to refresh himself with a cool drink and a brief rest beside the fragrant, mint-bordered spring when he heard someone riding rapidly up the wash the way he had come. A moment later, Kitty... Riding her favorite midnight, rounded a jutting corner of the rocky wall on the bluff. As the girl caught sight of him, there beside the spring, she waved her hand in greeting. And the man, as he waved his answer, and watching her ride towards him, felt a thrill of gladness that she had come. The strong, true friendship that began with their very first meeting, when she had been so frankly interested in the tender foot and so kindly helpful, and which had developed so steadily through the year, gave him now a feeling of comfort and relief. Wearied and worn by his disappointment, and with his struggle with himself, with the cherished hope that had enabled him to choose and endure the hard life of range brought to a sudden end, with his life it suddenly so empty and futile, he welcomed his woman friend with a warmth and gladness that brought a flush of pleasure to Kitty's cheek. For Kitty, too, had just passed through a humiliating and disappointing experience. In her troubled frame of mind, and in her perplexing and confused questioning, the young woman was as glad for the companionship of Patches as he was glad to welcome her. She felt a curious sense of relief and safety in his presence, somewhat as one who, walking over uncertain bogs or treacherous quicksands, finds all at once, the solid ground. I saw you go past the house, she said when she reached the spring where he stood waiting. And I decided right then that I'd go along with you to Granite Basin and visit my friends in the Mannings. They told me that I might come this week, and 
I think they have quite enough honeymooning anyway. You know where they're camped, do you? Yeah, he answered. I saw them yesterday. But come on, get down and cool off a bit. You've been riding some, haven't you? I wanted to catch you as soon as I could, she laughed as she sprang lightly to the ground. And you see you gained a good start while I was getting midnight salad. What a pretty spot. I must have a drink of that water this minute. Sorry, I have no cup, he said. Then he laughed with the pleasure of a good companionship as she answered. You forget that I was born to the customs of this country. And throwing aside her broad hat, she went down on the ground to drink from the spring, even as he had done. As the man watched her, a sudden thought flashed into his mind, a thought so startling, so unexpected, that he, for a moment, was bewildered. "'Talk about the nectar of the gods!' cried Kitty with a deep breath of satisfaction as she lifted her smiling face from the bright water to look up at him, and then she drank again. "'And now, if you please, sir, you may bring me some of that watercress. We'll sit over there in the shade.' And who cares whether Granite Basin, the Mannings, and your fellow cowpunchers are fifteen or fifty miles away? He brought a generous bunch of the watercress and stretched himself full length beside her as she sat on the ground under a tall sycamore. He laughed. We seem to lack only the book of verses, the loaf, and the jug. The wilderness is here, all right, and there's a perfectly good bow up there, and of course, you could furnish a song. I might recite the boy stood on the burning deck, and but alas, we haven't even a flask and a biscuit. What a pity that you should be so near yet so far from paradise, she retorted quickly, and then added with a mischievous smile. Well, it just so happens I have a sandwich in my saddle pocket. Well, won't you sing? Please do, he returned with an eagerness that amused her. But she shook her head reprovingly. We still lack the jug of wine, you know, and really, I don't think that paradise is for cowpunchers anyways, do you think? Evidently not, he answered. In utter jesting words, a queer feeling of rebellion possessed him. Why should he be condemned to years of loneliness? Why must he face a life without the companionship of a mate? If the paradise he had sought so hard to attain were denied him, why should he not still take what happiness he might? He was laying flat on his back, his hands clasped beneath his head, watching the eagle that wheeled a tiny black speck high under the blue arch of the sky. He seemed to have forgotten his companion. Kitty leaned towards him and held a sprig of water crest over his upturned face. I haven't a penny, she said, but I'll give you this. He sat up quickly. Even at that price, my thoughts might cost you too much. But you haven't told me what you've done with your dear friend, the professor. Haven't you a guilty conscience deserting him like this? Kitty held up both hands in a gesture of dismay. Don't, Patches. Please don't. If you only knew how good it was to be with a man again. He laughed aloud in a spirit of reckless defiance. And Phil is over there in Granite Basin. I neglected to tell you that he knows the location of the Manning camp as well as I. Kitty was a little puzzled by the tone of his laughter and by his words. She spoke gravely. Perhaps I should tell you, Patches. We've been good friends, you and I and Phil. Yes, he said. Phil is nothing to me, Patches. I mean... You mean in the way he wanted to be? He helped with a touch of ready eagerness. Yes. And have you told him, Kitty? Patches asked gently. Yes, I, I have told him, she replied. Patches was silent for a moment, and then... Poor Phil, he said softly. I understand now. I thought that was it. 
He's a man among thousands, Kitty. I know, I know, she returned as though dismissing the subject, but, but it simply can't be. Patches was looking at her intently with an expression in his dark eyes that Kitty had never seen before. The man's mind was in a whirl of quick excitement. As they had talked and laughed together, the thought that had so startled him, when her manner of familiar comradeship had brought such a feeling of comfort onto his troubled spirit, had not left him. From that first moment of their meeting a year before, there had been that feeling between them of companionship, a feeling which had grown as their acquaintance had developed into an intimate friendship that had allowed him to speak to her as he'd spoken that day under the cedars on the ridge. What might that friendship not grow into? He thought of her desire for the life that he knew so well, and how he could, with the granting every witch of her heart, yet protect her from the shames and the falsenesses. And with these thoughts was that feeling of rebellion against the loneliness of his life. Kitty's words regarding Phil removed the barrier, as it were, and the man's nature which prompted him so often to act without pausing to consider betrayed him into saying, Would you be greatly shocked, Kitty, if I were to tell you that I'm glad? That while I'm sorry for Phil, I'm, I'm glad that you've said no to him? You're glad? Why? she said wonderingly. Because now I'm free to say what I could not have said had you not told me what you have. I want you, Kitty. I want you to fill your life with beauty and happiness and one with contentment. I want you to go with me to see and know the natural wonders of the world and the wonders that men have wrought. I want to surround you with the beauties of art and literature with everything that your heart craves. I want you to know the people whose friendship would be a delight to you. Come with me, girl, and be my wife, and together we can find, if not paradise, at least a full and useful and contented, happy life. Will you come, Kitty? Would you come with me? As she listened, her eyes grew big with wonder and delight. It was as though for some good genie had suddenly opened wide the way to an enchanted land. Then the gladness went swiftly from her face, and she said doubtfully, you're joking with me, Patches. As she spoke his cowboy name, the man laughed aloud. I forget that you don't even know me. I mean, you don't even know my name. Are you some fairy prince in disguise, Sir Patches? Not a fairy, dear, but and certainly not a prince, just a man, that's all. But a man, dear girl, who can offer you a clean life an honorable name, and all of which I have spoken. But I must tell you, I always knew that I would tell you some day, but I did not dream it would be today. My name is Lawrence Knight. My home is in Cleveland, Ohio. Your father can easily satisfy himself to my family and my own personal life and standing. It is enough for me to assure you now, dear, that I am abundantly able to give you all that I have promised. At the mention of his name, Kitty's eyes grew bright again. Thanks to her intimate friend and schoolmate, Helen Manning, she knew much about Lawrence Knight, more than the gentleman had supposed. But tell me, she asked, curiously trembling with excitement, why is Mr. Lawrence Knight masquerading around here as the cowboy Honorable Patches. He answered earnestly, I know it must seem strange to you, but the simple truth is that I became ashamed of myself and my life of idle uselessness. I determined to see if I could take my place among men simply as a man. I wanted to be accepted by men for myself, for my manhood, if you like. If not, and not because of my, he hesitated and then said frankly, because of my money and social position. I wanted to depend upon myself 
to live as other men live by my own strength and courage and work. If I had given my real name when I asked for work at the Cross Triangle, somebody would have found me out before too long and my little experiment would have failed. Don't you see? While he spoke, Kitty's excited mind had caught at many details. She believed sincerely that her girlhood love for Phil was dead. This man, even as Patch as the cowboy, with a questionable shadow on his life, had compelled her respect and confidence, while in his evident education and social culture had won her deepest admiration. She felt that he was all that Phil was, and more. There was in her feeling toward him, as he offered himself to her now, no hint of the instinctive repulsion and abhorrence with which she had received Professor Park Hill's declaration of spiritual aphne. Her recent experience with the master of aesthetics had so outraged her womanly instincts that the inevitable reaction from her perplexed and troubled mind led her to feel more deeply and to be drawn more strongly towards this man with whom any woman might be proud to mate. At the same time, the attraction of the life which she knew he could give her, and for which she so longed so for passionately with the relief of the thought that her parents would not need to sacrifice themselves for her, were potent factors in the power of Lawrence Knight's appeal. It'd be wonderful, she said musingly. I've dreamed and dreamed about such things. You'll come with me, dear? You'll let me give you your heart's wish? You'll go with me into the life of which you're so fitted? Do you really want me, Patches? She asked timidly, as though in her mind there was still a shadow of doubt. More than anything in the world, he urged. Say yes, Kitty. Say that you'll be my wife. The answer came softly, with a hint of questioning. Yes. Kitty did not notice that the man had not spoken of his love for her. There were so many things for her to consider, so many other things to distract her mind. Nor did the man notice that Kitty herself had failed to speak in any way that little word which rightly understood holds in the fullest and deepest meaning all of life's happiness, of labor and accomplishment, of success and triumph, of sacrifice and sorrow, holds in its fullest and deepest meaning, indeed, all of life itself. End of chapter 14. Chapter 15 Kitty's friends were very glad to welcome her at their camp in Granite Basin. The incident which had so rudely broken the seclusion of their honeymoon had been too nearly a tragedy to be easily forgotten. The charm of the place in some degree for them was lost, and Kitty's coming helped to dispel the cloud that had little overshadowed those last days in their outing. It was not at all difficult for them to persuade Kitty to remain longer than one night that she had planned and accompany them back to Prescott. From Prescott, Stanford must go to the mines and take up his work and to arrange for Helen's coming later, and Helen would go home with Kitty for the visit that she had promised. The cowboys, who were returning to the Cross Triangle Ranch, would take Kitty's horse to her home and carry a message explaining the young woman's absence and ask that someone be sent to Prescott with the clothing that she would need in town and that the Reed automobile might be in Prescott in readiness to take the two young women back to the ranch on the appointed day. Kitty could not bring herself to tell Helen about her engagement to Lawrence Knight, or Patches, as she would continue to call him, until the time came for the cowboy himself to make his true name and character known. It had all happened so suddenly. The promises of the future were so wonderful so far beyond the young woman's fondest dreams that she herself could scarcely realize the truth. There'd be time enough to tell Helen when they were together at the ranch, and she was insistent, too, that Patches must not interview her father 
until she herself had returned home. Phil and his cowboys with the cattle reached the Cross Triangle Corrals the evening before the day set for Kitty and Helen to arrive at the ranch on the other side of the Valley Meadows. The Cross Triangle men were greeted by the news that Professor Park Hill had said goodbye to Williamson Valley and that the Pothook S ranch had been sold. The eastern purchaser, expected by Reed, had arrived on the day that Kitty had gone to the Granite Basin and the deal had been closed without delay. But Reed was not to give up possession of the property until after the fall rodeo. As the men sat under the walnut trees with the dean that evening, discussing the incidences of the granite basin work and speculating about the new owner of the neighboring ranch, Phil sat with little Billy apart from the circle and contributed to the conversation only now and then a word or a brief answer in some question. When Miss Baldwin persuaded the child that it was bedtime. Phil slipped quietly away in the darkness, and they didn't see him again until after breakfast the next morning. When breakfast was over, the foreman gave a few directions to his men and then rode away alone. The dean, understanding the lad, whom he loved as one of his own sons, watched him go without a word or a question. To Miss Baldwin he said, Just... Let him alone, Stella. The boy's all right. You'll only be gone off somewhere on the range to fight it out alone. Most likely he'll put in the day watching those wild horses over there behind Tule Mountain. He generally goes by them when he's bothered about anything or in trouble of any sort. Patches, who had been sent on an errand of some kind to Fair Oaks, was returning home early in the afternoon and had reached the neighborhood of that spring where he had first encountered Nick Cambert when he heard a calf bawling lustfully somewhere in the cedar timber not too far away. Familiar as he was now with the voices of the ranges, the cowboy knew that the calf was in trouble. The call was one of fright and pain. Turning aside from his course, he rode rapidly at first and then more cautiously towards the sound. Presently he caught the whiff of a smoke that came with the light breeze from somewhere ahead on the ridge along where he was riding. Instantly he rode into a thick clump of cedars and dismounted and tied his horse. Then he went on, carefully and silently on foot. Soon he heard voices. Again the calf bawled in fright and pain and the familiar odor of burning hair was carried to him on the breeze. Someone was branding a calf. It might be all right. It might not. Patches was unarmed, but with a characteristic disregard of consequences, he crept slowly forward towards a dense growth of trees and brush from beyond which the noise and the smoke seemed to come. He had barely gained the cover when he heard someone on the other side ride rapidly down the ridge. Hastily parting the brush, he looked through to catch a glimpse of the horseman. But he was a moment too late. The rider had disappeared from sight into the timber. But in the open space beyond the cedars, the cowboy saw Yakpa Joe standing beside a calf, freshly branded with the four bar M iron and earmarked with the tally holt marks. Patches knew instantly, as well as though he had witnessed the actual branding, what had happened. That part of the range was seldom visited, except by the Dean's cowboys and the tally holt mountain men, knowing that the cross triangle riders were all at the granite basin, were making good use of their opportunities. The man who had ridden away so hurriedly, a moment too soon for Patches to see him, was without a doubt driving the mother of the calf to a distance that would effectually separate her from her offspring. But, while he was so sure in his own mind, the cross-triangle man, as to what had happened before, had arrived at the scene too late. He had no positive evidence that the animal just branded was not the legal property of Nick Cambert. As Patches stepped from the brush, Joe faced him for a moment, in guilty astonishment and fear, 
and then he ran towards his horse. Wait a minute, Joe, called Patches. What good will it do for you to run now? I'm not going to harm you. Joe stopped and stood hesitating in indecision, watching the intruder with that sneaking sideways look. Come on, Joe. Let's have us a little talk about this business, the cross-triangle man said in a matter-of-fact tone as he seated himself on a large flat-topped stone near the little fire. You know you can't get away, so you might as well. I, I ain't telling nobody nothing, said Joe sullenly as he came slowly towards the dean's cowboy. No, said Patches. No, I ain't, asserted the tally holt man stoutly. That there calf is for bar M calf, all right. I see that it is, returned the cross triangle rider calmly. But I'll just wait until Nick gets back and ask him what it was before when he worked over with it the iron. Joe, excited and confused by the cool nerve of this man, fell readily into the verbal trap. You you better go now and not wait to ask Nick no fool questions like that. If he finds you here talking with me when he gets back, hell hell be a poppin' for sure. Me and you are friends, Patches, and that's why I'm telling you you better pull your freight while the going is good. Much obliged, Joe, but there's no hurry. You don't need to be so rushed. It'll be an hour before Nick gets back if he drives that cow as far as he ought to. Again, poor Yuck by Joe told more than he intended. You don't need to worry about Nick. He, he'll sure drive her far enough. He ain't taking no chances, Nick. He ain't no, sir. With his convictions so readily confirmed, Patches had good ground upon which to base his falling remarks. He had made a long shot when he spoke so confidently of the brand on the calf being worked over. For, of course, the calf might not have been branded at all when the Tally Holt man caught it, but Joe's manner, as well as his warning answer, told him that the shot had gone home. The fact that the brand had been worked over established also the fact that it was the cross triangle brand that had been changed, because the cross triangle was the only brand in that part of the country that could be changed over to the four bar M. Patches dropped his easy manner and spoke straight to the point. Look here, Joe. You and me might as well get down to cases. You know I'm your friend, and I don't want to see you in trouble, but you can take it from me that you're in mighty serious trouble right now. I was hiding right back in those bushes, close enough to see it all happen, and I know that this is a cross-triangle calf, and that you and Nick worked that brand over. You know that it means the penitentiary for you as well as Nick, if the boys don't string you up both before without any ceremony. Patches let his words sick in. Joe's face was ashy white and he was shaken with fright as he stole a sneaking look towards his horse. Patches added sharply, You can't give me the slip either. I can kill you before you get halfway to your horse. Trapped and helpless, Joe looked pleadingly at his captor. You wouldn't send me up to the penitentiary, would you now, Patches? He whined. You and me, we good friends, ain't we? Anyway, he, he wouldn't let me go to the pen, and the boys wouldn't das and do nothing to me when they knew. Who are you talking about? demanded Patches. Nick? Don't be a fool, Joe. Nick will be here right alongside with you. I, I didn't mean Nick. I mean him over there on the cross triangle. Uh, P Professor Parkhill, I'm telling you that he wouldn't let you do nothing to me. Forget it, Joe, came the reply without an instant hesitation. You know as well as I do how much chance Professor Parkhill or anyone else would have to try and 
keep the boys from making you and Nick dance on nothing once they hear this. Besides, the professor's not in the valley anymore. The poor outcast fright was pitiful. You ain't meaning that he that he that he's gone? He gasped. Listen, Joe," said Patches quickly. "I can do more for you than he could, even if he were here. You know I'm your friend, and I don't want to see a good fellow like you sent to prison for fifteen, twenty years, or even hanged. But there's only one way that I can see to save you. You must come with me to the Cross Triangle." And Tell Mr. Baldwin all about it, and how you were just working for Nick, and how he made you help him do this, and all that you know. If you do that, we can get you off. I, I, I reckon you're right, Patches, returned the frightened weakling sullenly. Pa, pa, n n Nick has always treated me like a dog anyway. You, you won't let Nick get me, will you, if I go? Nothing can get at you, Joe, if you go with me, and if you do the square thing. I'm going to take care of you myself and help you get out of this and brace up and be a man. Come on, we got to get going. I'll turn this calf loose, though, first. He was bending over the calf when a noise in the brush caused him to stand suddenly erect. Joe was whimpering with terror. Patches said fiercely, but in a low tone, Shut up and follow my lead. Be a man, and I'll get you out of this yet. Nick will kill us, sure, whined Joe. Not if I get my hands on him first, he won't, retorted Patches. But it was a feeling of relief that the cowboy saw Phil act and ride towards them from the shelter of the timber. Before Patches could speak, Phil's gun covered him and the foreman's voice rang out sharply. Hands up! Joe's hands shot over his head, and Patches hesitated. Quick, said Phil. And as Patches saw the man's eyes over the black barrel of the weapon, he obeyed, but as he raised his hands, a dull flush of anger colored his tanned face a deeper red, and his eyes grew dark with passion. He realized his situation instantly. The mystery that surrounded his first appearance when he sought employment at the Cross Triangle, the persistent suspicion of many of the cowboys because of his friendship for Yacht by Joe, with his meeting with Joe, which the professor had reported, his refusal to explain to Phil his return to the ranch when everyone was away and he himself was supposed to be in Prescott. All these and many more incidences had come to their legitimate climax in his presence, on that spot with the occupied Joe, the smoldering fire, and the freshly branded calf. He was unarmed, but Phil could not be sure that for many a cowboy carries his gun inside the leg of his leather chaps, where it would not so easily catch on the brush. But while Patches saw it all so clearly, he was enraged that this man with whom he had lived so intimately should believe him capable of such a crime and treat him without question as a common cattle thief. Phil's coolness towards him, which had grown so gradually during the past three months, in this humiliation reached a point beyond which Patch's patience and consideration and endurance could not go. The man's sense of justice was outraged. His fine feeling of honor was insulted. Trapped and helpless as he was, under the menacing gun, he was possessed by a determination to defend himself against the accusation and to teach Phil Acton that there was a limit to the insult he would endure, even in the name of friendship. To this end, his only hope was to trap his foreman with words, as he had caught Yock by Joe. At a game of words, Honorable Patches was no unskilled novice. Controlling his anger, he said coldly with biting sarcasm, while he looked at the cowboy with a mocking sneer. You don't propose to take any chances, do you, holding up an unarmed man? Patches saw by the flush that swept over Phil's cheeks how his words bit. I don't take chances with your kind, 
retorted the foreman hotly. No, mocked Patches, but it will pay big, I suppose, for the great wild horse Phil to be branded as a sneak and a coward who's afraid to face an unearned man unless he can get the drop on him. Phil was goaded to madness by the cool, mocking words. With a reckless laugh, he slipped his weapon into the holster and sprang to the ground. At the same moment, Patches and Joe lowered their hands, and Joe, unnoticed by either of the angry men, took a stealthy step towards his horse. Patches deliberately folded his arms and stood looking at Patches. I'll just call your bluff, you sneak and calf the stealer, he said coolly. No, unlimber that gun of yours and get busy. Angry as he was, Patches felt a thr thrill of admiration for the man, and beneath his determination to force Phil Acton to treat him with respect, he was proud of his friend, who answered his sneering insinuations with such fearlessness. But he could not now hesitate in his plan of provoking Phil into disarming himself. You're something of a four-flusher yourself, aren't you? he mocked. You know I have no gun. Your brave pose is so effective. I would congratulate you, only you see, it doesn't impress me in the least. With an oath, Phil snatched his gun from the holster and threw it aside. Well, have it any way you like, he retorted and started towards Patches. Then a curious thing happened to Honorable Patches. Angry as he was, he became suddenly dominated by something that was more potent than his rage. Stop, he cried sharply, and with such ringing force that Phil involuntarily obeyed. I can't fight you this way, Phil, he said, and the other wondering saw that whimsical self-mock and smile on his lips. You know as well as I do that you're no match for me barehanded. You couldn't even touch me. You, you've seen Curly and the others try it often enough. You are as helpless in my power now as I was in yours a moment ago. I'm armed now, and you're not. I can't fight you this way, Phil. In spite of himself, Phil Acton was impressed by the truth and fairness of Patch's words. He realized that an unequal contest would satisfy neither of them, and that it made no difference which of the contestants had the advantage. Well, he said sarcastically, what are you going to do about it? First, returned Patches calmly, I'm going to tell you how I happened to be here with Yawk by Joe. I don't need any explanations from you. It's probably more your personal business, I suppose, retorted Phil. Pat just controlled himself. You're going to hear the explanation just the same, he returned. You can believe it or not, just as you please. And then what? demanded Phil. Then I'm going to go get a gun and we'll settle the rest of it man to man on equal terms just as soon as you like, answered Patches deliberately. P Phil replied shortly, Well, go ahead with your talk. I'll hand it to you when it comes to talk. I'm not educated the way you are. For a moment, Patches hesitated as though on the point of changing his mind about his explanation and then a sense of justice, just as both for Phil and himself conquered. But in telling Phil how he'd come upon the scene too late for positive proof that the freshly branded calf was the dean's property, and explaining now, when the foreman arrived, he had just persuaded Joe to go with him to give the necessary evidence against Nick, Patches forgot the possible effect of his words upon Joe himself. The two cross-triangle men were so absorbed in their own affair that they had paid no attention to the Tally Holt Mountain Outcast and Joe, taking advantage of the opportunity, by this time gained a position beside his horse. As he heard Patches tell how he had no actual evidence that the calf was not Nick Cambert's property, a look of anger and cunning darkness come over the face of Nick's follower. He was angry at the way Patches had tricked him into betraying both himself and his evil master, and he saw a way to defeat the two cowboys and at the same time win Nick's approval. Quickly, the fellow mounted his horse, and before they could stop him, was out of sight in the timber. 
Dang it. I've done it now. Clank yelled Patches in dismay. I forgot all about Joe. I don't think he counts for much in this game anyway, returned Phil gruffly. As he spoke, the foreman turned his back to Patches and walked towards his gun. He had reached the spot where the weapon lay, went from the brush to the right, and a little back of Patches he stood watching his companion. A shot rang out with startling suddenness. Patches saw Phil stumble forward, straightened for an instant as though by sheer power of his will turned and looked back at him. And then as Phil fell, the unarmed cowboy leapt forward towards that gun on the ground. Even as he moved, a second shot rang out and he felt the wind of the bullet on his cheek. With Phil's gun in his hand, he ran towards the cedar tree on the side of the open space opposite the point from which the shots came. And as he ran around, another bullet whistled past. A man moving as Patches moved is not an easy mark. The same man armed and protected by the trunk of a tree is still even more difficult. A moment after he had gained cover, the cowboy heard the clattering of horses' feet near the spot from which the shots came, and by the sound knew that the unseen marksman had chosen to retire with only half his evident purpose accomplished, rather than take the risk that had arisen with Patch's success and turn the ambush into an open fight. As the sound of the horse's swift rush down the side of the ridge grew fainter and fainter, Patches ran to fill. A quick examination told him that the bullet had entered just under the right shoulder and that the man, though unconscious and no doubt seriously wounded, was living. With rude bandages made by tearing his shirt into strips, Patches checked the flow of blood and bound up the wound as best he could. Then for a moment he considered. It was between three or four miles to the ranch. He could ride there and back in a few minutes. Someone must start for a doctor without an instant's loss of time. With water, proper bandages, and stimulations, the wounded man could be cared for and moved in the buckboard with a greater safety than he could be if he was carried in present condition on a horse. The risk of leaving him for a few minutes was small, compared to the risk of taking him to the horse under the only conditions possible. The next instant... Patches was in Phil's rough saddle, riding as he had never ridden before. Jim Reed, with Kitty and Helen, was on the way back from Prescott as Kitty had planned. They were within ten miles of the ranch when the cattlemen, who sat at the wheel of the automobiles, saw a horseman coming towards them. A moment he watched the approaching figure, then over his shoulder he said to the girls, "'Look at that feller ride!' There's something doing for sure. As he spoke, he turned the machine well out of the road. A moment later, he added, It's Curly Elson from the Cross Triangle. Something's happened in the valley. As he spoke, he stopped the machine and sprang out so that the cowboy would see and recognize him. Curly did not draw rein until he was within a few feet of Reed. Then he brought his running horse up with a suddenness that threw the animal onto its haunches. Curly spoke tensely. Phil Acton's shot. We need a doctor, quick. Without a word, Jim Reed leapt into the automobile. The car backed to turn around. As it paused an instant before starting forward again, Kitty put her hand on her father's shoulder. Wait, she cried. I'm going to Phil. Curly, I want your horse. You can go with father. The cowboy was on the ground before she finished speaking. And before the automobile was underway, Kitty was riding back the way Curly had come. Kitty was scarcely conscious of what she had said. The cowboy's first words had struck her with the force of a physical blow, and in that first moment, she had been weak and helpless. She had felt as though a heavy weight pressed her down, and a gray mist was before her eyes and she couldn't see clearly. Phil Acton shot. Phil Acton shot. The cowboy's words were repeating themselves over and over. And then, with a sudden rush, her strength came back, and the mist cleared. 
She must go to Phil, and she must go fast. Oh, why was his horse so slow? If only she were riding her own midnight. She did not think as she rode. She did not wonder, nor question, nor analyze her emotion. She only felt. It was Phil who was hurt. Phil, the boy with whom she had played when she was a little girl, the lad with whom she had gone to school. The young man had won the first love of her young woman's heart. It was Phil, her Phil, who had been hurt, and she must go to him. She must go fast. It seemed to Kitty that hours passed before she reached the meadow lane. She was glad that Curly had left the gates open. As she crossed the familiar ground between the old Acton home and the ranch house, on the other side of the sandy wash, she saw them. They were carrying him into the house as she rode into the yard, and at sight of that still form the grey mist came again, and she caught that saddle horn to save herself from falling. But it was only a moment until she was strong again and ready to do all that Miss Baldwin asked. Phil had regained consciousness before they started home with him, but he was very weak with the loss of blood and the journey in the buckboard, though Bob drove ever so carefully, was almost more than he could bear. But, with the relief that came when he was at last laying quietly in his own bed, and with the help of the stimulation, the splendid physical strength and vitality that was his, because of his natural and unspoiled life again brought back to him the sh from the shadows into the light of full consciousness. It was then that the dean, while Miss Baldwin and Kitty were occupied for a few moments in another part of the house, listened to all that his foreman could tell him about the affair up to the time that he had fallen unconscious. The dean asked but a few questions, but when the details were all clearly fixed in his mind, the older man bent over Phil and looked straight into the lad's clear, steady eyes, while he, well, he asked in a low tone, Phil, did Patches do this? And the young man answered, Uncle Will, I don't know. And with this he closed his eyes wearily, as though to sleep, and the dean, seeing Kitty in the doorway, beckoned her to come and sit beside the bed. Then he stole quietly from the room. As in a dream, Phil had seen Kitty when she rode into the yard, and he had been conscious of her presence as he... She moved into the house and the room where he lay. But he had given no sign that he knew she was there. As she, she seated herself at the dean's bidding, the cowboy opened his eyes for a moment and looked up into her face, and then again the weary lids closed and he gave no hint that he recognized her, save that the white lips set into firmer lines as though another stab of pain. As she watched him alone beside this man who had, since she could remember, been a part of her life, and as she realized that he was on the very borderline of that land from which, if he entered, he would never return to her, Kitty Reed knew the truth that in greater than any knowledge than the school of man's could give. She knew the one great truth of her womanhood, knew it not from textbook or classroom, not from learned professor or cultured association, but knew it from the good master of life who, with infinite wisdom, teaches his many pupils who are free to learn in the school of schools, the school of nature. In that hour, while the near presence of death so overshadowed all the trivial and non-essential things of life, when the little standards and petty values of poor human endeavors were as nothing. This woman knew that by the unwritten law of God, who decreed that in all life two should be as one, this man was her only lawful mate. Environment, circumstance, that which we call culture and education, even death might separate them, but nothing could nullify the fact that attested by the instinct of her womanhood. Bending over the man who lay so still, she whispered 
the imperative will of her heart. Come back to me, Phil. I want you. I need you. Come back to me. Slowly, he came out of the midst of weakness and pain to look up at her, doubtfully wondering. But there was a light in Kitty's face that dispelled that doubt and changed the look of wondering uncertainty to glad conviction. He did not speak. No word was necessary, nor did he move, for he must be very still and hold fast with all of his strength to the life that would now was so good. But the woman knew without words all that he would have said. As his eyes closed again, she bowed her head in thankfulness. Then, rising, she stole softly to the window. She felt that she must look out for a moment into the world that was so suddenly new and beautiful. Under the walnut tree, she saw the dean talking with a man whom she had promised to marry. Later, Mr. Reed, with Helen and Curly, brought the doctor, and the noise of the automobile summoned every soul to the place to wait for the phys physician's verdict of life or death. While the dean was in Phil's room with the physician, and the anxious ones were gathered in a little group in front of the house, Jim Reed stood apart from the others, talking in low tones with the cowboy Bob. Patches who was standing behind the automobile, heard Bob, who had raised his voice a little, saying distinctively, I tell you, sir, there ain't no bit of doubt in the world about it. There was a calf, a laying right there, freshly branded and marked. He'd plumb forget it to turn it loose, I reckon, being naturally rattled, or else he figured that it wasn't no use if Phil should be able to tell what happened. The way I make it out is that Phil jumped him right in the act, so sudden that he shot without thinking. You know how he acts quick that way. And then he seen what he'd done, and that it was more than an even break that Phil wouldn't live, so figured that his chances was better to stay and run a bluff by coming for help and all that. If he had tried to make his getaway, there wouldn't have been no question about it. And he's got just enough nerve to take the chance by staying and playing right into the game. Patches started as though to go towards the men, but at that moment the doctor came from the house. The physician approached the waiting group. That odd, mirthless, self mocking smile touched Patches' lips. Then he stepped forward to listen with the others to the doctor's words. Phil had a chance, the doctor said. But he told them frankly that it was only a chance. The injured man's wonderful vitality, his clean blood, and unimpaired physical strength, together with his unshaken nerve and undomitable will, were all greatly in his favor. With careful nursing, they might with reason hope for his recovery. With expressions of relief, the group separated. Patches walked away alone. Mr. Reed, who would return to Prescott with the doctor, said to his daughter when the physician was ready, Come, Kitty, I'll go by the house so as to take you and Miss Manning home. But Kitty shook her head. No, Father, I'm not going home. Stella needs me here. Helen understands, don't you, Helen? And wise... Miss Manning, seeing in Kitty's face something that the man had not observed, answered, Yes, dear, I understand. You must stay, of course. I'll, I'll run over again in the morning. Very well, answered Mr. Reed, who seemed in somewhat of a hurry. I know you ought to stay. Tell Stella that Mother will be over for a little while this evening. And then the automobile moved away. That night... While Miss Baldwin and Kitty watched by Phil's bedside and Patches in his room waited, sleepless, alone with his thoughts, men from the ranch on the other side of the quiet meadow were riding swiftly through the darkness. Before the next day had driven the stars from the wide sky, a little company of silent, grim-faced horsemen gathered in the Pothook S. Corral. 
In the dim gray light of the early morning, they followed Jim Reed out of the corral, and riding fast, crossed the valley above the meadows and approached the cross triangle corrals from the west. One man in the company led a horse with an empty saddle. Just beyond the little rise of ground, outside the big gate, they halted, while Jim Reed with two others, leaving their horses with the silent riders behind the hill, went on into the corral, where they seated themselves on the edge of the long watering trough near the tank which hid them from the house. Fifteen minutes later, when the dean stepped from the kitchen porch, she saw a curly running towards the house. As the older man hurried towards him, the cowboy, pale with excitement and anger, cried, They got him, sir. They, they grabbed him when he went out to the corral. The dean understood instantly. Get my horse quick, Curly, he said, and hurried on towards the saddle shed. Which way did they go? He asked as he mounted. Towards the cedars on the ridge when it happened, came the answer. Did you want me? No, don't let them know in the house, came the reply, and then the dean was gone. The little company of horsemen with patches in their midst had reached the scene of the shooting and had made their simple preparations. From that moment, when they had covered him with their guns as he stepped outside through the corral gate, he had not spoken. Well, sir, said the spokesman, have you anything to say before we proceed? Patches shook his head, and wonderingly they saw the curious mocking smile upon his lips. I don't suppose that any remarks I might make will impress you gentlemen in the least, he said coolly. It'd be useless and unkind for me to detain you longer than necessary. An involuntary murmur of admiration came from the circle. They were men who could appreciate such unflinching courage. In the short pause that followed, the dean riding as he had not ridden for years was in their midst. Before they could check him, the veteran cowman was beside Patches. With a quick motion, he snatched the rope from the cowboy's neck. An instant more, and he had cut the rope that bound Patch's hands. Thank you, sir, said Patches calmly. Don't do that, Will, called Jim Reed. This is our business. In the same breath, he shouted to his companions. Take him again, boys, and started forward. Stand where you are, roared the dean and as they looked upon the stern countenance of the man who was so respected and loved throughout all that country, not a man moved. Reed himself involuntarily halted at the command. "'I'll do this and more, Jim Reed,' said the dean firmly. And there was that in his voice which, in the wild days of the past, had compelled many a man to fear and obey him. "'It is my business enough that you call this meeting off right here,' I'll be responsible for this man. You boys mean well, but you're a little too late this trip. We aim to put a stop to that there thieving Tally Holt Mountain outfit, Will, and we're going to do it right now, returned Reed. A murmur of agreement came from the group. The dean didn't give an inch. You'll put a stop to nothing this way. And you're sure to start something that'll be more than stealing a few calves. The time for stringing men up, on mere suspicion, is past in Arizona. I reckon there's more cross triangle stock branded with the tally holt iron than all the rest you put together, which sure entitles me to front seat when it comes down to the showdown. Well, he's right, boys, said one of the older men. You know I'm right, Tom returned the dean quickly. You and me have lived neighbors for pretty well near thirty years without ever a hard word passing between us, and we've been through some mighty serious trouble together, you and you too, George, and Henry and Bill. The rest of you boys I've known since you were little kids, and me and your daddies worked and fought side by side for decent living and law-abiding times before you were born. 
We did it because we didn't want our children to go through what we had to go through or do some of the things that we had to do. And now you're all thinking that you can cut me out of this. You think you can sneak out here before I'm out of bed in the morning and hang one of my own cowboys? A good as man that's ever thrown a rope to? Without saying a word to me, you come crawling into my own corral and start raising hell? I'm here to tell you that you can't do it. You can't do it because I won't let you. The men, with downcast eyes, sat on their horses ashamed. Two or three muttered approval. Jim Reed said earnestly, That's all right, Will. We know how you'd feel, and we were just aiming to save you some more of the trouble. Them Tally Holt mountain thieves have gone too far this time. We can't let you turn this man loose. I'm not going to try to turn him loose, retorted the dean. The men looked at each other. What are you going to do? asked the spokesman. I'm going to make you turn him loose, came the startling reply. You fellas took him. You're going to let him go. In spite of the grave situation, several men grinned at the dean's answer. It was so like him. I'll bet a steer he does it too, whispered one. The dean turned to the man by his side. Patches, tell these men all that you told me about this business. When the cowboy had told his story in detail up to the point where Phil came upon the scene, the dean interrupted him. Now get down there and show us exactly how it happened after Phil rode up on you and Yawk by Joe. Patches obeyed. As he was showing them where Phil stood when the shot was fired, the dean again interrupted with, Wait a minute. Tom, you get down there and stand just as Phil was standing. The cattleman obeyed. When he had taken the position, the dean continued, Now, Patches... Stand like he was when Phil was hit. Patches obeyed. Now, then, where did the shot come from? Asked the dean. Patches pointed. The dean did not need to direct the next step of his demonstration. Three of the men were already off their horses, moving around the bushes indicated by Patches. Here's the tracks, all right, called one. And here, added another, for a few feet away, Here's where he left his horse. And now, continued the dean, when the three men had come back from behind the brush and with patches had remounted their horses, I'll tell you something else. I had a talk with Phil himself, and the boy's story agrees with what patches just told you in every point. And furthermore, Phil told me straight when I asked him that he didn't know himself who fired that shot. He paused for a moment for them to grasp the full importance of his words, and then he summed up the case. As the thing stands, we've got no evidence against anyone. It can't be proved that the calf wasn't Nick's property in the first place. It can't be proved that Nick was anywhere in the neighborhood. It can't be proved who fired that shot. It could have been Joe or anyone else as well as Nick. Phil himself, being too quick to jump to conclusion, blocked this man's game, just when he had played the only hand that could have won out against Nick. If Phil hadn't happened upon Patches and Joe when he did, or if he had been a little slower about finding a man guilty just because appearances was against him, we would have had the evidence from Yock by Joe that we'd been waiting for and could have turned the whole thing on that Tally Holt outfit proper. As it stands now, we're right where we were before. Now what are you all going to do about it? The men grinned shamefaced, but were glad that the tragedy had been averted. They were by no means convinced that Patches was not guilty, but they were quick to see that the possibility of a mistake in the situation. I reckon the dean has adjourned the meeting, boys, said one. Come on called another let's be riding when the last man had disappeared in the timber the dean wiped the perspiration from his flushed face and looked at patches thoughtfully and then that twinkle of approval came into the blue eyes 
that a few minutes before had been cold and uncompromising. Come on, son, he said gently. Let's go to breakfast. Still be wondering what's keeping us. End of chapter 15. Chapter 16 Before their late breakfast was over at the Cross Triangle Ranch, Helen Manning came across the valley meadows to help with the work of the household. Jimmy brought her, but when she saw that she was really needed and that Miss Baldwin would be glad for her help, she told Jimmy that she would stay for the day. Someone from the Cross Triangle, the dean said, would take her home when she was ready to go. The afternoon was nearly gone when Curly returned from the lower end of the valley with a woman who had relieved Miss Baldwin of the housework, and as her presence was no longer needed, Helen told the dean that she would return to the Reed home. I'll just tell Patches to take you over in the buckboard, said the dean. It was mighty kind of you to give us a hand today. It sure's been a big help to Stella and Kitty. Oh, don't bother with the buckboard, Mr. Baldwin. I would much enjoy the walk, but I'd be glad if Mr. Patches would go with me. I would rather feel safer, you know, she smiled. Miss Baldwin was sleeping and Kitty was watching beside Phil. So the dean himself went so far as the wash with Helen and Patches as the two set out for their walk across the meadows. When Helen had said goodbye to the dean with a promise to come again on the morrow, he had turned back towards the house. She said to her companion, Oh, Larry, I'm so glad for this opportunity. I wanted to see alone, and I couldn't think of how to manage it. I have to tell you something, Larry, something that I must tell you, and you must promise to be very patient with me. You know what happened this morning, do you? He asked gravely, for he thought from her words that she had, perhaps chance to hear of some further action to be taken by the suspicious cattleman. It was terrible, Larry. Why didn't you tell them who you were? Or wh why did you let them? She couldn't finish. He laughed shortly. It would have been a sinful waste of words. Can't you imagine me trying to make those men believe such a fairy tale under such circumstances? For a little, they walked in silence, then he asked, Is it about Jim Reed's suspicion that you wanted to see me, Helen? No, Larry, it, it's about Kitty, she answered. Oh. Kitty told me all about it today, Helen continued. The poor child's beside herself. The man did not speak. Helen looked up at him almost as a mother might have done. Do you love her very much, Larry? Tell me truly, do you? Patches could not, dare not look at her. Tell me, Larry, she insisted gently. I must know. Do you love Kitty as a man ought to love his wife? The man answered in a voice that was low and shaking with emotion. Why should you ask me such a question? You know the answer. What right have you to force me to tell you what you already know, that I love you, another man's wife? Helen's face was white. In her anxiety for Kitty, she had not foreseen the situation in which, by her question, she had placed herself. Larry, she said sharply. Well, he retorted passionately, you insisted that I tell you the truth. I insisted that you tell me the truth about Kitty, she returned. Well, you have it, he answered quickly. Larry, she cried, how could you how could you ask a woman you do not love to be your wife? How could you do it, Larry? And just when I was so proud of you, so glad that you found yourself that you were that you were such a splendid man. Kitty and I are the best of friends, he answered in a dull, spiritless tone, the best of companions. In the past year, I've grown quite fond of her. We have much in common. I can give her the life she desires, the life that she's fit for. I'll make her happy. I'll be true to her. I'll be everything to her that a man should be to his wife. 
No, Larry, she said gently, touched by the hopelessness in his voice. For he had spoken as though he already knew that his attempt to justify his engagement to Kitty was in vain. No, Larry, you cannot be to Kitty everything that a man should be to his wife. You cannot, without love, be a husband to her. Again, they walked in silence for a while, and then Helen asked, And are you sure, Larry, that Kitty cares for you as a woman ought to care? I could not have asked her to be my wife if I hadn't thought so, he answered with more spirit. Of course, returned her, his companion gently, and could he could not have answered yes if she did not believe that you loved her. Do you mean that you think Kitty does not care for me, Helen? I know that she loves Phil Acton, Larry. I saw it in her face when we first learned that he was hurt, and today the poor girl confessed it. She loved him all the time, Larry, has loved him ever since they were boy and girl together. She's tried to deny her heart, she's tried to put other things above her love, but she knows now that she can't. It's fortunate for you both that she realized her love for Mr. Acton before she spoiled not only her own life, but yours as well. But how could she promise to be my wife when she loved Phil? he demanded. But how could you ask her when you... Helen retorted quickly without thinking of herself. Then she continued bravely, putting herself aside in her effort to make him understand. You tempted her, Larry. You did not mean it so, but perhaps you did. You tempted her with your wealth, with all that you could give her of material luxuries and ease and refinement. You tempted her to substitute those things for love. I know, Larry. I know because I see you. I see you, dear man, and I was tempted too once. He made a gesture of protest, but she went on. You did not know, but I can tell you now that nothing but the memory of my dear father's teaching saved me from that terrible mistake. You're a man now, Larry. You are more to me than any man in the world, save one, and more than any man in the world, save that one, that I respect and admire you for the manhood that you've gained. But, Larry, don't you see? When a man's a man, there's... There's one thing above all that he cannot do. He cannot take advantage of a woman's weakness. He cannot tempt her beyond her strength. He must be strong both for himself and for her. He must save her always from herself. The man lifted his head and looked away towards Granite Mountain. As once before this woman had aroused him to assert his manhood's strength, she called now to all that was finest and truest in the depth of his being. You're always right, Helen, he said, almost reverently. No, Larry, she answered quickly, but you know that I'm right on this. I'll free Kitty from her promise at once, he said as though to end the matter. Helen answered quickly, but that's exactly what you mustn't do. The man was bewildered. Why, I thought, what in the world do you mean? She laughed happily as she said, Stupid Larry, don't you understand? You must make Kitty send you about your business. You have to save her self-respect. Can't you see how ashamed and humiliated she'd be if she imagined for a moment that you didn't love her? Think what she would suffer if she knew that you were merely trying to buy her with your wealth and the things that you possess. She disregarded his protest. That's exactly what your proposal meant, Larry. A girl like Kitty, if she knew the truth of what she had done, might even fancy herself unworthy to accept her happiness now that it's come. You must make her dismiss you and all that you could give her. You must make her proud and happy to give herself to the man that she loves. But what can I do? He asked in desperation. I don't know, Larry, but you must manage somehow. For Kitty's sake, you must. If only the dean hadn't interrupted the proceedings this morning, sure would have simplified everything, he mused. 
and she saw that, as always, he was laughing at himself. Larry, please don't, she cried earnestly. He looked at her curiously. Would you have me lie to her, Helen? Deliberately lie? She answered quietly. I don't think that I would raise that question if I were you, Larry, considering all the circumstances. On his way back to the cross triangle, Patches walked as a man who, having determined upon a difficult and distasteful task, is of a mind to undertake without delay. After supper that evening, he managed to speak to Kitty when no one was near. I gotta see you alone for a few minutes tonight, he asked hurriedly, as soon as possible. I'll be under the trees near the bank of the wash. Come to me as soon as it's dark and you can slip away. The young woman wondered at his manner. He was so hurried and appeared so nervous and unlike himself. But Patches, I... You must. He interrupted with a quick look towards the dean who was approaching them. I have something to tell you. Something I have to tell you tonight. He turned to speak to the dean and Kitty presently left them. An hour later, when the night had come, she found him waiting, as he had said. Listen, Kitty, he said abruptly, and she thought from his manner and the tone of his voice that he was in a state of nervous fear. I must go. I dare not stay here another day. I'm going tonight. Why, Patches, she said, forcing herself to speak quietly in order to calm him. What's the matter? Matter, he returned. You know what they're trying to do to me this morning? Kitty was shocked. It was true that she did not, could not care for this man as she loved Phil, but she had thought of him as her dearest friend and she respected him and admired him. It was not good to find him now like this, shaken and afraid. She couldn't understand. For the moment, her own troubles was put aside by her honest concern for him. But Patches, it's all gone now. It, it can't happen again. You don't know. Or you wouldn't feel so sure. Phil might... He checked himself as if he feared to finish the sentence. Kitty thought there must be some more cause for his manner than she'd guessed. But you're not a cattle thief, she protested. You have only to explain who you are, and no one would for a moment believe that Lawrence Knight could be guilty of stealing. It's ridiculous on the face of it. You don't understand, he returned desperately. There's more in this than stealing. Kitty started. You don't mean Patches, you can't mean Phil, she gasped. Yes, I mean Phil. I, we were quarreling and I was angry. Girl, don't you see why I must go? I, I dare not stay. Listen, Kitty, it, it'll be all right. When, once I'm out of this country and living under my own name, I'll be safe. Later, you can come to me. You can come. Y you will come, won't you, dear? You know how I want you. This, this doesn't need to change our plans. If you love me, you'll... She stopped him with a low cry. And you... It was you who did that? But I, I tell you, we was quarreling, Kitty, he protested weakly. And you think that I could go to you now? She was trembling with indignation. But you're so mistaken. It it seems that I was wrong, mistaken, too. I I never dreamed that you... not You you could ever do make me forget what you told me. You are right to go. You mean... You, you won't come with me, he faltered. Could you really think that I would, she retorted. But, Kitty, you'll let me go? You won't betray me. You'd, you'd give me a chance. It's the only thing I can do, she answered coldly. I should die of shame if ever it was known that I had thought of being more to you than I have been, but you must go tonight. And with this she left him fairly running towards the house. Alone in the darkness, Honorable Patches smiled mockingly to himself. When morning came, there was great excitement on the Cross Triangle Ranch. Patches was missing. And more, the best horse in the Dean's outfit, 
the big bay with a blazed face had also disappeared. Quickly the news spread throughout the valley and to the distant ranches, and many were the wise heads that nodded understandingly, and many were the I told you so's, the man who had appeared among them so mysteriously and who for a year had never been a failing topic of conversation, had finally established his character beyond any question. But the cattlemen felt with reason, because of the dean's vigorous defense of the man, when they would have administered justice, that the matter was now in his own hands. They offered their services and much advice. They quietly joked about the price of horses, but the dean laughed at their jokes and listened to their advice, and said that he thought the sheriff of Yakby County could be trusted to handle the case. To Helen, only Kitty told of her last interview with Patches, and Helen, shocked and surprised at the thoroughness of which the man had brought about Kitty's freedom and peace of mind, bade the girl forget and be happy. When the crisis had passed and Phil was out of danger, Kitty returned to her home, but every day she and Helen drove across the meadow to see how the patient was progressing. Then, one day, Helen said goodbye to her Williamson Valley friends and went with Stanford to the home that he had prepared for her. And after that, Kitty spent much more of her time at the house across the wash from the old Acton homestead. It was during those weeks of Phil's recovery while he was slowly regaining his full measure of health and strength that Kitty learned to know the cowboy in a way that she'd never permitted herself to let himself be known. Little by little, as they sat together under the walnut trees or walked slowly about the place, the young woman came to understand the mind of the man. As Phil, slyly at first, and then more freely, opened the doors of, her, of his inner self and talked to her as though he was talking to patches of the books that he had read, of his observations and thoughts of nature, and of the great world movements and activities that by magazines and books and papers had brought to his hand, she learned to her surprise that even as he lived amid the scenes that called for the highest type of physical strength and courage, he lived an intellectual life that was as marked for its strength and manly vigor. But, while they came thus daily into a more intimate and closer companionship, they spoke to no one of their love. Kitty, knowing how her father would look upon her engagement to the cowboy, put off the announcement from time to time, and not wishing their happy companionship be marred during those days of Phil's recovery. When he was strong enough to ride again, Kitty would come at midnight, and together they would roam about the ranch and the country nearby. So it happened that Sunday afternoon. Mr. and Mrs. Reed with the three boys were making a neighborly call on the Baldwins, and Phil and Kitty were riding in the vicinity of the spot where Kitty had first met Patches. They were seated in the shade of a cedar on the ridge not far from the drift fate fence gate, when Phil saw three horsemen approaching from the further side of the fence. By the time the horsemen had reached the gate, Phil knew them to be Yuck by Joe, Nick Cambert, and Honorable Patches. Kitty, too, had by this time recognized the riders, and with an ex exclamation started to rise to her feet. But Phil said quietly, Wait, Kitty. There's something about that outfit that looks mighty queer to me. The men were riding in single file, with Yuck by Joe in the lead, and Patches last, and their positions were not changed when they halted, while Joe, without dismounting, unlatched the gate. They came through the opening, still in the same order, and as they halted again, while Patches closed the gate, Phil saw what it was that caused them to move with such apparent lack of freedom in their relative positions why Nick Cambert's attitude in the saddle was so stiff and unnatural. Nick's hands were secured behind his back. His feet were tied under the horse from stirrup to stirrup, while his horse was controlled by a lead rope, one end of which was made fast to yuck by Joe's saddle horn. Patches caught sight of the two under the tree as he came through the gate, but he gave no sign that he noticed them. As the little procession moved slowly nearer, 
Phil and Kitty looked at each other without word. But as they turned again to watch the approaching horseman, Kitty impulsively grabbed Phil's arm. And so, sitting in such a unconscious intimacy, they must have made a pleasing picture. At least the man who rode behind Nick Cambert seemed to think so, for he was trying to smile. When the riders were almost within speaking distance of the pair under the tree, they stopped, and the watchers saw Joe turn his face towards Patches for a moment and then look in their direction. Nick Cambert did not raise his head. Patches came on towards them alone. As they saw that it was the man's purpose to speak to them, Phil and Kitty rose and stood waiting, Kitty with her hands still on her companion's arm. And now, as they were given a closer and less obstructive view of the man who had been their friend, Kitty and Phil again exchanged wondering glances. This was not the Honorable Patches whom they had known so intimately. The man's clothing was soiled with dirt and old from rough usage, with here and there a ragged tear. His tall form drooped with weariness, and his unshaven face, dark and deeply tanned, and grimmed with sweat and dirt, was thin and drawn and old, and his tired eyes, deep set and dark hollows, were bloodshot as though from many sleepless nights. His dry lips parted in a painful smile as he dismounted stiffly and limped courteously forward to greet them. I know that I'm scarcely presentable, he said in a voice that was as worn and old as his face, but I could not resist the temptation to say howdy. Perhaps I should introduce myself, though, he added, as if to trying to save them from embarrassment. My name is Lawrence Knight. I'm a deputy sheriff of this county. A slight movement as he spoke threw back his unbuttoned jumper, and they saw the badge of his office. In my official capacity, I'm taken a prisoner to Prescott. Phil recovered first and caught the officer's hand in a grip that told more than words. Kitty nearly betrayed her secret when she gasped. But you, you said that you... With his ready skill, he saved her. That my name was Patches? I know it was wrong to deceive you as I did, but I regret that it was necessary for me to lie so deliberately, but the situation seemed to demand it, and I hope that when you understood, you'd forgive the part I was forced to play for the good of everyone interested. Kitty understood the meaning in his words that was unknown to Phil, and her eyes expressed the gratitude that she wasn't able to speak. By the way, Patches continued, I'm not mistaken, and... Offering my congratulations and best wishes, am I? They laughed happily. We've made no announcement yet, Phil answered, but you seem to know everything. I feel like saying from the bottom of my heart, God bless you, my children. You make me feel strangely old. He returned with a touch of his old wistfulness and then adding in his drawl way, Perhaps, though, it's from living in the open and sleeping in my clothes for so long. Talk about horses, I'd give my kingdom for a bath, a shave, and a clean shirt. I'd begun to think that our old friend Nick never would brand another calf, that he'd perform just to get even with me, you know. By the way, Phil, you'll be interested to know that Nick's the man who's really responsible for your happiness. How? demanded Phil. Why, it was Nick who fired the shot that brought Kitty to her senses. My partner there, Yock by Joe, saw him do it. If you people would like to thank my prisoner, I'll permit it. When they decided that they would deny themselves that pleasure, Patches went on. I can't say I blame you. He's surly all right and ill-tempered. Which reminds me that I must be about my official business and land him in Prescott tonight. I'm going to stop at the ranch and ask the dean for, for the team and buckboard, though. He added as he climbed painfully into the saddle. Well, adios, my children. Don't be staying out too late. Hand in hand, 
they watched him rejoin his companions and ride away behind the tally holt men. The dean and Miss Baldwin, with their friends from the neighboring ranch, were enjoying their Sunday afternoon together as old friends will when the three Reed boys and little Billy came running from the corral where they had been holding an amateur donkey riding contest with a calf for the wild and wicked outlaw. As they ran together, the group under the walnut trees, the lads disturbed the peaceful conversation of their elders with wild shouts that, Patches is back! Patches has come back! Nip, Nick Cambert's with him, and so is Yak Pai Joe! Jim Reed sprang to his feet, but the dean calmly kept his seat, glanced up at his big friend with a twinkling eye, and said to the boys with pretended gruffness, Oh, what's the matter with you kids? Don't you know that horse thief Patches wouldn't dare show himself in Williamson Valley again? You must be having bad dreams. That's what's the matter with you, or else you're just trying to scare us, aren't you? Honest, it's Patches, Uncle Will. We seed him coming from beyond the corral, said Jimmy. I seen him first, shouted Connie. I was up in the grandstand, I mean on the fence. Me too, chirped out Jack. Jim Reed stood looking towards the corral. The boys are right, Will, he said in a low tone. There they come now. As the three horsemen rode into the yard and the watchers noted the peculiarity of their companionship, Jim Reed muttered something under his breath. But the dean, as he rode leisurely to his feet, was smiling broadly. The little procession halted when the horses evidenced their dislike of the automobile, and Patches came swiftly forward on foot. Lifting his battered hat courteously to the company, he said to the dean, I've returned your horse, sir. I'm very much obliged to you. I think you'll find him in fairly good condition. Jim repeated whatever it was he had muttered to himself. The dean chuckled. Jim, he said to the big cattleman, I want to introduce my friend, Mr. Lawrence Knight, one of the Sheriff Gordon deputies. Looks like he's been busy over in the Tally Holt Mountain neighborhood. The two men shook hands silently. Ms. Reed greeted the officer cordially and while Miss Baldwin, to the dean's great delight, demonstrated her welcome in the good old-fashioned mother way. Will Baldwin, I could shake you, she cried as Patches stood, a little confused by her impulsive greeting. Here you knew all this time, and you kept pestering me by trying to make me believe that you thought he'd run away and become a thief. It was, perhaps, the proudest moment of the dean's life, when he admitted that Patches had confided in him that morning when they were so late to breakfast, and how he understood the man's disappearance and the pretense of stealing a horse that could only have been a blind. The good dean never dreamed that there was so much more in Honorable Patches' strategy than he knew. Mr. Baldwin, said Patches presently, could you let me have a team and a buckboard? I want to get my prisoners to Prescott tonight, he laughed shortly. And, well, I certainly would appreciate some cushions. Sure, son. You can have the whole cross triangle outfit if you want it, answered Dean, but hold on a minute. He turned with a twinkling eye to his neighbor. Here's Jim with a perfectly good automobile that don't seem to be busy big man replied, Why, of course, I'll be glad to take you in. Thank you, returned Patches. I'll be ready in just about a minute. But you're going to have something to eat first, cried Mrs. Baldwin. I bet you're half starved. You, you sure look it. Patches shook his head. Oh, don't be tempting me, mother. I can't stop now. But You'll be coming home tonight, won't you? She asked anxiously. I'd like to, he said. And can I bring a friend? 
Your friends are our friends, son, she answered. Of course he's coming back, said the dean. Where else would he go? I'd like to know. They watched him as he went to his prisoner and unlocked the handcuffs that held Nick's right wrist. He relocked it to his own left arm, thus linking his prisoner securely to himself. Then he spoke to Joe, and the young man dismounted, unfastened the rope that bound Nick's feet. When Nick was on the ground, the three came towards the machine. I'm afraid I must ask you to let someone take care of the horses, called Patches to the dean. I'll look after them, the dean replied. Don't forget now that you're coming back tonight. Jim will bring you. Jim Reed, as the three men reached the automobiles, said to Patches, Will you take both of your prisoners in the back seat with you, or shall I take one of them in the front with me? Patches looked at the big man straight in the eyes, and they heard him answer with significant emphasis as he placed his free hand upon Yock by Joe's shoulder. I only have one prisoner, Mr. Reed. This man is my friend. He will take whatever seat he prefers. Joe climbed into the rear seat with the officer and his prisoner. It was after dark when Mr. Reed returned to the ranch with Patches and Joe. You'll find your rooms all ready, son, said Miss Baldwin, and there's plenty of hot water in the bathroom tank for you both. Joe can take the extra bed in Curly's room. You can show him. I'll have your supper as soon as you're both ready. Patches almost fell asleep at the table. As soon as they had finished, he went to his bed, where he remained as Phil reported in intervals during the next forenoon. Dead to the world, until dinner time. In the afternoon they gathered under the walnut trees, the Cross Triangle household and the friends from the neighborhood ranch. And Patches told them his story. How when he left the ranch that night, he had ridden straight to his old friend Stanford Manning, and how Stanford had gone with him to the sheriff, where, through Manning's influence, together with the letter which Patches had brought from the dean, he had been made an officer of the law. As he told them briefly of his days and nights alone, they needed no minute details to understand what it meant to him. It wasn't the work of catching Nick in a way to ensure his conviction that I minded, he said. But the trouble was that while I was watching Nick day and night and dodging him all the time, I was afraid some enthusiastic cowpuncher would run upon me and treat himself to a shot just for luck. Not that I would have minded that so much either after the first week, he added in his drawl way. But considering all the circumstances, it would have been a rather sort of a poor finish. What about this yak by Joe? asked Phil. Patches smiled. Where is Joe? What's he been doing all day? The dean answered. Oh, he's just been mosing around. I tried to get him to talk, but all he would say was that he'd rather let Mr. Knight tell it. Billy, said Patches, will you find yak by Joe and tell him that I'd like to see him here? When little Billy, with the assistance of Jimmy, Connie, and Jack, had gone proudly on their mission, Patches said to the others, Technically, of course, Joe is my prisoner until after the trial, but please don't let him feel it. He will be the principal witness for the estate. When Joe appeared, embarrassed and ashamed in their presence, Patches said as courteously as he would have introduced an equal, Joe... I want my friends to know your real name. There's no better place in the world than right here to start that job of man-making that we have been talking about. You remember that I told you how I started here. Yock by Joe lifted his head and stood straighter by his tall friend's side, and there was a new note in his voice as he answered. Whatever you say goes, Mr. Knight. Patches smiled. Friends, this here is Mr. Joseph Parkhill, 
the only son of the distinguished Professor Parkhill, who you all know quite well. If Patches had planned to enjoy the surprise his words caused, he would not have been disappointed. Presently, when Joe had slipped away again, Patches told him how, because of his interest in the young man, and because of the lad's strange knowledge of Professor Parkhill, he had written east of the distinguished scholar's history. The professor himself was not really so much to blame, said Patches. It seems that he was born to an intellectual life, and the poor fellow just never stood a chance. Even as a child, he was exhibited as a prodigy, a shining example of the possibilities of the race. His father, who was also a professor of some sort, died when he was a baby. His mother, unfortunately, possessed an income sufficient to make it unnecessary that Everett Charles should ever do a day's real work. At the age of 20, he was graduated from college. At the age of 21, he was married to, or, or perhaps it should be more accurately to say, he was married by his landlady's daughter. Quite likely, the woman was ambitious to break into the higher life to which the professor aspired and caught her cultured opportunity in an unguarded moment. The details aren't quite clear, but when their only child, Joe, was six years old, the mother ran away with a carpenter who had been at work on the house for some six weeks. A maiden aunt of some fifty years, who was a worshipper of the professor's cult, came to keep his house and train Joe in a way that good boys should go. But it seemed that the lad proved too great a burden, and when he was thirteen they sent him to a school out here in the west for the benefit of the cli climate. The boy, it was said, being abnormally mentality, needed to pursue his studies under the most favorable of physical conditions. The professor, unhampered by his offspring, continued to climb his aesthetics ladder. The boy, in due time, escaped from school and was educated by the man Dryden and Nick Cambert. And what will become of him now? asked the dean. Patches smiled. Well, the lad is twenty-one now, and we have agreed it's about time that he began to make a man of himself. I can help him a little, perhaps. I've been trying occasionally the past year, but you see the conditions haven't been altogether favorable for that experiment. It might be a bit easier from now on. During the time that intervened between the trial of the Tally Holt Mountain Man, Phelan Patches re-established that intimate friendship of those first months of their work together. Then came the evening when Phil went across the meadow to ask Jim Reed for his daughter. The big cattleman looked at his young neighbor with a frowning disapproval. It won't do, Phil, he said at last. I'm Kitty's father, and it's up to me to look out for her interests. You know how I've educated her for something better than this life. She may think now that she's willing to throw it all away, but I know better. The time would come when she'd be miserable. It's got to be something more than a common cow puncher for a kitty. Phil, that's the truth. The cowboy did not argue. Do I understand that your only objection is based upon the business in which I'm engaged? He asked coolly. Jim laughed. The business in which you're engaged? Why, boy, you sound like a First National Bank. If you had any business of your own, if he was the owner of an outfit and could give Kitty the, well, the things her education taught her to need would be different. I know you're a fine man, all right, but... You're only a poor cow puncher, just the same. I'm speaking for your own good, Phil, as well as Kitty's, he added with an effort of kindliness. So then if I had a good business, it'd be different? Yes, son, it would make all the difference in the world. Thank you, said the cowboy quietly, as he handed Mr. Reed a very large, legal-looking envelope. 
I happen to be half owner of this ranch and outfit. With my own property, makes a fairly good start for a man of my age. My partner, Mr. Lawrence Knight, leaves the active management wholly in my hands, and he has abundant capital to increase our holdings and enlarge our operation just as fast as we can handle the business. The big man looked from papers to the lad and back to the papers. And then a broad smile lit upon his heavy face as he said, All right, I give up, you win. You young fellers are too swift for me. I've been wanting to retire anyway. He raised his voice and called, Kitty! Oh, Kitty! The girl appeared in the doorway. Come and get him, said Reed. I guess he's yours. Helen Manning was sitting on the front porch of that little cottage on the mountainside when she and Stanford began their years of home building. A half mile below, she could see the mining buildings that were grouped about the shaft in a picturesque disorder. Above, the tree-clad ridge rose above the sky. It was too far from the great worlds of cities, some would have said, but Helen, she didn't find it so. With her books and her music and the great out-of-doors and with the companionship of her mate and the dreams they dreamed together, her woman heart was never lonely. She lowered the book that she was reading and looked through the open window to the clock in the living room. A little while, and she'd go down the hill to Stanford, for they loved to walk home together. And then, before lifting the painted page again, she looked over the wide view of rugged mountainsides and towering peaks that every day held for her some new beauty. She had resumed her reading when the sound of horses' feet attracted her attention. Patches and Joe were riding up the hill. They stopped at the gate, and while Joe held stranger's bridle reins, Patches came to Helen as she stood on the porch waiting to receive him. Surely you'll stay for the night, she urged when they had exchanged greetings and had talked for a little while. No, he answered quietly. I just came this way to say goodbye. I stopped for a few minutes with Stan at the office. He said I'd find you here. But where are you going? she asked. Smiling, he waved his hand towards the mountain ridge above. Just above the skyline, Helen. But Larry, will you come again? You won't let us lose you altogether. Perhaps, some day, he said. And who's that with you? Just a friend who cares to go with me. Stan can tell you about him. Larry, Larry, what a man you have become. She cried proudly as he stood before her, holding out his hand. If you think so, Helen, I am glad, he answered and then turned away. So she watched him go. Sitting there at home, she watched him ride up the winding road. Now he was in full view, on some rocky shoulder of the mountain. Now some turn carried him behind a rocky point. Again, she glimpsed him through the trees. Again, he was lost to her in the shadows. At last, for a moment, he stood out boldly against the wide, arced sky. And then he passed from sight, over the skyline, just as he said. The end. Well, everybody, we have reached the end of the story. Kind of sad to run out of pages. Kind of wanted to see what Patches ends up doing. Kind of, kind of was hoping he'd find a find a, a woman or something there, but I guess that's the point of a good story. It makes you care. Anyways, thank you everyone who's been loyally listening and and watching and thumbsing up sings and commenting and all that fancy dancy stuff 
it's been great seeing all the interaction. Anyways, we'll sign off here quickly and get into another one. Probably go to a Pat Stevens Western written by Peter Fields. Anyways, thank you for all your support. Good night for now, ladies and gentlemen, and we will see you on the next one. Bye for now.